Section 0 of the Panchatantra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma. Translated by Arthur William Ryder. Translator's Introduction. 1. One Vishnu Sharma, shrewdly gleaning, all worldly wisdom's inner meaning. In these five books, the charm compresses of all such books the world possesses. Introduction to the Panchatantra The Panchatantra contains the most widely known stories in the world. If it were further declared that the Panchatantra is the best collection of stories in the world, the assertion could hardly be disproved and would probably command the assent of those possessing the knowledge for a judgment. Assuming varied forms in their native India, then travelling in translations, and translations of translations, through Persia, Arabia, Syria, and the civilised countries of Europe, these stories have for more than twenty centuries brought delight to hundreds of millions. Since the stories gathered in the Panchatantra are very ancient, and since they can no longer be ascribed to their respective authors, it is not possible to give an accurate report of their genesis while much in their subsequent history will always remain obscure. Dr. Hertel, the learned and painstaking editor of the text, used by the present translator, believes that the original work was composed in Kashmir, about 200 BC. At this date, however, many of the individual stories were already ancient. He then enumerates no less than 25 recensions of the work in India. The text here translated is late, dating from the year 1199 AD. It is not here intended to summarize the history of these stories in India, nor their travels through the Near East and through Europe. The story is attractive, whose interest is not awakened by learning. For example, that in this work he makes the acquaintance of one of La Fontaine's important sources. Yet here, as elsewhere, the work of the scholars has been of somewhat doubtful value, diverting attention from the primary to the secondary, from literature itself to facts more or less important, about literature. The present version has not been made by a scholar, but by the opposite of a scholar, a lover of good books, eager, so far as his powers permit, to extend an accurate and joyful acquaintance with the world's masterpieces. He will, therefore, not endeavour to tell the history of the Panchatantra, but to tell what the Panchatantra is. 2. Whoever learns the work by heart, or through the storyteller's art, becomes acquainted. His life by sad defeat, although the king of heaven be his foe, is never tainted. Introduction to the Panchatantra The Panchatantra is a Niti Shastra, or textbook of Niti. The word Niti means roughly the wise conduct of life. Western civilization must endure a certain shame in realizing that no precise equivalent of the term is found in English, French, Latin or Greek. Many words are therefore necessary to explain what Niti is, though the idea once grasped is clear, important and satisfying. First of all, Niti presupposes that one has considered and rejected the possibility of living as a saint. It can be practised only by a social being and represents an admirable attempt to answer the insistent question how to win the utmost possible joy from life in the world of men. The negative foundation is security. For example, if one is a mouse, his dwelling must contain recesses beyond the reach of a cat's paw. Pleasant stanzas concerning the necessity of security are scattered throughout the work. Thus, the poor are in peculiar need of being secret when they feed. The lion killed the ram who could not check his appetite for food. Or again, in houses where no snakes are found, one sleeps, or where the snakes are bound. But perfect rest is hard to win, with serpents bobbing out and in. The mere negative foundation of security requires a considerable exercise of intelligence. Since the world swarms with rascals, and no sensible man can imagine them capable of reformation, Caress a rascal as you will. He was and is a rascal still. All salve and sweating treatments fail to take the kink from doggy's tail. Yet roguery can be defeated 
for by its nature it is stupid since camp and sneak and snake so often undertake a plan that does not thrive the world wags on alive having made provisions for security in the realization that a man to thrive must keep alive one faces the necessity of having money the panchatantra being very wise never falls into the vulgar error of supposing money to be important money must be there in reasonable amount because it is unimportant and what wise man permits things unimportant to occupy his mind time and again the panchatantra insists on the misery of poverty with greatest detail in the story of gold's gloom in the second book never perhaps with more point than in the stanza a beggar to the graveyard hide and there friend corpse arise he cried one moment lift my heavy weight of poverty for i of late grow weary and desire instead your comfort you are good and dead the corpse was silent he was sure twas better to be dead than poor needless to say worldly property need not be indeed should not be too extensive since it has no value in possession but only in use in case a horse or book or sword of woman man or loot or word the use or uselessness depends on qualities the user lends now for the positive content of niti granted security and freedom from degrading worry then joy results from three occupations from resolute yet circumspect use of the active powers from intercourse with like-minded friends and all above from worthy exercise of the intelligence necessary to begin with for the experience of true joy in the world of men is resolute action the difficulties are not blinked there is no toy called easy joy but man must train to body spain time and again this note is struck the difficulty and the inestimable reward of sturdy action perhaps the most splendid expression of this essential part of niti is found in the third book in the words which the crow live strong addresses to his king cloudy a noble purpose to attain desiderates extended pain asks man's full greatness pluck and care and loved ones aiding with a prayer yet if it climb to heart's desire what men of pride and fighting fire of passion and of self esteem can bear the unaccomplished dream his heart indignantly is bent through its achievement on content equal stress is laid upon the winning and holding of intelligent friends the very name of the second book is the winning of friends the name of the first book is the loss of friends throughout the whole work we are never permitted to be long oblivious of the rarity the necessity and the pricelessness of friendship with the excellent for indeed the days when meetings do not fail with wise and good are lovely clearings on the trail through life's wild wood so speaks slow the turtle and swift the crow expresses it thus they taste the best of bliss are good and find life's truest ends who glad and gladdening rejoice and love with loving friends last of all and in a sense including all else is the use of the intelligence without it no human joy is possible nothing beyond animal happiness for if there be no mind debating good and ill and if religion send no challenge to the will if only greed be there for some material feast how draw a line between the man beast and the beast one must have at disposal all valid results of scholarship yet one must not be a scholar for scholarship is less than sense therefore seek intelligence one must command a wealth of detailed fact ever alert to the deceptiveness of seeming fact since often times the firefly seems a fire the sky looks flat yet sky and fly are neither this nor that one must understand that there is no substitute for judgment and no end to the reward of discriminating judgment to know oneself is hard to know wise effort effort vain but accurate self critics are secure in times of strain one must be ever conscious of the past yet only as it offers material for wisdom never as an object of brooding regret 
for lost and dead and past the wise have no laments between the wise and fools is just this difference this is the lofty consolation offered by a woodpecker to a hen sparrow whose eggs have been crushed by an elephant with the spring fever and the whole matter finds its most admirable expression in the noble words of cheek the jackal what is learning who's attaining sees no passion vain no reigning love and self-control does not make the mind a menial finds in virtue no congenial path and final goal whose attaining is but straining for a name and never gaining fame or peace of soul this is niti the harmonious development of the powers of man a life in which security prosperity resolute action friendship and good learning are so combined as to produce joy it is a noble ideal shaming many tawdry ambitions many vulgar catchwords of our day and this noble ideal is presented in an artistic form of perfect fitness in five books of wise and witty stories in most of which the actors are animals 3 better with the learned dwell even though it be in hell than with vulgar spirits roam palaces that gods call home panchatantra book 2 the word panchatantra means the five books the pentateuch each of the five books is independent consisting of a framing story with numerous inserted stories told as fit circumstances arise by one or another of the characters in the main narrative thus the first book relates the broken friendship of the lion rusty and the bull lively with some 30 inserted stories told for the most part by the two jackals victor and cheek the second book has its framing story the tale of the friendship of the crow the mouse the turtle and the deer whose names are swift gold slow and spot the third book has as framing story the war between crows and owls these three books are of considerable length and show great skill in construction a somewhat different impression is left by books 4 and 5 the framing story of 4 the tale of the monkey and the crocodile has less interest than the inserted stories while book 5 can hardly be said to have a framing story and it ends with a couple of grotesque tales somewhat different in character from the others these two shorter books in spite of the charm of their contents have the appearance of being addenda and in some of the older recensions are reduced in bulk to the verge of extinction the device of the framing story is familiar in oriental works the instance best known to europeans being that of the arabian nights equally characteristic is the use of epigrammatic verses by the actors in the various tales these verses are for the most part quoted from sacred writings or other sources of dignity and authority it is as if the animals in some english beast fable were to justify their actions by quotations from shakespeare and the bible these wise verses it is which make the real character of the panchatantra the stories indeed are charming when regarded as pure narrative but it is the beauty wisdom and wit of the verses which lift the panchatantra far above the level of the best story books it hardly needs to be added that in the present version verse is always rendered by verse prose by prose the titles of the individual stories however have been supplied by the translator since the original has none the large majority of the actors are animals who have of course a fairly constant character thus the lion is strong but dull of wit the jackal crafty the heron stupid the cat a hypocrite the animal actors present far more vividly and more urbanely than men could do the view of life here recommended a view shrewd undeceived and free of all sentimentality a view that piercing the humbug of every false ideal reveals with incomparable wit the sources of lasting joy author w rider berkeley california july 1925 End of section zero. Section one of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction. One Vishnu Sharma, shrewdly gleaning all worldly wisdom's inner meaning, 
In these five books, the charm compresses of all such books the world possesses. And this is how it happened. In the southern country is a city called Maiden's Delight. There lived a king named Immortal Power. He was familiar with all the works treating of the wise conduct of life. His feet were made dazzling by the tangle of rays of light from jewels in the diadems of mighty kings who knelt before him. He had reached the far shore of all the arts that embellish life. This king had three sons. Their names were Rich Power, Fierce Power, Endless Power, and they were supreme blockheads. Now when the king perceived that they were hostile to education, he summoned his counsellors and said, Gentlemen, it is known to you that these sons of mine, being hostile to education, are lacking in discernment. So when I behold them, my kingdom brings me no happiness, though all external thorns are drawn. For there is wisdom in the proverb, Of sons unborn or dead or fools, unborn or dead will do. They cause a little grief, no doubt, but fools a long life through. And again, to what good purpose can a cow that brings no calf nor milk be bent? Or why beget a son who proves a dunce and disobedient? Some means must therefore be devised to awaken their intelligence. And they, one after another, replied, O king, first one learns grammar in twelve years. If this subject has somehow been mastered, then one masters the book on religion and practical life. Then the intelligence awakens. But one of their number, a counsellor named Keen, said, O king, the duration of life is limited and the verbal sciences require much time for mastery. Therefore let some kind of epitome be devised to wake their intelligence. There is a proverb that says, Since verbal science has no final end, since life is short and obstacles impend, let central facts be picked and firmly fixed, as swans extract the milk with water mixed. Now there is a Brahmin here named Vishnu Sharma, with a reputation for competence in numerous sciences. Entrust the princes to him. He will certainly make them intelligent in a twinkling. When the king had listened to this, he summoned Vishnu Sharma and said, Holy sir, as a favour to me, you must make these princes incomparable masters of the art of practical life. In return, I will bestow upon you a hundred land grants. And Vishnu Sharma made answer to the king, O king, Listen, here is the plain truth. I am not the man to sell good learning for a hundred land grants. But if I do not, in six months' time, make the boys acquainted with the art of intelligent living, I will give up my own name. Let us cut the matter short. Listen to my lion roar. My boasting arises from no greed for cash. Besides, I have no use for money. I am eighty years old, and all the objects of sensual desire have lost their charm. But in order that your request may be granted, I will show you a sporting spirit in reference to artistic matters. Make a note of the date. If I fail to render your sons in six months' time incomparable masters of the art of intelligent living, then His Majesty is at liberty to show me his majestic bare bottom. When the king, surrounded by his counsellors, had listened to the Brahmin's highly unconventional promise, he was penetrated with wonder entrusted the princess to him and experienced supreme content. Meanwhile, Vishnu Sharma took the boys, went home and made them learn by heart five books which he composed and called 1. The Loss of Friends 2. The Winning of Friends 3. Crows and Owls 4. Loss of Gains 5. Ill-Considered Action These the princess learned and in six months' time they answered the prescription. Since that day, this work on the art of intelligent living, called Panchatantra, or the five books, has travelled the world, aiming at the awakening of intelligence in the young. To sum the matter up, whoever learns the work by heart, or through the storyteller's art, becomes acquainted. His life by sad defeat, although the king of heavens be his foe, is never tainted. End of section 1 
Section 2 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1. The Loss of Friends Here then begins Book 1, called The Loss of Friends. The first verse runs, The forest lion and the bull Were linked in friendship growing full. A jackal then estranged the friends For greedy and malicious ends. And this is how it happened. In the southern country was a city called Maiden's Delight. It rivaled the city of Heaven's King, so abounding in every urban excellence as to form the central jewel of Earth's diadem. Its contour was like that of Kailasha Peak. Its gates and palaces were stocked with machines, missile weapons, and chariots in great variety. Its central portal, massive as Indrakila Mountain, was fitted with bolt and bar, panel and arch, all formidable, impressive, solid. Its numerous temples lifted their firm bulk near spacious squares and crossings. It wore a moat-girdled zone of walls that recalled the high uplifted Himalayas. In this city lived a merchant named Inkris. He possessed a heap of numerous virtues and a heap of money, a result of the accumulation of merit in earlier lives. As he once pondered in the dead of night, his conclusions took this form. Even an abundant store of wealth, if pecked at, sinks together like a pile of soot. A very little, if added to, grows like an anthill. Hence, even though money be abundant, it should be increased. Riches unearned should be earned. What is earned should be guarded. What is guarded should be enlarged and heedfully invested. Money even if hoarded in commonplace fashion, is likely to go in a flash, the hindrances being many. Money unemployed when opportunities arise is the same as money unpossessed. Therefore, money once acquired should be guarded, increased, employed. As the proverb says, release the money you have earned, so keep it safely still. The surplus water of a tank must find a way to spill. Wild elephants are caught by tame, with capital, it is the same. In business, beggars have no scope, whose stock in trade is empty hope. If any fail to use his fate for joy in this or future state, his riches serve as foolish fetters, he simply keeps them for his betters. Having thus set his mind in order, he collected merchandise bound for the city of Mathura, assembled his servants, and after saying farewell to his parents, when asterism and lunar stations were auspicious, set forth from the city with his people following, and with blare of conch shell and beat of drum preceding. At the first water, he bade his friends turn back while he proceeded. To bear the yoke, he had two bulls of good omen. Their names were joyful and lively. They looked like white clouds, and their chests were girded with golden bells. Presently, he reached a forest, lovely with grizzlies, acacias, darks and sals, densely planted with other trees of charming aspect, fearsome with elephants, wild oxen, buffaloes, deer, grunting cows, boars, tigers, leopards and bears, abounding in water that issued from the flanks of mountains, rich in caves and thickets. Here the bull lively was overcome, partly by the excessive weight of the wagon, partly because one foot sank helpless where far-flung water from cascades made a muddy spot. At this spot, the bull somehow snapped the yoke and sank in a heap. When the driver saw that he was down, he jumped excitedly from the wagon, ran to the merchant not far away, and humbly bowing said, O oh, my lord, Lively was wearied by the trip and sank in the mud. On hearing this, merchant increase was deeply dejected. He halted for five nights. But when the poor bull did not return to health, he left caretakers with a supply of fodder and said, You must join me later, bringing lively if he lives, if he dies, after performing the last sad rites. Having given these directions, he started for his destination. On the next day, the men fearing the many drawbacks of the forest started also and made a false report to their master. Poor lively died, they said, and we performed the last sad rites with fire and everything else. And the merchant feeling grieved for a mere moment, out of gratitude performed a ceremony that included rites for the departed, then journeyed without hindrance to Mathura. 
In the meantime, lively since his fate willed it, and further life was predestined, hobbled step by step to the bank of the Jumna, his body invigorated by a mist of spray from the cascades. There he browsed on the emerald tips of grass blades, and in a few days grew plump as Shiva's bull, high humped and full of energy. Every day he tore the tops of anthills with goring horns and frisked like an elephant. But one day, a lion named Rusty, with a retinue of all kinds of animals, came down to the bank of the Jamna for water. There he heard Lively's prodigious bellow. The sound troubled his heart exceedingly, but he concealed his inner feelings, while beneath a spreading banyan tree, he drew up his company in what is called the Circle of Four. Now the divisions of the Circle of Four are given as 1. The Lion 2. The Lion's Guard 3. The Understrappers 4. The Menials In all cities, capitals, towns, hamlets, market centres, settlements, border posts, land grants, monasteries and communities, there is just one occupant of the Lion's Post. Relatively few are active as the Lion's Guard. The Understrappers are the indiscriminate throng. The Menials are posted on the outskirts. The three classes are each divided into members, high, middle and low. Now Rusty, with counsellors and intimates, enjoyed a kingship of the following order. His royal office, though lacking the pomp of umbrella, fly-flap, fan, vehicle and amorous display, was held erect by sheer pride in the sentiment of unaffected pluck. It showed unbroken haughtiness and abounding self-esteem. It manifested a native zeal for unchecked power that brooked no rival. It was ignorant of cringing speech, which it delegated to those who liked that sort of thing. It functioned by means of impatience, wrath, haste, and ota. Its manly goal was fearlessness, disdaining fawning, strange to obsequiousness, unalarmed. It made use of no wheedling artifices, but glittered in its reliance on enterprise, valour, dignity. It was independent, unattached, free from selfish worry. It advertised the reward of manliness by its pleasure in benefiting others. It was unconquered, free from constraint and meanness, while it had no thought of elaborating defensive works. It kept no account of revenue and expenditure. It knew no deviousness, nor time-serving, but was prickly with the energy earned by loftiness of spirit. It wasted no deliberation on the conventional six expedients, nor did it hoard weapons or jewellery. It had uncommon appetite for power, never adopted subterfuges, was never an object of suspicion. It paid no heed to wives or ambush layers, to their torrents of tears or their squeals. It was without reproach. It had no artificial training in the use of weapons, but it did not disappoint expectations. It found satisfactory food and shelter without dependence on servants. It had no timidity about any foreign forest and no alarms. Its head was high, as the proverb says, the lion needs, in forest station, no trappings and no education, but lonely power and pride, and all the song his subjects sing is in the words, O King, O King, and no epithet beside. And again, the lion needs, for his appointing, no ceremony, no anointing. His deeds of heroism bring him fortune. Nature crowns him king. The elephant is the lion's meat, with drops of trickling ichor sweet. Though lack thereof should come to pass, the lion does not nibble grass. Now Rusty had in his train two jackals, sons of counsellors, but out of a job. Their names were Cheek and Victor. These two conferred secretly, and Victor said, My dear Cheek, just look at our master Rusty. He came this way for water. For what reason does he crouch here so disconsolate? Why meddle, my dear fellow, said Cheek. There is a saying, Death pursues the meddling flunky, note the wedge-extracting monkey. How was that? asked Victor, and Cheek told the story of the wedge-pulling monkey. End of section 2 Section 3 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wedge Pulling Monkey There was a city in a certain region. In a grove nearby, a merchant was having a temple built. Each day at noon hour, the foremen and workers would go to the city for lunch. Now one day, a troop of monkeys came upon the half-built temple. There lay a tremendous anjana log, which a mechanic had begun to split, a wedge of acacia wood being thrust in at the top. There the monkeys began their playful frolics upon treetop, lofty roof, and woodpile. Then one of them, whose doom was near, thoughtlessly bestrode the log, thinking, Who stuck a wedge in this queer place? So he seized it with both hands and started to work it loose. Now what happened when the wedge gave at the spot where his private parts entered the cleft? That, sir, you know without being told. And that is why I say that meddling should be avoided by the intelligent. And you know, he continued, that we do pick up a fair living just from his leavings. But, said Victor, how can you give first-rate service merely from a desire for food with no desire for distinction? There is wisdom in the saying, in hurting foes and helping friends, the wise perceive the proper ends. Of serving kings, the belly's call to answer is no job at all. And again, when many lives on one depend, then life is life indeed. A crow with beak equipped can fill his belly's selfish need. If loving kindness be not shown to friends and souls in pain, to teachers, servants and oneself, what use in life, what gain? A crow will live for many years and eat the offered grain. A dog is quite contented if he gets a meatless bone, a dirty thing with gristled strings and marrow fat alone, and not enough of it at that to still his belly's moan. The lion scorns the jackal though, between his paws to smite the elephant, for every one, however sad his plight, demands the recompense that he esteems his native right. Dogs wag their tails and fawn and roll, bare mouth and belly at your feet. Bull elephants show self-esteem, demand much coaxing ere they eat. A tiny rill is quick to fill, and quick a mouse's paws. So seedy men are grateful when there is but little cause. For if there be no mind, debating good and ill, and if religion send no challenge to the will, if only greed be there, for some material feast, how draw a line between the man-beast and the beast? Or more accurately yet, since cattle draw the plough through rough and level soil and bend their patient necks to heavy wagons toil, are kind of sinless birth and find in grass a feast, how can they be compared with any human beast? But at present, said Cheek, we do hold no job at court, so why meddle? My dear fellow, said Victor, after a little the jobless man does hold a job. As the saying goes, the jobless man is hired for careful serving. The holder may be fired if undeserving. No character moves up or down, at others smile or others frown, but honour or contempt on earth will follow conduct's inner worth. And once more, it costs an effort still to carry stones uphill. They tumble in a trice, so virtue and so vice. Well, said Cheek, what do you wish to imply? And Victor answered, You see, our master is frightened, his servants are frightened, and he does not know what to do. How can you be sure of that? asked Cheek. And Victor said, Isn't it plain? An ox can understand, of course, the spoken word, a driven horse or elephant exerts his force. But men of wisdom can infer, unuttered thought from features stir, for wit rewards its worshipper. And again, from feature gesture gait, from twitch or word, from change in eye or face, is thought inferred. So by virtue of native intelligence, I intend to get him into my power this very day. Why, said Cheek, you do not know how to make yourself useful to a superior. So tell me, how can you establish power over him? And why, my good fellow, 
Do I not know how to make myself useful? said Victor. The saintly poet Vyasa has sung the entry of the Pandu princes into Virata's court. From his poem I learned the whole duty of a functionary. You have heard the proverb, No burden enervates the strong. To enterprise, no road is long. The well-informed, all countries range. To flatterers, no man is strange. But Cheek objected. He might perhaps despise you for forcing yourself into a position that does not belong to you. Yes, said Victor. There is point in that. However, I am also a judge of occasions, and there are rules as follows. The Lord of Learning speaking to a false occasion will meet with hatred and, of course, lack of persuasion. And again, the favourite's business comes to be a sudden source of king's ennui. When he is thoughtful, trying sense, retiring or in conference, and once again, on hours of talk or squabbling rude, of physic, barber, flirting food, a gentleman does not intrude. Let every one be cautious in palaces of kings, and let not students rummage in their professors' things. For naughty meddlers suffer destruction swift and sure, like evening candles lighted in houses of the poor. Or put it this way, on entering a palace, adjust a modest dress, go slowly, bowing lowly, in timely humbleness, and sound the kingly temper, and kingly whims no less. Or this way, though ignorant and common, unworth the honouring, men win to royal favour by standing near the king, for kings and vines and maidens to nearest neighbours cling. And once again, the servant in his master's face discerns the signs of wrath and grace, and though the master jerk and tack, the servant slowly mounts his back. And finally, the brave, the learned, he who wins to bureaucratic power, these three, alone of all mankind, can pluck earth's golden flower. Now let me inform you how power is gained by dancing attendance on a master. Win the friendly counsellors to the monarch dear, Win persuasive speakers, so gain the royal year. On the undiscerning mob, tis not wise to toil. No man reaps a harvest by ploughing barren soil. Serve a king of merit, though friendless, destitute. After some delay, you pluck long-enduring fruit. Hate your master and you fill, servant's meanest state. Not discerning whom to serve, tis yourself you hate. Treat the dowager, the queen, and the king to be, chaplain, porter, counsellor, most obsequiously. One who seeks the van in fights, in the palace clings, in the city walks behind, is beloved of kings. One who flatters when addressed, does the proper things, acts without expressing doubts, is beloved of kings. One the royal gifts of cash, prudently who flings, Wearing gifts of garments, he is beloved of kings. One who never makes reply, that his master stings. Never boisterously laughs, is beloved of kings. One who never hearkens to queenly whisperings, in the women's quarters dumb, is beloved of kings. One who even in distress never boasts and sings, of his master's favour he is beloved of kings. One who hates his master's foe, loves his friend and brings pain or joy to either one, is beloved of kings. One who never disagrees, blames or pulls the strings of intrigue with enemies, is beloved of kings. One who finds in battle peace, free from questionings, thinks of exile as of home, is beloved of kings. One who thinks of dice as death, wine as poison stings, Others' wives' as statues, he is beloved of kings. Well, said Cheek, when you come into his presence, what do you intend to say first? Please tell me that. And Victor replied, Answers after speech begins. Further answers breed as a seed with timely rain, ripens other seed. And besides, a clever servant shows his master the gleam of triumph or disaster. From good or evil courses springing, and shows him wit decision-bringing. The man possessing such a wit should magnify and foster it. 
thereby he earns a livelihood and public honour from the good. And there is a saying, Let any one who does not seek his master's fall unbidden speak, so act at least the excellent, the other kind are different. But, said Cheek, kings are hard to conciliate. There is a saying, In sensuous coil and heartless toil, in sinuous course and armoured force, in savage harms that yield to charms, in all these things are snakes like kings, uneven, rough, and high enough, yet low folk roam their flanks as home, and wild things haunt them hungry gaunt, in all these things are hills like kings. The things that claw and the things that gore are unreliable things, and so is a man with a sword in his hand, and rivers and women and kings. Quite true, said Victor. However, the clever man soon penetrates the subject's mind and captivates. Cringe and flatter him when angry, love his friend and hate his foe. Duly advertise his presence, trust no magic, win him so. And yet, if a man excel in action, learning fluent word, make yourself his humble servant while his power is stirred. Quick to leave him at the moment when he grows absurd. Plant your words where profit lies, wither cloth takes faster dyes. Till you know his power and manhood, effort has no scope. Moonlight's glitter vainly rivals Himalaya's slope. And Cheek replied, If you have made up your mind, then seek the feet of the king. Blessed be your journeyings. May your purpose be accomplished. Be heedful in the presence of the king. We also to your health and fortune cling. Then Victor bowed to his friend and went to meet Rusty. Now when Rusty saw Victor approaching, he said to the doorkeeper, Away with your reed of office. This is an old acquaintance, the councillor's son, Victor. He has free entrance. Let him come in. He belongs to the second circle. So Victor entered, bowed to Rusty, and sat down on the seat indicated to him. Then Rusty extended a right paw adorned with claws as formidable as thunderbolts, and said respectfully, Do you enjoy health? Why has so long a time passed since you were last visible? And Victor replied, Even though my royal master has no present need of me, still, I ought to report at the proper time, for there is nothing that may not render service to a king. As the saying goes, To clean a tooth or scratch an ear, a straw may serve a king. A man with speech and action is a higher kind of thing. Besides, we who are ancestral servants of our royal master follow him even in disasters. For us, there is no other course. Now the proverb says, Set in fit position each, gem or serving man. No tiaras on the toes, just because you can. Servants leave the kings who their qualities ignore. Even kings of lofty line, wealthy, served of yore, lacking honour from their equals, jobless, declasse, servants give their master notice that they will not stay, and again, if set in a tin a gem that would adorn a golden frame, will never scream nor fail to gleam, yet tells its wearer's shame. The king who reads a servant's mind, dull, faithless, faithful, wise, May servants find of every kind, for every enterprise. And as for my master's remark, it is long since you were last visible, pray hear the reason of that. Where just distinction is not drawn, between the left and right, the self-respecting, if they can, will quickly take to fight. If masters no distinction make among their servants, then they lose the zealous offices of energetic men. And in a market where it seems that no distinctions hold between red eye and ruby, how can precious gems be sold? There must be bonds of union in all their dealings, since no prince can lack his servants, nor servants lack a prince. Yet the nature of the servant also depends on the master's quality, as the saying goes, in case of horse or book or sword, of woman, man or loot or word, the use of uselessness depends on qualities the user lends. And on another point, you do wrong to despise me because I'm a jackal. 
For silk comes from worms, and gold from stone. From cow's hair sacred grass is grown. The water lily springs from mud. From cow dung sprouts the lotus bud. The moon its rise from ocean takes. And gems proceed from hoods of snakes. And cow's bile yellow dye stuffs come. And fire in wood is quite at home. The worthy, by display of worth, attain distinction, not by birth. And again, kill, although domestic born, any hurtful mouse, bribe an alien cat who will help to clean the house. And once again, how use the faithful lacking power, or strong who evil do? But me, O king, you should not scorn, for I am strong and true. Scorn not the wise who penetrate truth's universal law. They are not meant to be restrained by money's petty straw. When beauty glistens on their cheeks, by trickling ichor lint, bull elephants feel lotus chains as no impediment. Oh, said Rusty, you must not say such things. You are our counsellor's son, an old retainer. Oh, king, said Victor, there is something that should be said. And the king replied, My good fellow, reveal what is in your heart. Then Victor said, My master set out to take water. Why did he turn back and camp here? And Rusty, concealing his inner feelings, said, Victor, it just happened so. O king, said the jackal, if it is not a thing to disclose, then let it be. Some things a man should tell his wife, some things to friend and some to son. All things are trusted. He should not tell everything to everyone. Hereupon Rusty reflected, He seems trustworthy. I will tell him what I have in mind. For the proverb says, You find repose in sore disaster by telling things to powerful master, to honest servant, faithful friend, or wife who loves you till the end. Friend Victor, did you hear a great voice in the distance? Yes, master, I did, said Victor. What of it? And Rusty continued, My good fellow, I intend to leave this forest. Why? said Victor. Because, said Rusty, there has come into our forest some prodigious creature from whom we hear this great voice. His nature must correspond to his voice and his power to his nature. What? said Victor. Is our master frightened by a mere voice? You know the proverb, water undermines the dikes. Love dissolves when malice strikes. Secrets melt when babblings start. Simple words melt dusted hearts. So it would be improper if our master abruptly left the forest, which was won by his ancestors, and has been so long in the family. For they say, wisely move one foot, the other should its vantage hold, till assured of some new dwelling, do not leave the old. Besides, many kinds of sounds are heard here, yet they are nothing but noises. For example, we hear the sounds made by thunder, wind among the reeds, lutes, drums, tambourines, conch shells, bells, wagons, banging doors, machines and other things. They are nothing to be afraid of. As the verse says, If a king be brave, however fierce the foe and grim, sorrows of humiliation do not wait for him. And again, bravest bosoms do not falter, fearing heaven's threat. Summer dries the pools, the Indus rises greater yet. And once again, mothers bear on rare occasions to the world a chief, glad in luck and brave in battle, undepressed in grief. And yet again, do not act as does the grass blade, lacking honest pride, drooping low in feeble meanness, lightly brushed aside. My master must take this point of view and reinforce his resolution. Not fear a mere sound, as the saying goes. I thought at first it was full of fat. I crept within, and there I did not find a thing, except some wood and skin. How was that? asked Rusty. And Victor told the story of the jackal and the war drum. End of section 3section 4 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain the jackal and the war drum 
In a certain region was a jackal, whose throat was pinched by hunger. While wandering in search of food, he came upon a king's battleground in the midst of a forest, and as he lingered a moment there, he heard a great sound. This sound troubled his heart exceedingly, so that he fell into deep dejection and said, Ah me, disaster is upon me. I am as good as dead already. Who made that sound? What kind of a creature? But on peering about, he spied a war drum that loomed like a mountain peak, and he thought, Was that sound its natural sound, or was it induced from without? Now when the drum was struck by the tips of grasses swaying in the wind, it made the sound, but was dumb at other times. So he recognized its helplessness and crept quite near. Indeed, his curiosity led him to strike it himself on both heads, and he became gleeful at the thought. Aha! After long waiting, food comes even to me, for this is sure to be stuffed with meat and fat. Having come to this conclusion, he picked a spot, gnawed a hole and crept in, and though the leather covering was tough, still he had the luck not to break his teeth. But he was disappointed to find it pure wood and skin, and recited a stanza. Its voice was fierce, I thought it stuffed with fat, so crept within, and there I did not find a thing, except some wood and skin. So he backed out, laughing to himself, and said, I thought at first that it was full of fat and the rest of it, and that is why I say that one should not be troubled by a mere sound. But, said Rusty, these retainers of mine are terrified and wish to run away, so how am I to enforce my resolution? And Victor answered, Master, they are not to blame, for servants take after the master. You know the proverb, in case of horse or book or sword, of woman, man or lute or words, the use or uselessness depends on qualities the user lends. Then summon your manhood and remain on the spot until I return, having ascertained the nature of the creature. Then act as seems proper. What? said Rusty. Are you plucky enough to go there? And Victor answered, When the master commands, is there any difference between possible and impossible to the good servant? As the proverb says, Good servants, when their lords command, behold no fear on any hand. Cross pathless seas if he desire, or gladly enter flaming fire. The servant who his lord commanding should strive to reach an understanding, on labours hard or easy, he, king's counsellor, should never be. If you feel so, my dear fellow, said Rusty, then go. Blessed be your journeyings. So Victor bowed low and set out in the direction of the sound made by Lively. And when he was gone, terror troubled Rusty's heart, so that he thought, Ah, I made a sad mistake in trusting him, to the point of revealing what was in my mind. Perhaps this Victor will betray me by taking wages from both parties, or from spite at losing his job. For the proverb says, A servant suffering from a king, dishonour after honouring, though born and trained to service, will be eager to destroy him still. So I will go elsewhere and wait, in order to learn his purpose. Perhaps Victor might even bring the thing along and try to kill me. As the saying goes, the trustful strong are caught by weaker foes with ease. The wary weak are safe from strongest enemies. Thus he set his mind in order, went elsewhere and waited all alone, spying on Victor's procedure. Meanwhile, Victor drew near to Lively, discovered that he was a bull, and reflected gleefully, Well, well, this is lucky. I shall get Rusty into my power by dangling before him war or peace with this fellow. As the proverb puts it, All counsellors draw profit from a king in worries spent, and that is why they always wish for him embarrassment. As men in health require no drug, their vigour to restore, so kings, relieved of worry, seek their counsellors no more. With these thoughts in mind, he returned to meet Rusty, and Rusty, seeing him coming, assumed his former attitude in an effort to put a good face on the matter. So when Victor had come near, had bowed low and had seated himself, Rusty said, My good fellow, did you see the creature? I saw him, said Victor, through my master's grace. Are you telling the truth? asked Rusty, and Victor answered, How could I report anything else to my gracious master? For the proverb says, 
Whoever makes before a king small statements but untrue brings certain ruin on his gods and on his teacher too. And again, the king incarnates all the gods, so sing the sages old. Then treat him like the gods, to him let nothing false be told. And once again, the king incarnates all the gods, yet with a difference. He pays for good or ill at once, the gods a lifetime hence. Yes, said Rusty, I suppose you really did see him. The great do not become angry with the mean. As the proverb says, the hurricane innocuous passes, or feeble lowly bending grasses, but tears at lofty trees, the great, their prowess greatly demonstrate. And Victor replied, I knew beforehand that my master would speak thus, so why waste words? I will bring the creature into my gracious master's presence. And when Rusty heard this, joy overspread his lotus face, and his mind felt supreme satisfaction. Meanwhile, Victor returned and called reproachfully to Lively. Come here, you villainous bull, come here. Our master Rusty asks why you are not afraid to keep up this meaningless bellowing. And Lively answered, My good fellow, who is this person named Rusty? What? said Victor. You do not even know our master Rusty? And he continued with indignation. The consequences will teach you. He has a retinue of all kinds of animals. He dwells beside the spreading banyan tree. His heart is high with pride. He is lord of life and wealth. His name is Rusty. He is a mighty lion. When Lively heard this, he thought himself as good as dead, and he fell into deep dejection, saying, My dear fellow, you appear to be sympathetic and eloquent, so if you cannot avoid conducting me there, pray cause the master to grant me a gracious safe conduct. You are quite right, said Victor. Your request shows savoir faire, for the earth has a limit, the mountains the sea. The deep thoughts of kings are without boundary. Do you then remain in this spot? Later, when I have held him to an agreement, I will conduct you to him. Then Victor returned to Rusty and said, Master, he is no ordinary creature. He has served as the vehicle of blessed Shiva. And when I questioned him, he said, Great Shiva was satisfied with me and bade me crop the grass beside the Jamna. Why make a long story of it? The Blessed One has given me this forest as a playground. At this, Rusty was frightened, and he said, I knew it, I knew it. Only by special favor of the gods do creatures wander in a wild wood, bellowing like that, and fearlessly cropping the grass. But what did you say? Master, said Victor. I said, This forest is the domain of Rusty, vehicle of Shiva's passionate wife. Hence, you come as a guest. You must meet him must spend your time in brotherly love, must eat, drink, work, play, and make your home with him. All this he promised, adding, you must make your master grant me a safe conduct. As to that, the master is the sole judge. At this, Rusty was delighted and said, Splendid, my intelligent servant, splendid. You must have taken counsel with my own heart before speaking. I grant him a safe conduct. You must hasten to conduct him here, but not until he too has bound himself by oath toward me. Yes, there is sound sense in the saying, polished, fully tested, sturdy to and straight, are the pillars proper to a house or state. Again, wit is shown in hours of crisis, doctor's wit in sore disease, counsellors in patching friendship, all are wise in hours of ease. Now Victor thought, as he set out to meet Lively, well, well, the master is gracious to me and ready to do my bidding, so there is none more blessed than I. For four things are nectar, milky food, a fire in chilly weather, an honor granted by the king, and loved ones come together. So he found lively and said respectfully, My friend, I won the old master's favor for you and made him give you a safe conduct. You may go without anxiety. Still, though you have favor in the eyes of the king, you must act in agreement with me. You must not play the haughty master. I, for my part, in alliance with you, will take the role of a counsellor and bear the whole burden of administration. Thus, we shall both enjoy royal affluence. For a sinful chase, 
yet men can stock the treasures of the crown. One starts the quarry from its lair, another strikes it down. And again, whoever is too haughty to pay king's retainers honour due will find his feet are tottering, so much in strong tooth with the king. How was that? asked Lively, and Victor told the story of Merchant Strong Tooth. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. Merchant Strong Tooth. 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 Merchant For there is much wisdom in the proverb. Suppose he minds the king's affairs, the common people hate him, and if he plays the democrat, the prince will execrate him. So, since the struggling interests are wholly contradictory, a manager is hard to find who gives them both the victory. While he occupied this position, he once had a daughter married. To the wedding, he invited all the townspeople, and the king's entourage paid them much honor, feasted them. And regaled them with gifts of garments and the like, and when the wedding was over, he conducted the king home with his ladies and showed him reverence. Now the king had a house cleaning drudge named Bull, who took a seat that did not belong to him. This in the very palace and in the presence of the king's professor. So Strong Tooth administered a cuffing and drove him out. From that moment, the humiliation so ranked in Bull's inner soul. That he had no rest even at night. Yet he thought, after all, why should I grow thin? It does me no good, for I cannot possibly hurt him. And there is a sense in the saying, indulge no angry, shameless wish to hurt unless you can. The chickpea hopping up and down will crack no frying pan. Now one morning, as he was sweeping near the bed where the king lay half awake, he said, "What impudence! Strong tooth kisses the queen." When the king heard this, he jumped up in a hurry, crying, "Come, come, bull! Is that thing true that you were muttering? Has the queen been kissed by Strong Tooth?" "O、oh, king," answered Bull, "I was awake all night because I'm passionately fond of gambling, so sleep overpowered me when I was busy with my sweeping. I do not know what I said, but the jealous king thought, 'Yes, he has free entrance to my palace. So has Strong Tooth.'" Perhaps he actually saw the fellow hugging the queen, for the proverb says, "Whate'er a man desires, sees, does in broad daylight; still mindful he will say or do asleep at night." And again, whatever secrets, good or ill, men in their bosoms keep, are soon betrayed when they are drunk or talking in their sleep. In any case, what doubt can there be where a woman is concerned? With one, she tries the gossip's art. Her glances with a second flirt, she holds another in her heart. Whom does she love enough to hurt? And again, the logs will glut the hungry fire, the rivers glut the sea's desire, and death with life be glutted when the flirt has had enough of men. No chance, no corner dark, no man to woo. Then holy sage, you find a woman true, and once again, the blunderhead who thinks my love loves me. Is ever in her power a tame bird? He, after all this lamentation, he withdrew his favour forthwith from Strong Tooth. Not to make a long story of it, he forbade his entrance at court. When Strong Tooth saw that the monarch's favour was suddenly withdrawn, he thought, "Ah me, there is wisdom in the stanza. Whom does not fortunate render proud? Whom does not death lay low? To what rue do passions not?" Bring never ceasing woe. What beggar can be dignified? Whose heart no woman stings? Who trapped by scams comes safely off? Who is beloved of kings? And again, whoever saw or heard a gambler's truthful word, a neat and cleanly crow, a woman going slow, in love a kindly snake, a eunuch's pluck awake, a drunkard's love of science, a king in friends' alliance, and yet. I never committed an unfriendly act against the king, or any one else, 
not even in a dream, not even by mere words. So why does the king withdraw his favour from me? Now one day, Bull the sweeper saw Strongtooth stopped at the palace gate, and he laughed aloud, saying to the doorkeepers, Be careful, doorkeepers, this fellow Strongtooth's temper has been spoiled by the king's favour, and he dispenses, arrests and releases. If you stop him, you will get a cuffing just like me. And Strongtooth reflected on hearing this. I see, it was Bolt's doing. Well, there is sense in the proverb. Though foolish, base and lacking pride, a servant at the monarch's side will have his honour satisfied, though fashioned on a cowardly plan, and mean a royal servant can, resent affronts from any man. After this lamentation he went home, abashed and deeply stirred. Then he summoned Bull in the evening, gave him two garments as an honourable present, and said, My good fellow, I did not drive you out by order of the king. It was because I saw you in the chaplain's presence, sitting where you did not belong, that I humiliated you. Now Bull received the two garments, as if they were the kingdom of heaven, and feeling intense satisfaction, he said, Friend merchant, I forgive you. You will soon see the reward of the honour shown me in the king's favour and such things. With this, he departed in high glee, for there is wisdom in the saying, A little thing will lift him high, a little make him fall. Twixt balance, beam and scamp there is, no difference at all. On the next day, Bull entered the palace and did his sweeping, and while the king lay half awake, he said, What intelligence! When our king sits at stool, he eats a cucumber. Now the king, hearing this, rose in amazement and said, Come, come, Bull! What twaddle is this? But I remember that you are a house servant and do not kill you. Did you ever see me engaged in that occupation? O oh, king, said Bull, I was awake all night because I am passionately fond of gambling. So drowsiness overcame me in the very act of doing my sweeping. I do not know what I was muttering. Pardon me, master, I was really asleep. Then the king thought, Why, from the day of my birth, I never ate a cucumber while engaged in that occupation, and since this blockhead has talked unimaginable nonsense about me, it must be the same with Strongtooth. This being so, I made a mistake in taking the poor man's honour from him. Nothing of the sort is conceivable with such men, and in his absence, all the king's business and city business is at loose ends. After thus considering the matter, from every point of view, he summoned Strongtooth, presented him with gems, from his own person and with garments, and reinstated him. And that is why I say, whoever is too haughty to pay king's retainer's honour due, and the rest of it. My dear fellow, said Lively, your argument is quite convincing. Let it be as you say. After this, Victor took him to Rusty and said, O oh, king, here is Lively. I have brought him hither. The future rests with the king. Then Lively bowed respectfully and stood before the king in a modest attitude. Thereupon, Rusty extended over him a right paw, plump, firm, massive, adorned with claws as formidable as thunderbolts, and said with deference, Do you enjoy health? Why do you dwell in this wild wood? Thus questioned, Lively related accurately his separation from Merchant Increase and the others, and Rusty, after listening to the story, said, Have no fear, comrade. Protected by my paws, lead your own life in this forest. Furthermore, you must always take your amusements in my vicinity, for this forest has many drawbacks, since it swarms with numerous savage creatures. And Lively made an answer, Very well, O king. Then the king of beasts went down to the bank of the Jamna, drank and bathed his fill, and plunged again into the forest, wherever inclination led him. Thus the time passed and the mutual affection of the two increasing daily. Now Lively had assimilated solid intelligence by mastering numerous authoritative works, so that in a very few days he planted discernment in Rusty, dull as was his mind. He weaned him from forest habits and taught him village manners. Why spin it out? Lively and Rusty did nothing but hold secret confabulations every day. This being so, all the other animals of the retinue were kept at a distance, as for the two jackals, they did not even have the entree. More than that, as soon as they lacked the lion's prowess, 
the whole company of animals not excluding the two jackals suffered grievously from hunger and huddled together as the proverb puts it a king though proud and pure of birth will see his servants flee a court where no rewards are won as birds are withered tree and again they may be honoured gentlemen they may devoted be yet servants have a monarch who forgets the salary while on the other hand a king may scold yet servants hold if he but pay upon the day indeed all the creatures in this world adopting cajolery or one of the other three devices live by eating one another for example some eat the countries these are kings the doctors those whom sickness stings the merchants those who buy their things and learned men the fools the married are the clergy's meat the thieves devour the indiscreet the flirts their eager lovers eat and labour eats us all they keep deceitful snares in play they lie in wait by night and day and when occasion offers prey like fish on lesser fish now cheek and victor robbed of their master's favour took counsel together for their throats were pinched with hunger and victor said cheek my noble friend we too seem to have lost our job for rusty takes such delight in lively's conversation that he neglects his business and the whole court is scattered every which way what is to be done and cheek replied even if the master does not take your advice still you should admonish him to correct his faults for the proverb says good counsellors should warn a king although he pay no heed as vidur warned the monarch blind to cease from evil deed and again good counsellors or drivers may not duck from kings or elephants that run amuck besides in introducing this grass nibbler to the master you were handling live coals and victor answered you are right the fault is mine not the master's as the saying goes the jackal at the ram fight and we when tricked by june the meddling friend were playing a self-defeating tune how was that asked cheek and victor told three stories in one called godly and june end of section 5section 6 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william rider this librivox recording is in the public domain godly and june in a certain district there was a monastery in a secluded spot in it lived a holy man named godly who in course of time acquired a great sum of money by selling finely woven garments the numerous offerings of the faithful for whom he performed sacrifices as a result he trusted no man and kept his treasure under his arm by night and day for there is a wisdom in the proverb money causes pain in getting in the keeping pain and fretting pain and loss and pain in spending damn the trouble never ending now a rogue named june who took other people's money from them observed the treasure under his arm and reflected how am i to take this treasure from him in the first place i cannot pierce the wall of the cell which is compactly built of solid stone and i cannot enter the door which is too high i will talk to him win his confidence and become his disciple for he will be in my power when i have his confidence and as the proverb says none lacking shrewdness flatter well none but a lover plays the swell no saints are found in judgment seats no clear straightforward speaker cheats having thus made up his mind he drew near to godly uttered the words glory to shiva Amen. Fell flat on his face and spoke with deference, "O oh, holy sir, all life is vanity. Youth slips by like a mountain torrent. The days of our life are like a fire in chaff. Delights of flesh are as the shadow of a cloud. Union with son, friend, servant, wife is but a dream. All this I discern clearly. What shall I do that I may safely cross the sea of many lives?" On hearing this. godly said respectfully my son blessed are you being thus indifferent to the world in early youth what says the proverb there's only saints in youth that can be saints in truth ah who is not a saint when ebbing passions faint and again first mind then body ages in case of holy sages the body ages first mind never in the worst 
And as for your search to find a means of safely crossing the sea of many lives, just listen to this. A hangman with his matted hair, or serf or other man through prayer, to holy shiver, changes cast, becomes pure Brahman at the last. Six syllables, a little prayer, a single blossom resting there. On Shiva's symbol and on earth, no further pain, no later birth. When he had listened to this, June clasped the holy man's feet and said deferentially, This being so, holy sir, pray do me the favour of imposing a vow. My son, answered Godly, I am ready to oblige you, but you must not enter my cell by night, for renunciation is recommended to ascetics, to you and to me as well, as the proverb puts it. Ascetics come to grief through greed, and kings who evil counsels heed, children through petting, wives through wine, through wicked sons a noble line, a Brahmin through unstudied books, a character through haunting crooks, a farm is ruined through neglect, and friendship lacking kind respect, love dies through absence, fortunes crash through naughtiness, and hoarded cash through carelessness or giving rash. So after taking the vow, you must sleep in a hut of thatch at the monastery gate. Holy sir, said the other, your prescription is the law of my life. I shall need it in the next world. So the sleeping arrangements being made, Godly graciously gave him initiation and granted discipleship. June, for his part, made the holy man very happy by rubbing his hands and feet, bringing writing paper and other services. Still, Godly kept his treasure under his arm. As the time passed in this manner, June reflected, Dear me, do what I will, he does not trust me. So shall I kill him with a knife in broad daylight, or give him poison, or butcher him like a beast? While he was reflecting thus, the son of a pupil of Godly's came from the village, bearing an invitation, and he said, Holy sir, pray come to my house for the ceremony of the sacred thread. And when Godly heard this, he started with June. Now as he travelled, he came to a river, seeing which, he took the treasure from under his arm, wrapped it carefully in his patched ascetic robe, worshipped the appropriate gods and said to June, June, I must step aside. Please keep careful watch of this robe and of the necessary until I return. With these words, he moved away, and as soon as he was out of sight, June seized the treasure and decamped. End of section 6「Section 7 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Jackal at the Ram Fight Now Godly sat down perfectly carefree, for his disciples' countless virtues had lulled his suspicions. As he rested, he saw a herd of rams, and two of them fighting. These two would angrily draw apart and dash together their slab-like foreheads crushing so that the blood flowed freely. This spectacle attracted a jackal, whose soul was in the fretters of carnivorous desire, and he stood between the two, lapping up the blood. When Godly observed this, he thought, Well, well, this is a dull-witted jackal. If he happens to be between, just when they crush, he will certainly meet death. This inference seems inescapable to me. Now the next time, being greedy as ever, to lap up the blood, the jackal did not move away, was caught between the crushing heads and was killed. Then Godly said, The jackal at the ram fight, and grieving for him, started to resume his treasure. He returned in no haste, but when he failed to find June, he hurried through a ceremony of purification, then examined his robe. Finding the treasure gone, he fell to the ground in a swoon, murmuring, Oh, oh, I am robbed. In a moment, he came to himself rose again and started to scream. June, June, where did you go after cheating me? Give me answer. With this repeated lamentation, he moved slowly on, picking up his disciples' tracks and muttering, and we went tricked by June. End of section 7 Section 8 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Weaver's Wife Now as he walked along, Godly spied a weaver, who with his wife was on his way to a neighbouring city for liquor to drink. 
and he called out, Look here, my good fellow, I come to you a guest, brought by the evening sun. I do not know a soul in the village. Let me receive the treatment due a guest, for the proverb says, No stranger may be turned aside, who seeks your door at eventide. Nay, honour him, and you shall be transmuted into deity. And again, some straw, a floor, and water, with kindly words beside, these four are never wanting, where pious folk abide. And once again, the sacred fires by kindly word, and Indra by the chair is stirred, Krishna by water for the feet, the lord of all by things to eat. On hearing this, the weaver said to his wife, Go, my dear, take this guest to the house, treat him hospitably, giving him water for the feet, food, a bed, and so on, and stay in the house yourself. I will bring plenty of wine and meat for you. With this, he went further. So the wife started home with Godly, and she showed a laughing countenance, for she was a whore who had a certain swain in mind. Indeed, there is sense in the verse, When night is dark, and dark the day, When streets are mired with sticky clay, When husband lingers far away, The flirt becomes supremely gay, The wench cares not a straw to miss, The covered couch, the husband's kiss, The pleasant bed, in place of this, she ever seeks a stolen bliss. And again, for stranger men, the slut will see the ruin of her family. The world's reproach, the jailer's key, will risk a death she cannot flee. Then she went home, offered Godly a rickety cot and said, My holy sir, a woman friend has come from the village and I must speak to her. I will be back directly. Meanwhile, you may stay in our house, but please be careful. With this, she put on her best things and started to find her swain. At this moment, she ran into her husband, clasping a jug of wine. He was reeling drunk, his hair was tousled, and he stumbled at every step. She ran when she saw him, entered the house, took off her finery and appeared as usual. Now the weaver had seen her flee, had observed the finery, and since he had previously heard the gossip that went the rounds about her, his heart was troubled, and anger overcame him. So he entered the house and said, You wench, you whore, where were you going? And she replied, I have not been out since I left you. What is this drunken twaddle? There is sense in the proverb. After wine and fever, these self-same symptoms come, shaking, falling to the ground, mad delirium. And again, the setting sun and drunken man are both a fiery red. They sink in naked helplessness. Their dignity is dead. When he had taken the scolding and had noticed her change of dress, he said, Whore, I have heard gossip about you for a long time. Today I have seen the proof. I am going to give you what you deserve. So he beat her limp with a club, tied her firmly to a post, and fell into a drunken slumber. At this juncture, her friend, the barber's wife, learning that the weaver was asleep, came and said, My dear, he is waiting for you over there. You know who. Go at once. But the weaver's wife replied, Just see what a fix I am in. How can I go? You must return and tell my adorer that I cannot possibly meet him there at this moment. My dear, said the barber's wife, do not say things like that. For a wench of spirit, this is no way to behave. As the saying goes, those who earn the name of blessed show a camel-like persistence. When they pluck the fruit of pleasure, counting neither toil nor distance. And again, as the other world is doubtful, and as scandal misses truth, when you've hooked another's lover, best enjoy the fruit of youth. And once again, fate may rob him of his manhood. He may handsome be or ugly, yet a wench, whate'er it cost her, entertains her lover snugly. Very fine indeed, said the weaver's wife. But tell me, how am I to go when I'm tied fast? And here lies my husband, the brute. My dear, said the barber's wife, he is helpless with drink and will not wake until the sun's rays reach him. I will set you free and take your place myself. But you must hurry back when you have entertained your admirer. This she did, and a moment later the weaver rose a little mollified and said drunkenly, Come, you nagger, if you will stay at home after today and stop nagging, I will set you free. The barber's wife said nothing, fearing 
that her voice would betray her. Even when he repeated his offer, she made no answer. Then he became angry and cut off her nose with a sharp knife and said, Whore, now you can stay there. I shall not be nice to you again. So he fell asleep, muttering. Now Godly, having lost his money, was so tormented by hunger that he could not sleep and was a witness of all that the women did. Presently, the weaver's wife, after enjoying the full delight of love with her swain, came home and said to the barber's wife, Well, are you all right? I hope that brute did not get up while I was gone. And the barber's wife answered, The rest of me is all right, but I've lost my nose. Set me free, quick, before he wakes up. I want to go home. If not, he will do something worse next time. Cut off ears and things. So the wench freed the barber's wife, took her former position, and cried reproachfully. Oh, you dreadful simpleton! I am a true wife, a model of faithfulness. What man is able to violate or disfigure me? Listen, ye guardian deities of the world, earth, heaven, and death, the feeling mind, sun, moon, and water, fire, and wind, both twilights, justice, day, and night, discern man's conduct, wrong or right. So if I am a faithful wife, May these gods make my nose grow again as it was before. More than that, if I have had so much as a secret desire for a strange man, may they reduce me to ashes. After this explosion, she said to him directly, Look, you villain, by virtue of my faithfulness, my nose has grown as it was before. And when he took a torch and examined her, he found her nose as it was originally, and a great pool of blood on the floor. At this he was amazed released her from the cords and flattered her with a hundred wheedling endearments. Now Godly had seen the whole business, and he was amazed and said, Learn science with the gods above, or imps in nether space, yet women's wit will rival it. How keep them in their place? Behold the faults with woman born, impurity and heartless scorn, untruth and folly, reckless heat, excessive greediness, deceit. Be not enslaved by women's charm, nor wish them growth in power to harm. Their slaves, of manly feeling stripped, are tame pet crows whose wings are clipped. Honey in a woman's words, poison in her breast. So although you taste her lip, drub her on the chest. This palace, filled with vice, this field, where sprouts suspicions crop, this whirling pool of doubts, this town of recklessness, sins aggregate. This house, where frauds by hundreds lie in wait. This basket full of riddling sham and quip. Or guessing which are best and bravest trip. This woman, this machine, this nectar bane. Who set it here to make religion vain? A bosom hard is praised, a forehead low, a fickle glance, a mumbling speech and slow. Thick hips a heart that constant tremors move, a natural twist in hair, and twists in love. Their virtues are a pack of vices. Then let breasts adore the fawn-eyed things, not men. For reason good, they laugh or weep. They trust you not, your trust they keep. These graveyard urns, oh, haunt them not. Keep kin and conduct free from spot. The lion, oh, whose awful face falls fierce the town-sled mane, the elephant upon whose cheeks streams Iker's glistening rain, the men of wit or courage who, in books or battles gleam, in presence of their females, all turn into cowards supreme. And once more, this ganja fruit, oh, what was God about, is poisonous within and sweet without. In these meditations, the night dragged drearily for the holy man, Meanwhile, the go-between went home with her nose cut off and reflected. What is to be done now? How is this great deficiency to be concealed? The night during which she pondered thus, her husband spent in the king's palace, practicing his trade. At dawn he came home, and being eager to begin his thriving business with the townspeople, he stopped at the door and called to her. My dear, bring me my razor case at once. The townspeople need my services. Hereupon... An idea occurred to the noseless woman. She remained in the house but sent him a single razor, and the barber, angry because the entire case had not been delivered, flung the razor in her direction. This gave the wench her opportunity. Lifting her hands to heaven, 
she dashed from the house screaming with all her might, Oh, 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 the ruffian! I was always a faithful wife. Look, he cut off my nose. Save me, save me! Hereupon the police arrived, thrashed the barber limp, tied him fast, and took him to court with his wife, whose nose was gone. And the judges asked him, Why did you do this ghastly thing to your wife? Then his wits being so addled by astonishment that he could give no answer, the juryman quoted law. The guilty man is terrified by reason of his crime. His pride is gone, his powers of speaking fail, his glances rove, his face is pale. And again, the sweat appears upon his brow. He stumbles on, he knows not how. His face is pale, and all he utters is much distorted, for he stutters. The culprit always may be found to shake and gaze upon the ground. Observe the signs as best you can and shrewdly pick the guilty man, while on the other hand, the innocent is self-reliant, his speech is clear, his glance defined, his countenance is calm and free, his indignation makes him plea. The prisoner is obviously guilty, the legal penalty for assaulting a woman is death, let him be impaled. But Godly, seeing him led to the place of execution, went to the officers of justice and said, Gentlemen, you make a mistake in putting this wretched barber to death. His conduct has been correct. Pray listen to these words of mine. The jackal at the ram fight. And we, when tricked by June, the meddling friend, were playing a self-defeating tune. So the officer said, How was that, holy sir? Then Godly related to them the three stories, complete in every detail. And they were all astonished as they listened. They set the barber free and said, Slay not a woman, Brahmin child, an invalid or hermit mild. In case of major dereliction, disfigurement is the infliction. Now she has lost her nose through her own act, as additional punishment from the king. Let her years be cut off. When this had been done, godly strengthening his spirit by the two examples, returned to his own monastery. And that is why I say, the jackal at the ram fight, and the rest of it. Well, said Cheek. Such being the case, what are you and I to do? And Victor answered, Even in these circumstances, I shall have a flash of intelligence, showing me how to separate lively from the king. Besides, he has fallen into serious vice, has our master Rusty, for mad folly stings the greatest kings, who then embrace a vice, but servants' care should check them there by means of learning nice. Into what vice has our master Rusty fallen? asked Cheek. And Victor replied, There are seven vices in the world, namely, drink, women, hunting, scolding, dice, greed, cruelty. These seven are vice. These, however, really make a single vice, called attachment, with seven subdivisions. Then Cheek inquired, is there only a single fundamental vice, or are there others also? And Victor expounded, There are in the world five situations, fundamentally vicious. And when Cheek asked, How are they differentiated? Victor continued, They are 1. Deficiency 2. Corruption 3. Attachment 4. Devastation 5. Mistaken policy To begin at the beginning, the vice called deficiency means the non-existence of one or another of these. King, counsellor, people, fortress, treasure, punitive power, friends. Secondly, when subjects, whether foreign or native, become restless, whether individually or en masse, there arises the vicious situation called corruption. Attachment was explained above in the words drink, women, hunting and the rest of it. Here, there is a love group. Drink women hunting dice, and a wrath group, scolding and the rest. A man thwarted in the love group becomes obnoxious to the wrath group. The love group requires no elucidation. The wrath group, however, threefold as already described, needs some further characterization. Scolding is ill-considered imputation of fault on the part of one bent on injuring an antagonist. Cruelty means ruthless and unwarranted refinements in putting to death, imprisonment, mutilation. Greed is covetousness, pushed to a merciless point. 
These are the seven subdivisions of the vice of attachment. Next, there are eight kinds of devastation by act of God, fire, water, disease, plague, panic, famine, devil rain, which is a mere name for excessive rain. This disposes of vice called devastation. Finally, there is mistaken policy, where a man makes a mistaken use of the six expedients, peace, war, change of base, entrenchment, alliance, duplicity, adopting war instead of peace, or peace instead of war, or making similar mistakes in regard to the other expedients. There we have the vice of mistaken policy. Now our master Rusty has fallen into the very first vice, that of deficiency. For he has been so captivated by lively that he pays not the smallest heed to counsellor or any other of the six supports of his throne. He adopts rather completely a vegetarian morality. So what is the use of a lengthy discussion? Rusty must by all means be detached from lively. No lamp, no light. How will you detach him? objected Cheek. You have not the power. My dear fellow, said Victor. There is a verse to fit the situation. Namely, in case where brute force would fail, a shrewd device may still prevail. A crow hen used a golden chain, and so the dreadful snake was slain. How was that? asked Cheek. And Victor told how the crow hen killed the black snake. End of section 8「Section 9 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How the Crow Hen Killed the Black Snake In a certain region grew a great banyan tree. In it lived a crow and his wife, occupying the nest which they had built. But a black snake crawled through the hollow trunk and ate their chicks as fast as they were born, even before baptism. Yet for all his sorrow over this violence, the poor crow could not desert the old familiar banyan tree and seek another tree. For three cannot be induced to go, the deer, the cowardly man, the crow. Three go when insult makes them pant, the lion, hero, elephant. At last the crow hen fell at her husband's feet and said, My dear lord, a great many children of mine have been eaten by that awful snake and grief for my loved and lost haunts me until I think of moving. Let us make our home in some other tree, for no friend like health abounding, and like disease no foe, no love like love of children, and hunger pangs no woe. And again, with fields o'erhanging rivers, with wife on flirting bent, or in a house with serpents, no man can be content. We are living in a deadly peril, at this the crow was dreadfully depressed, and he said, We have lived in this tree a long time, my dear. We cannot desert it, for where water may be sipped, and grass be cropped, a deer might live content, yet insult will not drive him from the wood where all his life was spent. Moreover, by some shrewd device, I will bring death upon this villainous and mighty foe. But, said his wife, this is a terribly venomous snake. How will you hurt him? And he replied, My dear, even if I have not the power to hurt him, still I have friends who possess learning, who have mastered the works on ethics. I will go and get from them some shrewd device of such nature that the villain, curse him, will soon meet his doom. After this indignant speech, he went at once to another tree, under which lived a dear friend, a jackal, he courteously called the jackal forth, related all his sorrow, then said, My friend, what do you consider opportune under the circumstances? The killing of our children is sheer death to my wife and me. My friend, said the jackal, I have thought the matter through. You need not put yourself out. That villainous black snake is near his doom by reason of his heartless cruelty. For of means to injure brutal foes, you do not need to think since of themselves they fall like trees upon the river's brink. And there is a story. A heron ate what fish he could, the bad, indifferent, and good. 
His greed was never satisfied, till strangled by a crab he died. How was that? asked the crow, and the jackal told the story of the heron that liked crab meat. End of section 9「Section 10 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Heron That Liked Crab Meat There was once a heron in a certain place on the edge of a pond. Being old, he sought an easy way of catching fish on which to live. He began by lingering at the edge of his pond, pretending to be quite irresolute, not eating even the fish within his reach. Now among the fish lived a crab. He drew near and said, Uncle, why do you neglect today your usual meals and amusements? And the heron replied, So long as I kept fat and flourishing by eating fish, I spent my time pleasantly, enjoying the taste of you. But a great disaster will soon befall you, and as I am old, this will cut short the pleasant course of my life. For this reason, I feel depressed. Uncle, said the crab, of what nature is the disaster? And the heron continued, Today I overheard the talk of a number of fishermen as they passed near the pond. This is a very big pond, they were saying, full of fish. We will try a cast of the net tomorrow or the day after, but today we will go to the lake near the city. This being so, you are lost. My food supply is cut off. I too am lost. And in grief at the thought, I am indifferent to food today. Now when the water dwellers heard the trickster's report, they all feared for their lives and implored the heron, saying, Uncle, father, brother, friend, thinker, since you are informed of the calamity, you also know the remedy. Pray save us from the jaws of this death. Then the heron said, I am a bird, not competent to contend with men. This, however, I can do. I can transfer you from this pond to another, a bottomless one. By this artful speech, they were so led astray that they said, Uncle, friend, unselfish kinsman, take me first, me first. Did you never hear this? Stout hearts delight to pay the price of merciful self-sacrifice. Count life as nothing if it end in gentle service to a friend. Then the old rascal laughed in his heart and took counsel with his mind thus. My shrewdness has brought these fishes into my power. They ought to be eaten very comfortably. Having thus thought it through, he promised what the thronging fish implored, lifted some in his bill, carried them a certain distance to a slab of stone, and ate them there. Day after day, he made the trip with supreme delight and satisfaction and meeting the fish, kept their confidence by ever new inventions. One day, the crab, disturbed by the fear of death, importuned him with the words, Uncle, pray save me too from the jaws of death. And the heron reflected, I am quite tired of this unvarying fish diet. I should like to taste him. He is different and choice. So he picked up the crab and flew through the air. But since he avoided all bodies of water and seemed planning to alight on the sun-scorched rock, the crab asked him, Uncle, where is that pond without any bottom? And the heron laughed and said, Do you see that broad, sun-scorched rock? All the water dwellers have found repose there. Your turn has now come to find repose. Then the crab looked down and saw a great rock of sacrifice, made horrible by heaps of fish skeletons, and he thought, Ah, me! Friends are foes and foes are friends, as they mar or serve your ends. Few discern where profit tends. Again, if you will with serpents play, dwell with foemen who betray. Shun your false and foolish friends, fickle seeking vicious ends. Why, he has already eaten these fish, whose skeletons are scattered in heaps. So what might be an opportune course of action for me? Yet, why do I need to consider? Man is bidden to chastise, even elders who devise, devious courses arrogant, of their duty ignorant. Again, fear fearful things, while yet no fearful thing appears. When danger must be met, strike and forget your fears. So, before he drops me there, I will catch his neck with all four claws. When he did so, the heron tried to escape, but being a fool, he found no parry to the grip of the crab's nippers and had his head cut off. 
Then the crab painfully made his way back to the pond, dragging the heron's neck as if it had been a lotus stalk. And when he came among the fish, they said, Brother, why come back? Thereupon he showed the head as his credentials and said, He enticed the water dwellers from every quarter, deceived them with his prevarications, dropped them on a slab of rock not far away and ate them. But I, further life being predestined, perceived that he destroyed the trustful, and I have brought back his neck. Forget your worries, all the water dwellers shall live in peace. And that is why I say, a heron ate what fish he could, and the rest of it. My friend, said the crow, tell me how this villainous snake is to meet his doom. And the jackal answered, go to some spot frequented by a great monarch. There, seize a golden chain or a necklace from some wealthy man who guards it carelessly. Deposit this in such a place that when it is recovered, the snake may be killed. So the crow and his wife straightway flew off at random, and the wife came upon a certain pond. As she looked about, she saw the women of a king's court playing in the water, and on the bank they had laid golden chains, pearl necklaces, garments and gems. One chain of gold the crow hen seized and started for the tree where she lived. But when the chamberlains and the eunuchs saw the theft, they picked up clubs and ran in pursuit. Meanwhile, the crow hen dropped the golden chain in the snake's hole and waited at a safe distance. Now when the king's men climbed the tree, they found a hole and in it a black snake with swelling hood. So they killed him with their clubs, recovered the golden chain and went their way. Thereafter, the crow and his wife lived in peace. And that is why I say, in cases where brute force would fail and the rest of it. Furthermore, some men permit a pretty foe through purblind heedlessness to grow, till he who played a pretty role grows like disease beyond control. Indeed, there is nothing in the world that the intelligent cannot control. As the saying goes, intelligence is power, but where could power and folly make a pair? The rabbit played upon his pride to fool him, and the lion died. How was that? asked Cheek, and Victor told the story of Numskull and the rabbit. End of section 10Section 11 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Namskal and the Rabbit In a part of a forest was a lion, drunk with pride, and his name was Namskal. He slaughtered the animals without ceasing. If he saw an animal, he could not spare him. So all the natives of the forest, deer, boars, buffaloes, wild oxen, rabbits and others, came together with woe-begone countenances, bowed heads and knees clinging to the ground. They undertook to beseech obsequiously the king of beasts. Have done, O king, with this merciless, meaningless slaughter of all creatures. It is hostile to happiness in the other world. For the scripture says, A thousand future lives will pass in wretchedness, for sins a fool commits, his present life to bless. Again, what wisdom in a deed that brings dishonor fell, that causes loss of trust, that paves the way to hell. And yet again, the ungrateful body frail and rank with filth within, in such that only fools for its sake sink in sin. Consider these facts and cease, we pray, to slaughter our generations. For if the master will remain at home, we will, of our own motion, send him each day for his daily food one animal of the forest. In this way, neither the royal sustenance nor our families will be cut short. In this way, let the king's duty be performed. For the proverb says, The king who tastes his kingdom like elixir bit by bit, who does not overtax its life, will fully relish it. The king who madly butchers men, their lives as little reckoned, as lives of goats has one square meal, but never has a second. A king desiring profit guards his world from evil chance, with gifts and honours waters it, as florists water plants. Guard subjects like a cow, nor ask for milk each passing hour. A vine must first be sprinkled, 
Then it ripens fruit and flower. The monarch lamp from subjects draws, tax oil to keep it bright. Has any ever noticed kings that shone by inner light? A seedling is a tender thing, and yet, if not neglected, it comes in time to bearing fruit, so subjects well protected. Their subjects form the only source from which accrue to kings their gold, grain, gems, and varied drinks, and many other things. The king who serve the common weal luxuriantly sprout. The common loss is kingly loss, without a shade of doubt. After listening to this address, Namskal said, Well, gentlemen, you are quite convincing, but if an animal does not come to me every day as I sit here, I promise you, I will eat you all. To this, they assented with much relief and fearlessly roamed the wood. Each day at noon, one of them appeared as his dinner, each species taking its turn and providing an individual grown old or religious or grief-stricken or fearful of the loss of son or wife. One day, a rabbit's turn came, it being rabbit day, and when all the thronging animals had given him directions, he reflected, How is it possible to kill this lion? Curse him! Yet, after all, in what can wisdom not prevail? In what can resolution fail? What cannot flattery subdue? What cannot enterprise put through? I can kill even a lion. So he went very slowly, planning to arrive tardily, and meditating with troubled spirit on a means of killing him. Late in the day, he came into the presence of the lion, whose throat was pinched by hunger in consequence of the delay and who angrily thought as he licked his chops, Aha! I must kill all the animals the first thing in the morning. While he was thinking, the rabbit slowly drew near, bowed low, and stood before him. But when the lion saw that he was tardy and too small at that for a meal, his soul flamed with wrath, and he taunted the rabbit, saying, You reprobate! First, you are too small for a meal. Second, you are tardy. Because of this wickedness, I am going to kill you, and tomorrow morning I shall extirpate every species of animal. Then the rabbit bowed low and said with deference, Master, the wickedness is not mine, nor the other animals. Pray hear the cause of it. And the lion answered, Well, tell it quick, before you are between my fangs. Master, said the rabbit, all the animals recognized today that the rabbit's turn had come, and because I was quite small, they dispatched me with five other rabbits. But in mid-journey, there issued from a great hole in the ground a lion who said, Where are you bound? Pray to your favorite god. Then I said, We are traveling as the dinner of Lion Namskal, our master, according to agreement. Is that so? said he. This forest belongs to me, so all the animals, without exception, must deal with me, according to agreement. This numskull is a sneak thief. Call him out and bring him here at once. Then whichever of us proves stronger shall be king and shall eat all these animals. At his command, master, I have come to you. This is the cause of my tardiness. For the rest, my master is the sole judge. After listening to this, Namskal said, Well, well, my good fellow, show me that sneak thief of a lion and be quick about it. I cannot find peace of mind until I have vented on him my anger against the animals. He should have remembered the saying, Land and friends and gold at most have been won when battles cease. If but one of these should fail, do not think of breaking peace. Where no great reward is won, where defeat is nearly sure, never stir a quarrel but, find it wiser to endure. Quite so, master, said the rabbit. Warriors fight for their country when they are insulted, but this fellow skulks in a fortress. You know, he came out of a fortress when he held us up, and an enemy in a fortress is hard to handle. As the saying goes, a single royal fortress adds more a military force than do a thousand elephants, a hundred thousand horse. A single archer from a wall, a hundred foes for fence, 
and so the military art a fortress recommends god indra used the wit and skill of gods in days of old when devil goldmuth plagued the world to build a fortress hold and he decreed that any king who built a fortress sound should conquer four men that is why such fortresses abound when he heard this namskal said my good fellow show me that thief even if he is hiding in a fortress i will kill him for the proverb says the strongest man who fails to crush at birth disease or foe will later be destroyed by that which he permits to grow and again the man who reckons well his power nor pride nor vigor lacks may single-handed smite his foes like rama with the axe very true said the rabbit but after all it was a mighty lion that i saw so the master should not set out without realizing the enemy's capacity and as the saying says a warrior failing to compare two hosts in mad desire for battle plunges like a moth head foremost into fire and again the weak who challenge mighty foes a battle to abide like elephants with broken tusks return with drooping pride but namskal said what business is it of yours show him to me even in his fortress very well said the rabbit follow me master and he led the way to a well where he had said to the lion master who can endure your majesty the moment he saw you that thief crawled clear into his hole come i will show him to you be quick about it my good fellow said namskal so the rabbit showed him the well and the lion being a dreadful fool saw his own reflection in the water and gave voice to a great roar then from the well issued a roar twice as loud because of the echo this the lion heard decided that his rival was very powerful hurled himself down and met his death thereupon the rabbit cheerfully carried the glad news to all the animals received their compliments and lived there contentedly in the forest and that is why i say intelligence is power and the rest of it but said cheek that is like a palm fruit falling on a crow's head a quite exceptional case even if the rabbit was successful still a man of feeble powers should not deal fraudulently with the great and victor retorted feeble or strong one must make up his mind to vigorous action you know the proverb unceasing effort brings success fate fate is all let dastards wail smite fate and prove yourself a man what fault if bold endeavor fail furthermore the very gods befriend those who ever strive as the story goes the gods befriend a man who climbs determination's height so vishnu discuss birds sustained the weaver in the fight and further not even brahma sees the end of well devised deceit the weaver taking vishnu's form embraced the princess sweet how was that asked cheek are undertaking successful even though deceit resolutely and well devised and victor told the story of the weaver who loved a princess end of section 11 Section twelve of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Weaver Who Loved a Princess. In the molasses belt is a city called Sugarcane City. In it lived two friends, a weaver and a carpenter. Since they were past masters in their respective crafts, they had earned enough money by their labors. so that they kept no account of receipt and expenditure they wore soft gaily colored expensive garments adorned themselves with flowers and betel leaves and diffused odors of camphor aloes and musk they worked 9 hours a day after which they adorned their persons and met for recreation in such places as public squares or temples they made the rounds of the spots where society gathered theaters conversazioni's birthday parties 
banquets and the like, then went home at twilight, and so the time passed. One day there was a great festival, an occasion when the entire population, wearing the finest ornaments that each could afford, began sauntering through the temples of the gods and other public places. The weaver and the carpenter, like the rest, put on their best things, and in squares and courtyards inspected the faces of people dressed to kill, and they caught a glimpse of a princess seated at the window of a stucco palace. The vicinity of her heart was made lovely by a firm bosom with the curve of early youth. Below the slender waist was the graceful swell of the hips. Her hair was black as rain cloud, soft, glossy with billowy curl. A golden earring danced below an ear that seemed a hammock where love might swing. Her face had the charm of a new-blown, tender water lily. Like a dream, she took captive the eyes of all as she sat surrounded by girlfriends, and the weaver, ravished by lavish loveliness, since the love god with five fierce arrows pierced his heart, concealed his feelings by a supreme effort of resolution and tottered home, seeing nothing but the princess in the whole horizon. With long-drawn burning sighs he tumbled on the bed, though it had not been made up, and there he lay. He perceived, he thought of nothing but her, just as he had seen her, and there he lay reciting poetry. Virtues with beauty dwell, so poets sing, this contradiction not considering, that she so cruel sweet, far, far apart, tortures my body still, still in my heart. Or does this explain it? One heart my darling took, one pines as if to die, one throbs with feeling pure, how many hearts have I? And yet, if all the world from virtue draws a blessing and a gain, why should all virtue in my maid, my fawn-eyed maiden, pain? Each guards his home, they say, yet in my heart you stay, burning your home all way, sweet heartless one. That these her bosom's youthful pride, her curling hair, her sinuous side, her blood-red lip, her waist so small, should hurt me is not strange at all. But that her cheeks, so clear, so bright, should torture me is far from right. Her bosom like an elephant's brow, swells, saffron-scented. How, ah, how, may I thereon my bosom lay, when weary love is tired of play, so fettered in her arms to keep, a vigil, waking half, half asleep. If fate has willed that I should die, are there no means save that soft eye? You see, my love, though far apart, before you ever, O oh my heart, should vision cease to satisfy, O, oh, teach your magic to my eye, for even her presence will distress, if brought by too great loneliness, since none the merciful are blessed, of selfishness may stand confessed. She stole his lustre from the moon. The moon is dull and cold. The lily's sheen is in her eyes. No charge of theft will hold. The elephant's majesty she seized. Not knows he of her art. From me the slender maiden took, ah, strange, a feeling heart. In middle air I see my love, on earth below, in heaven above. In life's last hour, on her I call. She is like Vishnu, all in all. All mental states, the Buddha said, are transient. He was wrong. My meditations on my love are infinitely long. In such lamentations, his thoughts tossing to and fro, the night dragged drearily away. On the next day, at the customary hour, the carpenter, wearing an elegant costume, came as usual to the weaver's house. There he found the weaver, with arms and legs sprawled over the unmade bed, heard his long-drawn burning sighs, and noticed his pallid cheeks and trickling tears. Finding him in this condition, he said, My friend, my friend, why are you in such a state today? 
But the poor weaver, though questioned repeatedly, was too embarrassed to say a word. At last the carpenter grew weary and dropped into poetry. No friend is he whose anger compels a timid languor, nor he whom all must anxiously attend. But when you trust another, as if he were your mother, he is no mere acquaintance but a friend. Then after examining the weaver's heart and other members with a hand skilled in detecting symptoms, he said, Comrade, if my diagnosis is correct, your condition is not the result of fever but of love. Now when his friend voluntarily introduced the subject, the weaver sat up in bed and recited a stanza of poetry. You find repose in sore disaster by telling things to clear-eyed master. To virtuous servant, gentle friend, or wife who loves you to the end. Then he related his whole experience from the moment he laid eyes on the princess. And the carpenter, after some reflection, said, The king belongs to the warrior's caste, while you are a businessman. Have you no reverence for the holy law? But the weaver replied, The holy law allows a warrior three wives. The girl may be the daughter of a woman of my caste. That may explain my love for her. What says the king in the play? Surely she may become a warrior's bride, else why these longings in an honest mind? The motions of a blameless heart decide of right and wrong when reason leaves us blind. Thereupon the carpenter, perceiving his determined purpose, said, Comrade, what is to be done next? And the weaver answered, I don't know. I told you because you're my friend. And to this he would not add a word. At last the carpenter said, Rise, bathe, eat, say farewell to despondency. I will invent something such that you will enjoy with her the delights of love without loss of time. Then the weaver, hope reviving at his friend's promise, rose and returned to seemly living. And the next day the carpenter came bringing a brand new mechanical bird like Garuda, the bird of Vishnu. It was made of wood, was gaily painted in many colours and had an ingenious arrangement of plugs. Comrade, he said to the weaver, when you mount the bird and insert a plug, it goes wherever you wish and the contrivance alights at the spot where you pull out the plug. It is yours. This very night, when people are asleep, adorn your person, disguise yourself as Vishnu, my wit and skill are at your service. Mount this Garuda bird, alight on the maiden's balcony of the palace, and make whatever arrangements you like with the princess. I have ascertained that the princess sleeps alone on the palace balcony. When the carpenter had gone, the weaver spent the rest of the day in a hundred fond imaginings. He took a bath, used incense, powders, ointments, beetle scents for the breath, flowers and so forth. He put on gay garlands and garments, rich in fragrance. He adorned himself with a diadem and other jewellery, and when the night came clear, he followed the carpenter's instructions. Meanwhile, the princess lay in her bed alone on the palace balcony, bathed in moonbeams. She gazed at the moon, her mind idly dallying with the thought of love. All at once, she spied the weaver disguised as Vishnu, and mounted on his heavenly bird. At sight of him, she started from her bed, adored his feet and humbly said, O oh Lord, to what end am I honoured by this visit? Pray command me, what am I to do? To the princess's words, the weaver in dignified and sweetly modulated accents made stately answer, Yourself, dear maiden, are the occasion of this visit to earth. But I am merely a mortal girl, said she, and he continued, Nay, you have been my bride, now fallen to earth by reason of a curse. It is I who have so long protected you from contact with a man. I will now wed you by the ceremony used in heaven. And she assented, for she thought, It is a thing beyond my fondest aspirations. And he married her by the ceremony used in heaven. So day followed day in the enjoyment of love's delights, each day witnessing a growth in passion. Before dawn, 
The weaver would mount his mechanical Garuda, would bid her farewell with the words, I depart for Vishnu's heaven, and would always reach his house undetected. One day, the guards at the women's quarters observed indications that the princess was meeting a man, and in fear of their very lives, made a report to their master. O king, they said, be gracious and confirm our personal security. There is a disclosure to be made. And when the king assented, the guards reported, O king, we have used anxious care to forbid the entrance of men. Yet, indications are observed that Princess Lovely has meetings with a man. Not unto us does it fall to take measures. The king, the king alone is prime mover. Upon this information, the king pondered with troubled spirit. You are worried when you hear that she is born. Picking husbands makes you anxious and forlorn. When she marries, will her husband be a churl? It is tough to be the father of a girl. Again, at her birth, she steals away her mother's heart. Loving friends, when she is older, fall apart. Even married, she is apt to bring a stain. Having daughters is a business full of pain. Again, when a poem or daughter comes out, the author is troubled with doubt, with a doubt that his questions betray. Will she reach the right hands? Will she please as she stands? And what will the critics say? Having thus considered the matter from every point of view, he sought the queen and said, My dear queen, pray give careful attention to what these chamberlains have to say. Who is this offender? whom the death god seeks today. Now when they had related the facts, the queen hastened in great perturbation to the maiden's apartments and found her daughter with lips sore from kissing and with tell-tale traces on her limbs. And she cried, You wicked girl! You are a disgrace to the family! How could you throw your character away? Who is the man that comes to you? The death god has looked upon him. Dreadful as things are, at least tell the truth. Then the princess, with shame-faced drooping glances, recounted the whole story of the weaver disguised as Vishnu. Thereupon the queen, with laughing countenance and thrilling in every limb, hastened to the king and said, O king, you are indeed fortunate. It is blessed Vishnu who comes each night in person to our daughter's side. He has married her by the ceremony used in heaven. This very night, you and I are to hide in the window niche and have sight of him, but with mortals he does not exchange words. On hearing this, the king was glad at heart, and somehow lived through the day which seemed a hundred years. When night came, the king and queen stood hidden in the window niche and waited, their gaze fixed on the sky. Presently, the king described one descending from heaven, mounted on Garuda, grasping the conch shell, discuss, mace, marked with the familiar symbols, and feeling as if drenched by a shower of nectar, he said to the queen, There is none other on earth so blessed as you and I, whose child, blessed Vishnu, seeks with love. All the desires nearest our hearts are granted. Now through the power of our son-in-law, I shall reduce the whole world to subjection. At this juncture, envoys arrived to collect the yearly tribute for King Valor, monarch of the south, Lord of nine million, nine hundred thousand villages. But the king, proud of his new relationship with Vishnu, did not show them the customary honour, so that they grew indignant and said, Come, king, payday is past. Why have you failed to offer the taxes due? It must be that you have recently come into possession of some unanticipated supernatural power from some source or other, that you irritate King Valor, who is a flame, a whirlwind, a venomous serpent, a death god. Upon this, the king showed them his bare bottom, and they returned to their own country, exaggerated the matter a hundred thousandfold, and stirred the wrath of their master. Then the southern monarch, with his troops and retainers at the head of an army, with all four service branches, marched against the king, and he angrily cried, This king may climb the heavenly mount, may plunge beneath the sea, and yet I promise it the wretch shall soon be slain by me. 
So valor reached the country by marches, never interrupted, and ravaged it. And the inhabitants who survived the slaughter besieged the palace gate of the king of Sugarcane City and taunted him. But what he heard did not cause the king the slightest anxiety. On the following day, the forces of King Valor arrived and invested Sugarcane City, whereupon hosts of councillors and chaplains interceded with the king. O oh, king, they said, a powerful enemy has arrived and invested the city. How can the king show himself so unconcerned? And the king replied, You gentlemen may be quite comfortable. I have devised a way of killing this foe. What I am about to do to his army, you too will learn tomorrow morning. After this address, he bade them provide adequate defense for the walls and gates. Then he summoned Lovely and with respectful coaxing said, Dear child, relying on your husband's power, we have begun hostilities with the enemy. This very night, pray speak to blessed Vishnu when he comes, so that in the morning he may kill this enemy of ours. So Lovely delivered to him at night her father's message, complete in every particular. On hearing it, the weaver laughed and said, Dear love, how little a business is this, a mere war with men. Why, in days gone by, I have with the greatest ease slain mighty demons by the thousands, and they were armed with magic. There was Hiranyakashipu, and Kansa, and Madhu, and Ketava, to name but a few. Go then and say to the king, Dismiss anxiety. In the morning, Vishnu will slay the host of your enemies with his disgust. So she went to the king and proudly told him all, whereat he was overjoyed and commanded the doorkeeper to have proclamation made with beat of drum throughout the city in these words, Whatever any shall lay hands on during tomorrow's battle in the camp of valor slain, whether coined money or grain, or gold or elephant, or horse or weapon, or other object, that shall remain his personal possession. This proclamation delighted the citizens, so that they gossiped together, saying, This king of ours is a lofty soul, unalarmed even in the presence of the hostile host. He is certain to kill his rival in the morning. Meanwhile, the weaver, forgetting love's allurements, took counsel with his brooding mind. What am I to do now? Suppose I mount the machine and fly away, then I shall never meet my pearl, my wife, again. King Valor will drag her from the palace after killing my poor father-in-law. Yet if I accept the battle, I shall meet death, who puts an end to every heart's desire. But death is mine if I lose her. Why spin it out? Death, sure death, in either case. It is better then to die game. Besides, it is just possible that the enemy, if they see me accepting battle and mounted on Garuda, will think me the genuine Vishnu and will flee. For the proverb says, Let resolution guide the great, however desperate his state, however grim his hostile fate. By resolution lifted high, with shrewd decision as ally, he grimly sees grim trouble fly. When the weaver had thus resolved on battle, the genuine Garuda made respectful representations to the genuine Vishnu in heaven. O Lord, he said, in a city on earth called Sugarcane is a weaver who, disguising himself as my lord, has wedded a princess. As a result, a more powerful monarch of the south has marched to extirpate the king of Sugarcane city. Now the weaver today takes his resolution to befriend his father-in-law. This, then, is what I must refer to your decision. If he meets death in battle, then scandal will arise in the mortal world to the effect that blessed Vishnu has been killed by the king of the south. Thereafter, sacrificial offerings will fail and other religious ceremonies. Then atheists will destroy the temples of the Lord, while pilgrims of the triple staff, devotees of the blessed Vishnu, will abstain from pious journeyings. Such being the condition of affairs, Decision rests with my Lord. Then Blessed Vishnu, after exhaustive meditation, spoke to Garuda. O King of the Winged, your reasoning is just. 
This weaver has a spark of divinity in him. Therefore, he must be the slayer of yonder king. And to bring this about, you and I must befriend him. My spirit shall enter his body. You are to inspire his bird, and my discuss, his discuss. So be it, said Garuda, assenting. Hereupon the weaver, inspired by Vishnu, gave instructions to Lovely. Dear love, when I set out for battle, let all things be made ready that bring a benediction. He then performed auspicious ceremonies, assumed ornaments seemly for battle, and permitted worshipful offerings of yellow pigment, black mustard, flowers and the like. But when the friend of day-blooming water-lilies, the blessed thousand-beamed sun arose, adorning the bridal brow of the eastern sky, then to the victorious roll of the war-drums, the king issued from the city and drew near the field of battle, and both armies formed an exact array. Then the infantry came to blows. At this moment, the weaver mounted on Garuda and scattering largest of gold and precious gems, flew from the palace roof toward heaven's vault, while the townspeople, thrilling with wonder, gazed and adored, then beyond the city he hovered above his army, and drew from Vishnu's conch a proud, grand burst of martial sound. At the blare of the conch, elephants, horses, chariots, foot soldiers were dismayed, and many garments were fouled. Some with shrill screams fled afar, some rolled on the ground, all purposive movement paralyzed. Some stood stock still, with terrified gaze, fixed, unwavering on heaven. At this point, all the gods were drawn to the spot by curiosity to see the fight, and Indra said to Brahma, Brahma, is this some imp or demon who must needs be slain? For blessed Vishnu, mounted on Garuda, has gone forth to battle in person. At these words, Brahma pondered. Lord Vishnu's disgust drinks in flood, the hostile demons gushing the blood, and strikes no mortal flat, the jungle lion who can draw, the tusker's life with awful paw, disdains to crush a gnat. What means this marvel? Thus Brahma himself was astonished. That is why I told you, not even Brahma sees the end of well-devised deceit. The weaver, taking Vishnu's form, embraced the princess sweet. While the very gods were thus pondering with tense interest, the weaver hurled his disgust at Phala. This disgust, after cutting the king in twain, returned to his hand. At the sight, all the kings without exception leaped from their vehicles, and with hands, feet and head dropping in limp obeisance, they implored him who bore the form of Vishnu. O Lord, an army leaderless is slain. Be mindful of this and spare our lives. Command us, what are we to do? So spoke the whole throng of kings, until he made answer who bore the form of Vishnu. Your persons are secure henceforth. Whatever commands you receive from the local king, King Stoutmail, you must on all occasions unhesitatingly perform. And all the kings humbly received his instructions, saying, Let it be as our Lord commands. Thereupon the weaver bestowed on stout male all his rival's wealth, whether men or elephants or chariots or horses or stores of merchandise or other riches, while he himself, having attained the special majesty of those victorious, enjoyed all known delights with the princess. And that is why I say, the gods befriend a man who climbs, determination's height, and the rest of it. Having listened to this, Cheek said, If you two are thus climbing determination's height, then proceed to the accomplishment of your desire. Blessed be your journeyings. Thereupon, Victor sought the presence of the lion, who said when Victor had bowed and seated himself, Why has so long a time passed since you were last visible? And Victor answered, O oh, king, urgent business awaits my master today. Hence I am come, the bearer of tidings, unwelcome but wholesome. This is not indeed the desire of dependents, who yet bring such tidings when they fear the neglect of immediate and necessary action. As the proverb says, 
When those appointed to advise speak wholesome truth, they cause surprise. By this remarkable excess of passionate devotedness. And again, a man is quickly found, O king, to say the sycophantic thing, but one prepared to hear or speak, and welcome truth is far to seek. Hereupon Rusty, believing his word worthy of trust, respectfully asked him, What do you wish to imply? And Victor answered, O king, lively has crept into your confidence with treasonable purpose. On several occasions, he has confidentially whispered in my hearing. I have examined the strong points and the weak in your master's power, in his prestige, his advisers, and his material resources. I plan to kill him, and to seize the royal power myself without difficulty. This very day, this lively person intends to carry out his design. That is why I am here to warn the master, whose service is mine by inheritance. To Rusty, this report was more terrible than the fall of a thunderbolt. He sank into a panic-stricken stupor and said not a word. Then Victor, comprehending his state of mind, continued, This is the great sadness in the discharge of a counsellor's duty. There is wisdom in the saying, When a counsellor or king rises higher than he should, fortune strives in vain to make still her double-footing good. Being woman, feels the strain, soon abandons one of twain. For indeed, with broken sliver, loosened tooth, or counsellor who fails in truth, pull roots and all, so only grief will find its permanent relief. And again, no king should ever delegate to one sole man the powers of state. For folly seizes him, then pride, whereat he grows dissatisfied. With service, Thus impatient grown, he longs to rule the realm alone. And such impatient longings spring him into plots to kill his king. Even now, this lively manages all business as he will, without restraint of any kind. Hence the well-known saying finds application. A counsellor who tramples through his business, though his heart be true, may not unheeded go his way since future days the present pay. But such is the nature of kings, as the poet sings. Some gentle actions born of love, to thoughts of active hatred move. Some deeds of traitorous offence, win guerdon of benevolence. The kingly mind can no man tame, as never being twice the same. Such service makes the spirit faint. A hard conundrum for a saint. On hearing this, Rusty said, After all, he is my servant. Why should he experience a change of heart toward me? But Victor answered, Servant or not, there is nothing conclusive in that. For the proverb says, The man who loves not royalty, just serving while he can, find nothing better worth his pains, is not a loyal man. My dear fellow, said the lion. Even so, I cannot find it in my heart to turn against him. For however false and fickle grown, once dear is always dear. Who does not love his body, though, decrepit, blemished, queer? And again, his actions may be hard to bear, his speech be harsh to hear, the heart still clings delighted to, a person truly dear. For that reason, retorted Victor, there is a serious flaw in the business of getting on in the world. Observe how this person, upon whom the master has concentrated his consideration to the exclusion of the whole company of animals, now desires to become himself the master. As the verse puts it, the man of birth or man unknown, if kingly eyes on him alone, are fixed as pious to seize the throne. Therefore, dear though he be, he should be abandoned being a traitor, like one who has never been dear. There is much wisdom in the saying. Pursue your aim abandoning, the fools inclined to sin, the comrades, brothers, friends or sons, or honourable kin. You know the song the women sing, we hear it far and near. What good are golden earrings if they lacerate your ear? And if you fancy that he will bring benefit, 
because he is bulky of body, you make a perverse mistake. For how use a proud bull elephant that will not serve the king? A man is better, fat or lean, who does the helpful thing. Again, any pity that our lord and king might feel toward him is quite out of place. For whoever leaves the righteous path for some unrighteous course will meet calamity in time and suffer much remorse. Whoever will not take from friends most excellent advice will gladden foes and falling soon will pay his folly's price. And again, on wicked trick intently bent, the willful still lack ear to hear. So blind their mind of nice and vice, the cause and saws appearing clear. Furthermore, where one will speak and one will heed, what in the end is well, although unpleasant at the time, there riches love to dwell. And again, no king's retainer should devise a fraud for spies are kingly eyes. Then bear with harsh as kind, O king, the truth is seldom flattering. Tried servants never should be left, and strangers taken. A kingdom's healthy by no disease is sooner shaken. My good fellow, said the lion, pray do not say such things, for never publicly defame any one's commended name. Broken promises are shame. Now I formally gave him a safe conduct, since he appeared as a suppliant. How then can he prove ungrateful? But Victor rejoined, No rogue asks a reason for his wrath, nor saint to tread in kindness's path. By nature's power, the sweet or sour, in sugar dwells, or nim trees flower. And again, caress a rascal as you will, he was and is a rascal still. All salve and sweating treatments fail to take the kink from doggy's tail. And once again, slight kindness shown to lofty souls, a strange enlargement seeks. The moonbeams gleam with whiter light on Himalaya's peaks. While on the other hand, the kindness shown to vicious souls, strange diminution seeks. The gleam of moonbeams is absorbed on sooty mountain speak. A hundred benefits are lost if lavished on the mean. A hundred epigrams with their true relevance unseen. A hundred counsels when a life obeys no rigid rule. A hundred cogent arguments are lost upon a fool. Lost is every gift that goes where it does not fit. Lost is service lavished on sluggish mind and wit. Lost upon ingratitude is the kinder plan. Lost is courtesy on one, not a gentleman. Or put it this way, perfume offered to a corpse, lotus planting dry, weeping in the wood prolonged, rain on alkali, taking kinks from doggy's tail, drawl in deafened ear, decking faces of the blind, sense for fools to hear. Or this way, milk a bull and think him some heavy uddered cow, blind to lovely maidens, clasp eunuchs anyhow. Seek in shining scraps of quads, lapis lazuli. Do not serve an adult bait, bidding sense goodbye. Ergo, the master must by no means fail to heed my sound advice. And one thing more. What tiger, monkey, snake advised, I did not do, and so, that dreadfully ungrateful man has brought me very low. How was that? asked Rusty, and Victor told the story of the ungrateful man. End of section 12section 13 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ungrateful Man In a certain town lived a Brahmin whose name was Sacrifice. Every day his wife, chafing under their poverty, would say to him, Come, Brahmin, lazy bones, stony heart, don't you see your baby starving while you hang about mooning? Go somewhere, no matter where. 
find some way, any way to get food and come back in a hurry. At last, the Brahmin, weary of this refrain, undertook a long journey and in a few days entered a great forest. While wandering hungry in this forest, he began to hunt for water and in a certain spot he came upon a well overgrown with grass. When he looked in, he discovered a tiger, a monkey, a snake and a man at the bottom. They also saw him. Then the tiger thought, Here comes a man. And he cried, O oh, noble soul, there is great virtue in saving life. Think of that and pull me out, so that I may live in the company of beloved friends, wife, sons and relatives. Why? said the Brahman. The very sound of your name brings a shiver to every living thing. I cannot deny that I fear you. But the tiger resumed. To Brahman slayer impotent, to drunkard, him on treason bent, to sinner through pre-verification, the holy grant and expiation, while for ingratitude alone, no expiation will atone. And he continued, I bind myself by a triple oath that no danger threatens you from me. Have pity and pull me out. Then the Brahmin thought it through to this conclusion. If disaster befalls in the saving of life, it is a disaster that spells salvation. So he pulled the tiger out. Next, the monkey said, Holy sir, pull me out too. And the Brahmin pulled him out too. Then the snake said, Brahmin, pull me out too. But the Brahmin answered, One shudders at the mere sound of your name. How much more at touching you? But, said the snake, We are not free agents. We bite only under orders. I bind myself by a triple oath that you need have no fear of me. And listening to this, the Brahmin pulled him out too. Then the animal said, The man down there is a shrine of every sin. Beware, do not pull him out. Do not trust him. Furthermore, the tiger said, Do you see this mountain with many peaks? My cave is in a wooded ravine on the north slope. You must do me the favor of paying me a visit there some day so that I may make return for your kindness. I should not like to drag the debt into the next life. With these words, he started for his cave. Then the monkey said, My home is quite near the cave, beside the waterfall. Please pay me a visit there. With this, he departed. Then the snake said, In an emergency, remember me. And he went his way. Then the man in the well shouted time and again, Brahman, pull me out too. At last the Brahmin's pity was awakened, and he pulled him out thinking, He is a man like me. And the man said, I am a goldsmith and live in Baroque. If you have any gold to be worked into shape, you must bring it to me. With this he started for home. Then the Brahmin continued his wanderings, but found nothing whatever. As he started for home, he recalled the monkey's invitation. So he paid a visit, found the monkey at home, and received fruits sweet as nectar, which put new life into him. Furthermore, the monkey said, If you ever have use for fruit, pray come here at any time. You have done a friend's full duty, said the Brahmin, but please introduce me to the tiger. So the monkey led the way and introduced him to the tiger. Now the tiger recognized him, and by way of returning his kindness, bestowed on him a necklace and other ornaments of wrought gold, saying, A certain prince, whose horse ran away with him, came here alone, and when he was within range of a spring, I killed him. All this I took from his person and stored carefully for you. Pray, accept it, and go where you will. So the Brahmin took it, then recalled the goldsmith and visited him, thinking, He will do me the favor of getting it sold. Now the goldsmith welcomed him with respectful hospitality, offering water for the feet, an honorable gift, a seat, hard food and soft, drink and other things, then said, Command me, sir, what may I do for you? And the Brahmin said, I have brought you gold, please sell it. Show me the gold, said the goldsmith, and the other did so. Now the goldsmith thought when he saw it, I worked this gold for the prince, and having made sure of the fact, he said, Please stay right here, while I show it to somebody. With this, 
he went to court and showed it to the king. On seeing it, the king asked, Where did you get this? And the goldsmith replied, In my house is a Brahmin. He brought it. Thereupon the king reflected, Without question, that villain killed my son. I will show him what that costs. And he issued orders to the police. Have this Brahmin scum fettered and impale him tomorrow morning. When the Brahmin was fettered, he remembered the snake, who appeared at once and said, What can I do to serve you? Free me from these fetters, said the Brahmin. And the snake replied, I will bite the king's dear queen. Then, in spite of the charms employed by any great conjurer and the antidotes of other physicians, I will keep her poisoned. Only by the touch of your hand will the poison be neutralized. Then you will go free. Having made this promise, the snake bit the queen, whereupon shouts of despair arose in the palace, and the entire city was filled with dismay. Then they summoned dealers in antidotes, conjurers, scientists, druggists and foreigners, all of whom treated the case with such resources as they had, but none could neutralize the poison. Finally, a proclamation was made with beat of drum, upon hearing which the Brahmin said, I will cure her. The moment he spoke, they freed him from his fetters, took him to the king and introduced him. And the king said, Cure her, sir. So he went to the queen and cured her by the mere touch of his hand. When the king saw her restored to life, he paid the Brahmin honor and reverence, then respectfully asked him, Reveal the truth, sir. How did you come by this gold? And the Brahmin began at the beginning and related the whole adventure accurately. As soon as the king comprehended the facts, he arrested the goldsmith, while he gave the Brahmin a thousand villages and appointed him privy councillor. But the Brahmin summoned his family, was surrounded by friends and relatives, took delight in eating and other natural functions, acquired massive merit by the performance of numerous sacrifices, concentrated authority by heedful attention to all phases of royal duty, and lived happily. And that is why I say, what tiger monkey snake advised, and the rest of it. And Victor continued, Friend or kinsman, teacher, king, must be kept from trespassing. If they cling to evil still, they will bend you to their will. O oh, king, he is obviously a traitor, however tirelessly benevolent. Save a friend on evil bent. This is sainthood's perfect song. Every substitute is wrong. Again, who saves from vice is truly kind. True wife is she who shares your mind. True acts are free from every blame. True joy from avarice's shame. True wisdom wins the praise of saints. True friends involve in no restraints. True glory knows no haughtiness. True men are cheerful in distress. And again, Rest your sleeping head in fire, pillow it with snakes. Do not smile at worthy friends who pursue mistakes. Now my lord and king associates with lively, making a vicious mistake that results in the neglect of three things worth living for, virtue, money and love. And in spite of my protestations, urged from various points of view, my lord and king goes his willful way unheeding. In the future, therefore, when the crash comes, do not blame your servant. You have heard the saying, No thought of profit or of right can headstrong monarchs stay, who like bull elephants amuck pursue their reckless way. When puffed with pride they come to grief, in thickets of distress, they blame their servants and forget their proper naughtiness. Such being the case, my good fellow, said the lion, should I warn him? What? Warn him, said Victor. What kind of policy would that be? For he stings or strikes in hasty fear when warning has been heard. It is wise to warn an enemy by actions, not by word. After all, said Rusty, he is a grass nibbler. I am a carnivore. How can he hurt me? Precisely, said Victor. He is a grass nibbler. My lord and king is a carnivore. He is food. My lord and king devours food. In spite of all, if the fellow is not likely to work harm through his own power, 
he will egg on another to it. As the saying goes, the weak malicious fool can use a keener tool. It sharpens sword blades, but the whetstone cannot cut. How can that be? said the lion. And Victor answered, Why, you have constantly engaged in battle with unnumbered bull elephants, wild oxen, buffaloes, boars, tigers and leopards, until your body is spotted with scars left by the thrust of claw and tusk. Now this lively, living beside you, is always scattering his excrement far and wide. In it, worms will breed. These worms, finding your body conveniently near, will creep into ready-made crevices and will bore deep. And so you are as good as dead, as the proverb says, with no stranger share your house. Leap the flea, killed creep the louse. How was that? asked Rusty. And Victor told the story of Leap and Creep. End of section 13「Section 14 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Leap and Creep In the palace of a certain king stood an incomparable bed, blessed with every cubiculary virtue. In a corner of its coverlet lived a female louse named Creep, surrounded by a thriving family of sons and daughters, with the sons and daughters of sons and daughters and with more remote descendants, she drank the king's blood as he slept. On this diet, she grew plump and handsome. While she was living there in this manner, a flea named Leap drifted in on the wind and dropped on the bed. This flea felt supreme satisfaction on examining the bed. The wonderful delicacy of its coverlet, its double pillow, its exceptional softness, like that of a broad, gangetic sandbank, its delicious perfume, charmed by the sheer delight of touching it, he hopped this way and that, until fate willed it so, he chanced to meet Creep, who said to him, Where do you come from? This is a dwelling fit for a king. Be gone, and lose no time about it. Madam, said he, you should not say such things, for the Brahmin reverences fire, himself the low castes desire, his wife reveres her husband, dear, but all the world must guests revere. Now I am your guest. I have of late sampled the various blood of Brahmins, warriors, businessmen, and serfs, but found it acid, slimy, quite unwholesome. On the contrary, he who reposes on this bed must have a delightful vital fluid, just like nectar. It must be free from morbidity, since wind, bile, and phlegm are kept in harmony by constant and heedful use of potions prepared by physicians. It must be enriched by viands unctuous, tender, melting in the mouth, viands prepared from the flesh of the choicest creatures of land, water and air, seasoned furthermore with sugar, pomegranate, ginger and pepper. To me, it seems an elixir of life. Therefore, with your kind permission, I plan to taste this sweet and fragrant substance thus combining pleasure and profit. No, said she, for fury mouth stingers like you, it is out of the question. Leave this bed. You know the proverb, the fool who does not know, his own resources, his foe, his duty, time and place, who sets a reckless pace, will by the wayside fall, will reap no fruit at all. Thereupon he fell at her feet, repeating his request, and she agreed, since curtsy was her hobby. When the story of that prince of sharpers, Maldeva, was being repeated to the king, while she lay on a corner of the coverlet, she had heard how Maldeva quoted this verse in answer to the question of a certain damsel. Whoever angry, though he be, has spurned a suppliant enemy, in Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, he has scorned the holy trinity. Recalling this, she agreed but added, however, you must not come to dinner at a wrong place or time. What is the right place and what is the right time? he asked. Being a newcomer, I am not au courant. And she replied, when the king's body is mastered by wine, fatigue or sleep, then 
you may quietly bite him on the feet. This is the right place and the right time. To these conditions, he gave his assent. In spite of this arrangement, the famished bungler, when the king had just dozed off in the early evening, bit him on the back, and the poor king, as if burned by a firebrand, as if stung by a scorpion, as if touched by a torch, bounded to his feet, scratched his back and cried to his servant, Rascal, somebody bit me. You must hunt through this bed until you find that insect. Now, Leap heard the king's command, and in terrified haste, crept into a crevice in the bed. Then the king's servant entered, and following their master's orders, brought a lamp and made a minute inspection. As fate would have it, they came upon Creep, as she crouched in the nap of the fabric, and killed her with her family. And that is why I say, with no stranger, share your house, and the rest of it. And another thing, my lord and king does wrong in neglecting the servants who are his by inheritance. For whoever leaves his friends, strange folk to cherish, like foolish fierce howl, will untimely perish. How was that? asked Rusty. And Victor told the story of the Blue Jackal. End of section 14section 15 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain the blue jackal there was once a jackal named fierce howl who lived in a cave near the suburbs of a city one day he was hunting for food his throat pinched with hunger and wandered into the city after nightfall there the city dogs snapped at his limbs with their sharp pointed teeth and terrified his heart with their dreadful barking, so that he stumbled this way and that in his efforts to escape, and happened into the house of a dyer. There he tumbled into a tremendous indigo vat, and all the dogs went home. Presently, the jackal, further life being predestined, managed to crawl out of the indigo vat, and escaped into the forest. There all the thronging animals in his vicinity caught a glimpse of his body, died with the juice of indigo, and crying out, What is this creature enriched with that unprecedented colour? They fled, their eyes dancing with terror, and spread the report, Oh, oh, here is an exotic creature that has dropped from somewhere. Nobody knows what his conduct might be, or his energy. We are going to Vamus, for the proverb says, Where you do not know, conduct, stock and pluck, it is not wise to trust if you wish for luck. Now fierce howl perceived their dismay and called to them, Come, come, you wild things. Why do you flee in terror at sight of me? For Indra, realizing that the forest creatures have no monarch, anointed me. My name is fierce howl as your king. Rest in the safety within the cage formed by my resistless paws. On hearing this, the lions Tigers, leopards, monkeys, rabbits, gazelles, jackals, and other species of wild life bowed humbly, saying, Master, prescribe to us our duties. Thereupon he appointed the lion prime minister, and the tiger lord of the bedchamber, while the leopard was made custodian of the king's beetle, the elephant doorkeeper, and the monkey the bearer of the royal parasol. But to all the jackals, his own kindred, he administered a cuffing and drove them away. Thus, he enjoyed the kingly glory, while lions and others killed food animals and laid them before him. These he divided and distributed to all after the manner of kings. While time passed in this fashion, he was sitting one day in his court, when he heard the sound made by a pack of jackals howling nearby. At this, his body thrilled. His eyes filled with tears of joy. He leaped to his feet and began to howl in a piercing tone. When the lions and others heard this, they perceived that he was a jackal and stood for a moment shamefaced and downcast. Then they said, Look, we have been deceived by this jackal. Let the fellow be killed. And when he heard this, he endeavoured to flee, but was torn to bits by a tiger and died. And that is why I say, Whoever leaves his friends and the rest of it. Then Rusty asked, 
How am I to recognize that he is treacherous? And what is his fighting technique? And Victor answered, Formerly, he would come into the presence of my lord and king with limbs relaxed. If today he approaches timidly, in obvious readiness to thrust with his horns, then the king may understand that he has treachery in mind. Hereupon, Victor rose and visited lively. To him also, he showed himself sluggish, like one penetrated by discouragement. Therefore, Lively said, My good fellow, are you in spirits? To which he replied, How can a dependent be in spirits? For you know, they see their wealth in others' power, who wait upon a king. They even fear to lose their lives, a doleful song they sing. Again, with birth begin the sorrows which, forever after cling, the never-ending train of woes in service of a king. Five deaths in life, sage Vyasa notes, with well-known epic swing, the poor man, sick man, exile, fool, and servant of a king. His food repels, he dare not say, an independent thing. Though sleepless, he is not awake, who hangs upon a king. The common phrase, a dog's life, has a most persuasive ring. But dogs can do the things they like. A slave obeys a king. He must be chaste, sleep hard, grow thin, and eat a meager dinner. The servant lives as lives the saint, yet is not saint but sinner. He cannot do the things he would. He serves another's mind. He sells his body. How can such a wretch contentment find? According to the lesser distance, a servant uses more persistence in watching for his master's whim and trembling at the sight of him. And this because a fire, a king, a double name for single thing, a burning thing that men can stand, afar but not too close at hand. What flavour has a tidbit, though? It be as good as good, soft, dainty, melting in the mouth, if bought by servitude. To sum it all up, what is my place, my time, my friends? expenditure or dividends and what am i and what my power so must one ponder hour by hour after listening to this lively said perceiving that victor had a hidden purpose in mind tell me my good fellow what you wish to imply and victor answered well you are my friend i cannot help telling you what is to your profit here goes the master rusty is filled with wrath against you and he said today I will kill lively and provide a feast for all who eat meat. Of course I fell into deep dejection on hearing this. Now you must do what the crisis demands. To lively, this report was like the fall of a thunderbolt, and he fell into deep dejection. Yet, as Victor's words were always plausible, he grew more and more troubled, fell into a panic and said, Yes, the proverb is right. Women oft are tricked by scamps, kings with rascals oft agree. Toward the skinflints, money drifts, rain on mountains, falls, and sea. Ah me, what is this that has befallen me? You serve your king most heedfully, of course, who could complain? But enmity as your reward is unexpected pain. And again, if one is angry, giving cause, Remove it, and the wrath will pause. But how may a man propitiate a mind that harbors causeless hate? Who does not fear the scoundrel's art, the causeless hate, the flinty heart? For ever ready venom drips, resistless from his serpent lips. The stupid king swan pecks by night, at starshine in the water bright, believing it a lotus white. Then fearing stars, when shines the sun, avoids the lotus. Every one who dreads a trap will blessings shun. Alas, what wrong have I done, our master Rusty? Comrade, said Victor, kings love to injure without reason, and they seek out the vulnerable spot in an adversary. True, too true, said Lively. There is wisdom in the verse, the serpent Sandal trees defiles, in lotus ponds lurk crocodiles. The slanderer makes virtue vain, 
No blessing lacks attendant pain. No lotus decks the mountain height. From scoundrels issues nothing right. To saints no change of heart is known. Rice never sprouts from barley sown. Nobility's constraints are felt by gracious saints, who bear good deeds in mind, forget the other kind. Yet, after all, the fault is mine, because I made advances to a false friend. As the story goes, harsh talk, untimely action. False friends are worse than vain. The swan in lilies sleeping was by the arrow slain. How was that? asked Victor, and lively told the story of Passion and the Owl. End of section 15Section 16 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Passion and the Owl Within a certain forest was a broad expanse of lake. There lived a king swan named Passion, who spent his days in a great variety of pastimes. One day, death, fatal death, visited him in the person of an owl, and the swan said, This is a lonely wood. Where do you come from? The owl replied, I came because I heard of your virtues. Furthermore, in search of virtue roaming the wide world through, no virtues being greater, I come to you. That I must cling in friendship to you is sure. The impure turns attaining, the Ganges pure. And again, the conch was born that Vishnu's hand has purified, for contact with the righteous lends a noble pride. After this address, the swan gave his assent in the words, My excellent friend, dwell with me as you like by this broad lake in this pleasant wood. So their time was spent in friendly diversions. But one day, the owl said, I am going to my own home, which is called Lotus Grove. If you set any value on me and feel any affection, you must not fail to pay a visit as my guest. With these words, he went home. Now as time passed, the swan reflected, I have grown old living in this spot, and I do not know a single other region. So now I will go to visit my dear friend the owl. There I shall find a brand new recreation ground and new kinds of food, both hard and soft. After these reflections, he went to visit the owl. At first he could not find him in Lotus Grove, and when... After a minute search, he discovered him. There was the poor creature, crouching in an ugly hole, for he was blind in the daytime. But Passion called, My dear fellow, come out. I am your dear friend, the swan. Come to pay you a visit. And the owl replied, I do not stir by day. You and I will meet when the sun has set. So the swan waited a long time, met the owl at night, and after giving the conventional information, about his health being wearied by his journey, he went to sleep on the spot. Now it happened that a large commercial caravan had encamped at that very lake. At dawn, the leader rose and had the signal of departure given by Conch. This, the owl answered with a loud, harsh hoot, then dived into a hole in the river bank. But the swan did not stir. Now the evil omen so disturbed the leader's spirit that he gave orders to a certain archer who could aim by sound. The archer strung his powerful bow, drew an arrow as far as his ear, and killed the swan, who was resting near the owl's nest. And that is why I say, harsh talk, untimely action, and the rest of it. And Lively continued, Why, our master Rusty was all honey at first, but at the last his purpose turns to poison. Ah, yes, he compliments you to your face. His whispered slanders never stop. Avoid a friend like that. He is a poison jug with cream on top. Yes, I have learned by experience the truth of the well-known verse. He lifts his hands to see you standing there. His eyes grow moist. He offers half his chair. He hugs you warmly to his eager breast. In kindly talk and question finds no rest. His skill is wondrous, 
in deceptive tricks. Honey without, within the poison sticks. What play is this? What strange dramatic turns that every villain, like an actor, learns? At first, rogue's friendship glitters bright with service, flattery, delight. Thence in its middle journey, shoot gay flowers of speech that fail to fruit. Its final goal is treason, shame, disgust and slanders that defame. Alas, who made the cursed thing? Its one foul purpose is to sting. And again, they bow abjectly, leap to greet, you with their speech seductive sweet. Pursue and hug you day by day, of deep devotion make display. All praise your virtue, never one finds time to do what should be done. Woe is me! How can I, a creature herbivorous, consort with this lion who devours raw flesh? There is wisdom in the saying, where wealth is very much the same, and similar the family fame, marriage or friendship is secure, but not between the rich and poor. And there is a proverb, the sun already setting shows his final flaming power, and still the honey-thirsty bee explores the lotus flower, forgets that it will prove a trap that shuts at set of sun, ambition thirsting for reward is blind to dangers run. Abandoning the lotus bloom, with all its sweet content, the jasmine's natural perfume and luxury of scent, the water bees seek toilsome food on ichor sipping bent. So men reject the easy good, in rogues all confident. The bees that, too adventurous, a novel honey seek, in springtime ichor glistening on, the elephant monarch's cheek. When tossed by wind from flapping years, remember then what gentle sport in lotus cups is found. Yet, after all, virtues involve corresponding defects. For the fruit tree's branch by very wealth of fruit is bended low. The peacock's feathered pride compels a sluggish gait and slow. The blooded horse that wins his race must like a cow be led. The good in goodness often find an enemy to dread. Where Jumna's waves roll blue with sands of sapphire hue, black serpents have their lair, and who would hunt them there but that a jewel's bright star from each good gleams afar, by virtue rising all, by that same virtue fall. The man of virtue commonly is hateful to the king, while riches to the scamps and fools habitually cling. The ancient chant, by virtue great is man, has run to seed. The world takes rare and little note of any plucky deed. Sad, shame-faced lions fail to rage, their spirit mastered by the cage, and captive elephants browse in pride by driver's goads are scarified. Charms dull the cobra's hopeless woe, lays scholars flat and soldiers low. For time, the mountebank enjoys a juggling bout with chosen toys. The honey-greedy bee, poor fool, deserts the flowering lotus pool where danger is not found to sip the springtime ichor reels that drip from elephants' foreheads, does not fear the flapping of that monstrous ear. So by his nature, greedy man forgets the issue of his plan. Yes, by entering a Bulgarian's sphere of power, I have certainly forfeited my life. As the proverb says, all who live upon their wits, many learned too are mean. Do the wrong as quick as right. Illustration may be seen in the well-known tale that features camel, crow and other creatures. How was that? asked Victor, and lively told the story of Ugly's Trust Abused. End of section 16section 17 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain ugly's trust abused 
In a certain city lived a merchant named Ocean, who loaded a hundred camels with valuable cloth and set out in a certain direction. Now one of his camels, whose name was Ugly, was overburdened and fell limp, with every limb relaxed. Then the merchant divided the pack of cloth, loaded it on other camels, and because he found himself in a wild forest region where delay was impossible, he proceeded, leaving Ugly behind. When the trader was gone, Ugly hobbled about and began to crop the grass. Thus, in a very few days, the poor fellow regained his strength. In that forest lived a lion, whose name was Haughty, who had as hangers-on a leopard, a crow, and a jackal. As they roamed the forest, they encountered the abandoned camel. And the lion said, after observing his fantastic and comical shape, This is an exotic in our forest. Ask him what he is. So the crow informed himself of the facts and said, This is what goes by the name of camel in the world. Thereupon the lion asked him, My good friend, where did you come from? And the camel gave precise details of his separation from the trader, so that the lion experienced compassion and guaranteed his personal security. In this posture of affairs, the lion fought an elephant one day, received a thrust from a tusk, and had to keep his cave. And when five or six days had passed, they all found themselves in urgent distress from the failure of food. So the lion, observing how they drooped, said to them, I am crippled by this wound and cannot supply you with the usual food. You will just have to make an effort on your own account. And they replied, Why should we care to thrive while our lord and king is in this state? Bravo, said the lion. You show the conduct and devotion of good servants. Round up some food animal for me while I am in this condition. Then when they made no answer, he said to them, Come, do not be bashful. Hunt up some creature, even in my present condition. I will convert it into food for you and myself. So the four started to roam the woods. Since they found no food animal, the crow and the jackal conferred together. And the jackal said, Friend crow, why roam about? Here is Ugly, who trusts our king. Let us provide for our sustenance by killing him. A very good suggestion, said the crow. But after all, the master guaranteed his personal security and so cannot kill him. Quite so, said the jackal. I will interview the master and make him think of killing Ugly. Stay right here until I go home and return with the master's answer. With this, he hastened to the master. When he found the lion, he said, Master, we have roamed the entire forest and are now too famished to stir a foot. Besides, the king is on a diet, so if the king commands, one might fortify one's health today by means of ugly's flesh. When the lion had listened to this ruthless proposal, he cried out angrily, Shame upon you, most degraded of sinners. The moment you repeat those words, I will strike you dead. Why? I guaranteed his personal security. How can I kill him with my own paw? You have heard the saying, The wise declare and understand, No gift of cow or food or land. To be among all gifts is grand, As safety granted on demand. Master, replied the jackal, If you kill him after guaranteeing his safety, Then you are indeed blameworthy. If, however, of his own accord, he devotedly offers his own life to his lord and king. Then no blame attaches. So you may kill him on condition that he voluntarily destines himself to slaughter. Otherwise, pray eat one or another of the rest of us. For the king is on a diet, and if food fails, he will experience a change for the worse. In that case, what value have these lives of ours, which will no longer be spent in our master's service? If anything disagreeable happens to our gracious master, then we must follow him into the fire. For the proverb says, Save the chieftain of the clan, whatsoever the pain. Lose him and the clan is lost. Hubless spokes are vain. After listening to this, Haughty said, Very well, do as you will. With this message, the jackal hastened to the others. Well, friends, the master is very low. The life is oozing from the tip of his nose. If he goes, who will be our protector in this forest? 
So since starvation is driving him toward the other world, let us go and voluntarily offer our own bodies. Thus we shall pay the debt we owe our gracious master. And the proverb says, Servants, when disaster comes upon their master, if alive and well, tread the road to hell. So they all went, their eyes brimming with tears, bowed low before Haughty and sat down. On seeing them, Haughty said, My friends, did you catch any creature or see any? And the crow replied, Master, though we roamed everywhere, we still did not catch any creature nor see any. Master, pray eat me and support your life for a day. Thus the master will be replete while I shall rise to heaven. For the saying goes, A servant who in loyal love has yielded up his breath, adorns a lofty seat in heaven, secure from age and death. On hearing this, the jackal said, Your body is small. If he ate you, the master would scarcely prolong his life. Besides, there is a moral objection, for the verse tells us, Crow's flesh and such small leavings are things to be passed by. Why eat an evil somewhat that does not satisfy? You have shown your loyalty and have won a saintly reputation in both worlds. Now make way while I address the master. So the jackal bowed respectfully and said, Master, pray use my body to support your life today, thus conferring on me the best of earth and heaven. For the proverb says, Since servants' lives on masters hang, in forfeit for their pay, the master perpetrates no sin in taking them away. Hearing this, the leopard said, Very praiseworthy indeed, my friend. However, your body is rather small too. Besides, he ought not to eat you, since you belong to the same unguipugnacious family. You know the proverb, the prudent, though with life at stake, avoid forbidden food. Too small at that, from fear to lose, both earth's and heaven's good. Well, you have shown yourself a loyal servant. There is truth in the stanza, that swarms of gentlemen delight. A monarch is not strange, since first and last in times between, their honour does not change. Make way, then, so that I, too, may win the master's grace. Thereupon the leopard bowed low and said, Master, pray prolong your life for a day at the cost of my life. Grant me an everlasting home in heaven and spread my fame afar on earth. Pray show no hesitation, for the proverb says, A servant who by loyal love has demonstrated worth attains a lasting home above and glory on the earth. Hearing this, Poor ugly thought. Well, they used the most elegant phrases, yet the master did not kill a single one of them. So I too will make a speech befitting the occasion. I have no doubt that all three will contradict me. Having come to this conclusion, he said, Very admirable, friend leopard, but you too are unguipugnacious. How then can the master eat you? There is a proverb to fit the case. The mere imagining of wrongs to kinsmen done confirms the loss of earth and heaven, such rogues turn into unclean worms. Make way then, so that I too may address the master. So poor ugly stood in the presence, bowed low and said, Master, these you surely may not eat. Pray prolong your life by means of my life, so that I may win the best of earth and heaven. For the proverb says, No sacrificer and no saint can ever rise as high as do the simple serving folk who for the master die. Hereupon the lion gave the word. The leopard and the jackal tore his body. The crow pecked out his eyes. Poor ugly yielded up the ghost and all the others ravenously devoured him. And that is why I say, all who live upon their wits and the rest of it. After telling the story, Lively continued addressing Victor. My dear fellow, this king, with his shabby advisers, bring no good to his dependents. Better have as king a vulture advised by swans than a swan advised by vultures. For from the vulture advisers, many vices appear in their master, quite sufficient to bring ruin. Of the two, therefore, one should choose the former as king, 
but a king, instigated by evil counsel, is incapable of reflection. You know the saying, your jackal does not reassure, your crow's sharp bill offends. You, therefore, see me up a tree. I do not like your friends. How was that? asked Victor, and lively told the story of The Lion and the Carpenter. End of section 17Section 18 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lion and the Carpenter In a certain city lived a carpenter named Trust God. It was his constant habit to carry his lunch and go with his wife into the forest, where he cut great Anjana logs. Now in that forest lived a lion named Spotless, who had as hangers-on two carnivorous creatures a jackal and a crow. One day, the lion was roaming the wood alone and encountered the carpenter. The carpenter, for his part, on beholding that most alarming lion, whether considering himself already lost or perhaps with the ready wit to perceive that it is safer to face the powerful, advanced to meet the lion, bowed low and said, Come, friend, come. Today you must eat my own dinner which my wife, your brother's wife, has provided. My good fellow, said the lion, being carnivorous, I do not live on rice, but in spite of that, I will have a taste, since I take a fancy to you. What kind of dainty have you got? When the lion had spoken, the carpenter stuffed him with all kinds of dainties, buns, muffins, chewers, and things all flavoured with sugar, butter, grape juice, and spice. And to show his gratitude, the lion guaranteed his safety and granted unhindered passage through the forest. Then the carpenter said, Comrade, you must come here every day, but please come alone. You must not bring anyone else to visit me. In this manner, they spent their days in friendship. And the lion, since every day he received such hospitality, such a variety of goodies, gave up the practice of hunting. Then the jackal and the crow, who lived on others' luck, went hungry, and they implored the lion. Master, they said, where do you go every day? And tell us, why you come back so happy? I don't go anywhere, said he. But when they urged the question with great deference, the lion said, A friend of mine comes into this wood every day. His wife cooks the most delicious things, and I eat them every day in order to show friendly feeling. Then the jackal and the crow said, We too will go there. We'll kill the carpenter and have enough meat and blood to keep us fat for a long time. But the lion heard them and said, Look here, I guaranteed his safety. How can I even imagine playing him such a scurvy trick? But I will get a delicious tidbit from him for you also. To this they agreed. So the three started to find the carpenter. While they were still far off, the carpenter caught a glimpse of the lion and his speedy companions, and he thought, This does not look prosperous to me. So he and his wife made haste to climb a tree. Then the lion came up and said, My good fellow, why did you climb a tree when you saw me? Why, I am your friend, the lion. My name is Spotless. Do not be alarmed. But the carpenter stayed where he was and said, Your jackal does not reassure. Your crow's sharp bill offends. You therefore see me up a tree. I do not like your friends. And that is why I say, that a king with shabby advisers brings no good to his dependents. After telling the story, Lively continued, Somebody must have set Rusty against me. Besides, soft waters, scars alight, the mighty mountainside, and leave it much diminished by those who have the trick. To make a whisper stick, man's gentleness is finished. Under these circumstances, what action is opportune? Indeed, there is nothing left save battle, for the proverb says, By gifts, by self-denial, by sacrificial trial, some slowly win to heaven, to him who yields his life. In glad heroic strife, quick entrance there is given. And again, the slain attains the sky, the victor joyful lives, and heroes are content with their alternatives. And once again, gay maidens, 
smart with gems and gold. The fly flaps, royal toy, throne, horse, and elephant at cash. The white umbrella, joy, and sign of monarchs, shun the coward, are not for mamma's boy. When he heard this, Victor thought, the fellow has sharp horns and plenty of vigour. He might perhaps strike down the master if fate decreed it. That would not do either. And the proverb says, Even with heroes' victory, whimsically may alight. Try three other methods first, only in extremis fight. So I will use my wits to turn his thoughts from fighting. And he said, My dear fellow, this is not a good plan, because he loses fights who fights before. His foreman's power is reckoned. The ocean and the plover fought, and ocean came out second. How was that? asked Lively. And Victor told the story of the plover who fought the ocean. End of section 18In due time, she became pregnant and was ready to lay her eggs. So she said to her husband, Please find a spot where I may lay my eggs. Why, said he, this home of ours, inherited from our ancestors, promises progress. Lay your eggs here. Oh, said she, don't mention this dreadful place. Here is the ocean near at hand. His tide might some day make a long reach and lick away my babies. But the plover answered, Sweetheart, he knows me. He knows Sprawl. Surely the great ocean cannot show such enmity to me. Did you never hear this? What man is rash enough to take? The gleaming crest jewel from a snake? Or stirs the wrath of one so dread? His glance may strike his victim dead. However summer heat distresses, In wild and treeless wildernesses, Who, after all, would seek the shade By some rogue elephant's body made? And again, when morning's chilly breezes blow, with whirling particles of snow, what man with sense of value sure employs for cold the water cure? To visit death what man desires, so wakes the lion's sleeping fires, who tired from slaying elephants lies in a temporary trance. Who dares to visit and defy the death god, dares the fearless cry, I challenge you to single strife, if power be yours. Pray take my life. What son of man with simple wit defies the fire and enters it? The smokeless flame that terrifies, whose tongues by hundreds lick the skies. But even as he spoke, his wife laughed outright, since she knew the full measure of his capacity. And she said, Very fine indeed. There is plenty more where that came from. O oh, king of birds, your heavy boasting startled shock and make of you a laughing stock. One marvels if the rabbit plants a dung pile like the elephants. How can you fail to appreciate your own strength and weakness? There is a saying, to know oneself is hard, to know wise effort, effort vain, but accurate self-critics are, secure in times of strain. This much of effort brings success. I have the power, I can, so think, then act and reap the fruit of your judicious plan. And there is sound sense in this. To take advice from kindly friends, be ever satisfied. The stupid turtle lost his grip upon the stick and died. How was that? asked Sprawl. And Constance told the story of Shell Neck, Slim and Grim. End of section 19 Section 20 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shell Neck, Slim and Grim In a certain lake lived a turtle named Shell Neck. He had as friends two ganders whose names were Slim and Grim. 
Now in the vicissitudes of time, there came a twelve-year drought, which begot ideas of this nature in the two ganders. This lake has gone dry. Let us seek another body of water. However, we must first say farewell to Shell Neck, our dear and long-proved friend. When they did so, the turtle said, Why do you bid me farewell? I am a water-dweller, and here I should perish very quickly from the scant supply of water and from grief at loss of you. Therefore, if you feel any affection for me, please rescue me from the jaws of this death. Besides, as the water dries in this lake, you too suffer nothing beyond a restricted diet, while to me it means immediate death. Consider which is more serious, loss of food or loss of life. But they replied, We are unable to take you with us, since you are a water creature without wings. Yet the turtle continued, There is a possible device. Bring a stick of wood. This they did, whereupon the turtle gripped the middle of the stick between his teeth and said, Now, take firm hold with your bills, one on each side. Fly up and travel with even flight through the sky until we discover another desirable body of water. But they objected. There is a hitch in this fine plan. If you happen to indulge in the smallest conversation, then you will lose your hold on the stick, will fall from a great height, and will be dashed to bits. Oh, said the turtle, from this moment I take a vow of silence to last as long as we are in heaven. So they carried out the plan. But while the two ganders were painfully carrying the turtle over a neighboring city, the people below noticed the spectacle, and there arose a confused buzz of talk as they asked, What is this cart-like object that two birds are carrying through the atmosphere? Hearing this, the doomed turtle was heedless enough to ask, What are these people chattering about? The moment he spoke, the poor simpleton lost his grip and fell to the ground and persons who wanted meat cut him to bits in a moment with sharp knives. And that is why I say to take advice from kindly friends and the rest of it. And Constance continued, Fourth thought and ready with thrive. Fatalist can't keep alive. How was that? asked Sprawl. And she told the story of Fourth thought, ready wit, and fatalist. End of section 20「Section 21 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forethought, ready wit, and fatalist. In a great lake lived three full-grown fishes, whose names were Forethought, ready wit, and fatalist. Now one day, the fish named Forethought overheard passers-by on the bank and fishermen saying, there are plenty of fish in this pond. Tomorrow, we go fishing. On hearing this, Forethought reflected, This looks bad. Tomorrow, or the day after, they will be sure to come here. I will take Readywit and Fatalist and move to another lake whose waters are not troubled. So he called them and put the question. Thereupon Readywit said, I have lived long in this lake and cannot move in such a hurry. If fishermen come here, then I will protect myself by some means devised for the occasion. But poor doomed fatalist said, There are sizable lakes elsewhere. Who knows whether they will come here or not? One should not abandon the lake of his birth merely because of such small gossip. And the proverb says, Since scam and sneak and snake so often undertake a plan that does not thrive, the world wags on alive. Therefore, I am determined not to go. And when Forthought realized that their minds were made up, he went to another body of water. On the next day, when he had gone, the fishermen with their boys beset the inner pool, cast a net and caught all the fish without exception. Under these circumstances, Ready Wit, while still in the water, played dead. And since they thought, this big fellow died without help, they drew him from the net and laid him on the bank, from which he wriggled back to safety in the water. 
but fatalist, stuck his nose into the meshes of the net, struggling until they pounded him repeatedly with clubs and so killed him. And that is why I say, forethought and ready wit thrive. Fatalist can't keep alive. My dear, said Plover, why do you think me like fatalist? Horses, elephants and iron, water, woman, man, sticks and stones and clothes are built on a different plan. Feel no anxiety. Who can bring humiliation upon you while my arms protect you? So Constant laid her eggs, but Ocean, who had listened to the previous conversation, thought, Well, well, there is sense in the saying. Of self-conceit all creatures show an adequate supply. The plover lies with claws upstretched to prop the falling sky. I will just put his power to the test. So the next day, when the two plovers had gone foraging, he made a long reach with his wave hands and eagerly seized the eggs. Then when the hen plover returned and found the nursery empty, she said to her husband, See what has happened to poor me! The ocean seized my eggs today. I told you more than once that we should move, but you were stupid as fatalist and would not go. Now I am sad at the loss of my children that I have decided to burn myself. My dear, said the plover, wait until you witness my power, until I dry up that rascally ocean with my bill. But she replied, My dear husband, how can you fight the ocean? Furthermore, gay simpletons who fight, not estimating right, the force power and their own, like moths in flame atone. My dear, said the plover, you should not say such things. The sun's new risen beams upon the mountains fall, where glory is cognate, age matters not at all. With this bill I shall dry up the water to the last drop and turn the sea into dry land. Darling, said his wife. With a bill that holds one drop, how will you dry up the ocean, into which pour without ceasing the Ganges and the Indus, bearing the water of nine times nine hundred tributary streams? Why talk nonsense? But the plover said, Success is rooted in the will, and I possess an iron-strong bill. Long days and nights before me lie. Why should not ocean's flood go dry? The highest glory to attain Asks enterprise and mainly strain. The sun must first to Libra climb before he routes the cloudy time. Well, said the wife, if you feel that you must make war on the ocean, at least call other birds to your aid before you begin. For the proverb says, A host where each is weak brings victory to pass. The elephant is bound by woven ropes of grass. And again, Woodpecker and sparrow, with froggy and gnat, attacking en masse, laid the elephant flat. How was that? asked Sprawl, and Constant told the story of the duel between elephant and sparrow. End of section 21
add sadness to the sad, so make it double. And yet again, since kinsmen's sticky tears clog the departed, bury them decently, tearless, whole-hearted. That is good doctrine, said the hen sparrow. But what of it? This elephant, curse his spring fever, killed my babies. So if you are my friend, think of some plan to kill this big elephant. If that were done, I should feel less grief at the death of my children. You know the saying, while one brings comfort in distress, another jeers at pain. By paying both as they deserve, a man is born again. Madam, said the woodpecker, your remark is very true. For the proverb says, A friend in need is a friend indeed, although of different caste. The whole world is your eager friend, so long as riches last. And again, A friend in need is a friend indeed. Fathers indeed are those who feed. True comrades they, and wives indeed, whence trust and sweet content proceed. Now see what my wit can devise. But you must know that I too have a friend, a gnat called Lootbuzz. I will return with her, so that this villainous beast of an elephant may be killed. So he went with the hen sparrow, found the gnat and said, Dear madam, this is my friend, the hen sparrow. She is mourning because a villainous elephant smashed her eggs, so you must lend your assistance while I work out a plan for killing him. My good friend, said the gnat, there is only one possible answer, but I also have a very intimate friend, a frog called Cloud Messenger. Let us do the right thing by calling him into consultation. For the proverb says, A wise companion find, shrewd, learned, righteous kind, for plans by him designed are never undermined. So all three went together and told Cloud Messenger the entire story. And the frog said, How feeble a thing is that wretched elephant when pitted against a great throng enraged. Nat, you must go and buzz in his fevered ear so that he may shut his eyes in delight at hearing your music. Then the woodpecker's bill will peck out his eyes. After that, I will sit on the edge of a pit and croak and he... Being thirsty will hear me and will approach expecting to find a body of water. When he comes to the pit, he will fall in and perish. When they carried out the plan, the fevered elephant shut his eyes in delight at the song of the gnat, was blinded by the woodpecker, wandered thirst-smitten at noonday, followed the croak of a frog, came to a great pit, fell in and died. And that is why I say woodpecker and sparrow and the rest of it. Very well, said the plover. I will assemble my friends and dry up the ocean. With this in mind, he summoned all the birds and related his grief at the rape of his chicks. And they started to beat the ocean with their wings as a means of bringing relief to his sorrow. But one bird said, Our desires will not be accomplished in this manner. Let us rather fill up the ocean with clods and dust. So they all brought what clods and dust they could carry in the hollow of their bills and started to fill up the ocean. Then another bird said, It is plain that we are not equal to a contest with mighty ocean. So I will tell you what is now timely. There is an old gander who lives beside a banyan tree who will give us sound and practical advice. Let us go and ask him, for there is a saying, Take old folks counsel, those are old who have experience. The captive wild goose flock was freed by one old gander's sense. How was that? asked the birds. And the speaker told the story of the shrewd old gander. End of section 22section 23 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain the shrewd old gander in a part of a forest was a fig tree with massive branches in it lived a flock of wild geese at the root of this tree appeared a creeping vine of the species called koshambi thereupon the old gander said this vine that is climbing our fig tree bodes ill to us by means of it, someone might perhaps climb up here some day and kill us. Take it away, while it is still slender and readily cut. But the geese despised his counsel and did not cut the vine, so that in course of time it wound its way up the tree. 
Now, one day, when the geese were out foraging, a hunter climbed the fig tree by following the spiral vine, laid a snare among the nests and went home. When the geese, after food and recreation, returned at nightfall, they were caught to the last one. Whereupon the old gander said, Well, the disaster has taken place. You are caught, having brought it on yourselves by not heeding my advice. We are all lost now. Then the geese said to him, Sir, the thing having come to pass, what ought we to do now? And the old fellow replied, If you will take my advice, play dead when that hateful hunter comes. And when the hunter, inferring that we are dead, throws the last one to the ground, we then must all rise simultaneously, flying over his head. At early dawn, the hunter arrived, and when he looked them over, everyone seemed as good as dead. He therefore freed them from the snare with perfect assurance, and threw them all to the ground, one after the other. But when they saw him preparing to descend, they all followed the shrewd plan of the old gander, and flew up simultaneously. And that is why I say, Take old folks' counsel and the rest of it. When the story had been told, all the birds visited the old gander and related their grief at the rape of the chicks. Then the old gander said, The king of us all is Garuda. Therefore, the timely course of action is this. You must all stir the feelings of Garuda by a chorus of wailing lamentation. In consequence, he will remove our sorrow. With this, they sought Garuda. Now Garuda had just been summoned by blessed Vishnu to take part in an impending battle between gods and demons. At just this moment, the birds reported to their master, the king of the birds, what sorrow in the separation of loved ones had been wrought by the ocean when he seized the chicks. O oh, bird divine, they said, while you gleam in royal radiance, we must live on what little is won by the labor of our bills. Because of our weak necessity of eating, the ocean has, in overbearing manner, carried away our young. Now there is a saying, The poor are in peculiar need of being secret when they feed. The lion killed the ram who could not check his appetite for food. How was that? asked Garuda. And an old bird told the story of the lion and the ram. End of section 23「At this unprecedented sight, since the wolves so bristled in every direction as to conceal the body, the lion's heart was troubled and invaded by fear. Surely he is more powerful than I am, thought he. That is why he wanders here so fearlessly, and the lion edged away. But on a later day, the lion saw the same ram cropping grass on the forest floor, and he thought, What? The fellow nibbles grass! His strength must be in relation to his diet. So he made a quick spring and killed the ram. And that is why I say, the poor are in peculiar need of being secret when they feed, and the rest of it. While they were thus conferring, Vishnu's messenger returned and said, Garuda, Lord Vishnu sends orders that you repair at once to the celestial city. On hearing this, Garuda proudly said to him, Messenger, what will the master do with so poor a servant as I am? Garuda, said the messenger, it may be that the Blessed One has spoken to you harshly, but why should you display pride toward the Blessed One? And Garuda replied, The ocean, the resting place of the Blessed One, has stolen the eggs of the plover, who is my servant. If I do not chastise him, then I am not the servant of the Blessed One. Make this report to the master. Now when Vishnu learned from the messenger's lips that Garuda was feigning anger, he thought, Ah, he is dreadfully angry. I will therefore go in person, will address him, and bring him back with all honour. For the proverb says, 
Shame no servant showing worth, loyalty and noble birth. Pet him ever like a son, if you wish your business done. And again, masters fully satisfied pay by gratifying pride. Servants for such honours pay gladly throw their lives away. Having reached this conclusion, he hastened to Garuda, who, beholding his master a visitor in his own house, modestly gazed on the ground, bowed low and said, O blessed one, the ocean, made insolent by his service as your resting place, has stolen, behold, has stolen the eggs of my servant, and thus brought shame upon me. From reverence for the blessed one, I have delayed, but if nothing is done, I myself will this day reduce him to dry land. For the proverb says, A loyal servant dies, but shrinks from doing deeds of such a kind as bring contempt from common men and lure him in his master's mind. To this, the blessed one replied, O son of Vinta, your speech is justified, because for servants' crimes the master should be made to suffer, say the good, so long as he does not erase from service, cruel folk and base. Come then, so that we may recover the eggs from ocean, may satisfy the plover, and then proceed to the celestial city on the god's business. To this Garuda agreed, and the Blessed One reproached the ocean, then fitted the fire arrow to his bow and said, Villain, give the plover his eggs, else I will reduce you to dry land. On hearing this, the ocean while all his train shook with fright, tremblingly took the eggs and restored them to the plover, as the Blessed One directed. And that is why I say, he loses fights, who fights before, his foreman's power is reckoned, and the rest of it. And when Lively understood the matter, he asked Victor, Tell me, comrade, what is his fighting technique? And Victor answered, Formerly he would lie carelessly on a slab of stone, with limbs relaxed. If today his tail is drawn in at the very first, if his four paws are bunched and his ears pricked up, and if he is watching you while you are still far off, then you may understand that he has treachery in mind. Hereupon Victor visited Cheek, who asked, What have you accomplished? And he replied, I have already set them at odds with each other. Have you really done it? said Cheek. And Victor answered, The outcome will show you. Indeed, said Cheek. It is not surprising, for the proverb says, A well-devised estranging scheme, the firmest prudence shocks. As constant floods of water split, the mountains close-piled rocks. Then Victor continued, Having wrought an estrangement, a man should not fail to seek his own advantage in it. As the verse puts it, the man who studies every book and understands, yet does not look, to his advantage, learns in vain, his books are merely mental strain. But in the final analysis, said Cheek, there is no such thing as personal advantage, for since worms and filth and ashes cling, the body is a loathsome thing. What statecraft therefore may there be in hurting it vicariously? Ah! replied Victor. You have no comprehension of the devious ways of statemanship, the basic support of the profession of counsellor. On this point there is a verse, let your speech like sugar be, steal your heart remorselessly, never draw a doubtful breath, pay for suffered wrongs with death. And another thing, this lively, even when killed, will provide us with nourishment, for you know, the wise who wrongs another, pursuing selfish good, should keep his plans a secret, as Smart did in the wood. How was that? asked Cheek, and Victor told the story of Smart the Jackal. End of section 24。Section 25 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma. Translated by Arthur William Ryder Smart the Jackal In a part of a forest lived a lion named Thunderfang, in company with three counsellors, a wolf, a jackal, and a camel. 
whose names were Meat Face, Smart, and Spike Ear. One day, he fought with a furious elephant, whose sharp pointed tusk so tore his body that he withdrew from the world. Then, suffering from a seven day fast, his body lean with hunger, he said to his famished advisers, Round up some creature in the forest, so that even in my present condition, I may provide needed nourishment for you. The moment he issued his orders, they roamed the wood, but found nothing. Thereupon, Smart reflected. If Spike Fear here were killed, then we should all be nourished for a few days. However, the master is kept from killing him by friendly feeling. In spite of that, my wit will put the master in a frame of mind to kill him. For indeed, all understanding may be won, all things may be slain, and all be done. If mortals have sufficient wit, for me, I make good use of it. After these reflections, he said to Spikeyear, Friend Spikeyear, the master lacks wholesome food and is starving. If the master goes, our death is also a certain thing. So I have a suggestion for your benefit and the master's. Please pay attention. My good fellow, said Spikeyear, make haste to inform me so that I may unhesitatingly do as you say. Besides, one earns credit for a hundred good deeds by serving his master. And Smart said, My good fellow, give your own body at hundred percent interest, so that you may receive a double body, and the master may prolong his life. On hearing this proposal, Spikeyear said, If that is possible, my friend, my body shall be so devoted. Tell the master that this thing should be done. I stipulate only that the death god be requested to guarantee the bargain. Having made their decision, they all went to visit the lion, and Smart said, O oh, king, we did not find a thing today, and the blessed sun is already near his setting. On hearing this, the lion fell into deep despondency. Then Smart continued, O oh, king, our friend Spike here makes this proposal. If you call upon the death god to guarantee the bargain, and if you render it back with 100% of interest, then I will give my body. My good fellow, answered the lion, yours is a beautiful act. Let it be as you say. On the basis of this pact, Spike here was struck down by the lion's paw. His body was torn by the wolf and the jackal, and he died. Then Smart reflected, how can I get him all to myself to eat? With this thought in mind, he noticed that the lion's body was smeared with blood, and he said, Master, you must go to the river to bathe and worship the gods, while I stay here with Meat Face to guard the food supply. On hearing this, the lion went to the river. When the lion was gone, Smart said to Meat Face, Friend Meat Face, you are starving. You might eat some of this camel before the old master returns. I will make your apologies to the master. So Meat Face took the hint, but had only taken a taste when Smart replied, Drop it, Meat Face, the master is coming. Presently, the lion returned, saw that the camel was minus a heart, and wrathfully roared, Look here, who turned this camel into leavings? I wish to kill him too. Then Meat Face peered into Smart's visage as much as to say, Come now, say something so that he may calm down. But Smart laughed and said, Come, come, you ate the camel's heart all by yourself. Why do you look at me? And Meat Face, hearing this, fled for his life, making for another country. But when the lion had pursued him a short distance, he turned back thinking, He too is angry pugnacious. I must not kill him. At this moment, as fate would have it, there came that way a great camel caravan, heavily laden, making a tremendous jingling with the bells tied to the camel's necks. And when the lion heard the jingle of the bells, loud even in the distance, he said to the jackal, My good fellow, find out what this horrible noise may be. On receiving this commission, Smart advanced a little in the forest, then darted back and cried in great excitement, Run, master! Run if you can run! My good fellow, said the lion, Why terrify me so? Tell me what it is. And Smart cried, Master! The death god is coming, and he is in a rage against you, because you brought untimely death upon his camel, and had him guarantee the bargain. 
He intends to make you pay a thousandfold for his camel. He has immense pride in his camels. He also plans to make inquiries about the father and grandfathers of that one. He is coming. He is near at hand. When the lion heard this, he too abandoned the dead camel and scampered for dear life, whereupon Smart ate the camel bit by bit, so that the meat lasted a long time. And that is why I say, the wise who wrongs another, pursuing selfish good, and the rest of it. Now when Victor was gone, Lively reflected, What am I to do? Suppose I go elsewhere, then some other merciless creature will kill me, for this is a wild wood. Indeed, when the master is furious, it is not possible even to depart. For the proverb says, Impunity comes not by fleeing far away. The long arms of the shrewd make careless sinners pay. My best course is to approach the lion. He might regard me as a suppliant, might even spare my life. Having thus set his mind in order, he started very slowly with troubled spirit, and when he perceived the lion in the posture foretold by Victor, he sank down at some little distance thinking, Ah, the unfathomable character of kings, as the proverb says, Tis a house with serpents crawling, Wood with beasts of prey appalling, Lotus pond where blossoms smile, O the lurking crocodile, Spot that sneaking rogues deface, With repeated slanders base, Timid servant never learns, With a kingly purpose turns. Rusty, for his part, Perceiving the bull in the attitude Predicted by Victor, made a sudden spring at him, and lively, though his body was torn by sharp claws as formidable as thunderbolts, also scored the lion's belly with his horns, contrived to break away from him, and stood in fighting posture, ready to gore again. At this point, Cheek perceived that both of them, ready as dark trees in blossom, were intent on killing each other, and he said reproachfully to Victor, You thunderhead, in setting these two at enmity, you have done a wicked deed. You have brought trouble and confusion into this entire forest, thus proving your ignorance of the true nature of statecraft. For the saying runs, Those are counsellors indeed, wise in statecraft, who succeed in composing reckless strife that unhindered threatens life. Those on petty purpose bent, keen to visit punishment, quick in wrong and folly, bring risk to kingdom and to king. Ah, poor fool! Men of true discernment first try conciliation, for the victories of peace suffer no frustration. Ah, poor simpleton! You seek the post of counsellor and are ignorant of the very name of conciliation. Your ambition is vain, since you love harsh measures. As the proverb puts it, Lord Brahma bids the statesman try conciliation first. Postpone or shun, it can be done. Harsh deeds of all deeds worst. Tis neither sun nor flashing gem, nor fiery spark. Tis peace from bitter foemen's hearts that routs the dark. And again, try peaceful means, not harsh to make your quarrel flit. Take sugar, not cucumber, for a bilious fit. And once again, the doors that wit unlocks are three. Peace, shrewd intrigue and bribery. The fourth device that brings success in struggle is plain manliness. Tis womanish to doubt, to show, small strength, abundant sense, for power is merely bestial if, without intelligence. Snake, lion, elephant and fire, with water, wind and sun, have power. From undirected power is little profit won. Now if it was overweening pride in being the son of a counsellor, that has led you to outrage decency. The result will be merely your own ruin. As the proverb says, What is learning? Who's attaining? Sees no passion wane. No reigning. Love and self-control. Does not make the mind a menial. Finds in virtue no congenial. Path and final goal. Who's attaining is but straining. For a name. And never gaining. Fame or peace of soul. Now on the treatises on the subject, statesmanship is subsumed under five heads. To wit, proper inception, resources human and material, determination of place and time, countermeasures for mischance and successful accomplishment, 
At the present moment, the master finds himself in serious peril. So if you have any such capacity, devise countermeasures for his mischance. For the wisdom of a counsellor finds its test in the patching of friendship. Ah, you fool! That you cannot do, because you have a perverted mind. As the saying goes, no scamp can further others' work, but can deprave it. The mole uproots the mulberry, but cannot save it. After all, the fault is not yours, but rather the master's, who trusts your words. Dull-witted as you are, and the proverb says, educating sluggish wit kills no pride but fosters it. In the sunlight others find, aid no vision, owls go blind. Education thrusts aside man's fatuity and pride. If it foster them, who can cure the educated man? Remedies are useless when heaven's nectar poisons men. And Cheek, beholding his master in pitiful plight, sank into deep dejection. Dreadful, he cried. Dreadful is the penalty the master pays for taking evil counsel. Indeed, there is wisdom in the verse. Monarchs who adopt a plan from the mean and vicious man who refuse to tread the way that the prudent counsel they enter misadventure's cage where the adversaries rage thence deliverance's gate crowns and issue rugged straight fool fool all the world seeks the service of a master whose retinue is righteous how then can such an evil counsellor as you who like a beast understand nothing but destruction how can such a one enrich the master with righteous companions? For the proverb says, Monarchs ill-advised repel, even though they purpose well. Sweet and placid waters smile, but beware the crocodile. Yet you, I suppose seeking your own advantage, desire to have the king quite solitary. Ah, fool, are you ignorant of the verse? Kings shine as social beings, not as solitaries. Whoever wish them lonely are their adversaries. And again, draw benefit from comments harsh, no poison this. In flattery see treason, not true nectar's bliss. And if you are grieved at seeing others happy and prosperous, that too is wicked. It is wrong to proceed thus, when friends have fulfilled their nature. For those who seek through treason friends, seek through humbug righteous ends, Property by wronging neighbours, learning's wealth by easy labours, woman's love by cruel pride, these are fools, self-stultified. Likewise, the happiness of subjects makes the monarch gay and brave. Nay, what would the dancing see, with no gem flashing wave? Furthermore, for one who has enjoyed the master's favour, modesty is peculiarly proper, as the verse puts it. According to his favourite state, a servant's modest, humble gait is notably appropriate. Your character, however, is marked by levity, and the proverb says, The great are firm, though battered as before. Great oceans is not fouled by caving shore. For petty cause the fickle change and pass, the gentlest breezes ruffle pliant grass. When all is said, it is the master's fault. For in pursuit of virtue, money and love, he recklessly takes counsel with one like you, one who lives by the mere pretense of administrative competence, in total ignorance of the six expedients and the four devices for attaining success. Yes, there is wisdom in this. If kings are satisfied with servants at their side, who ply a wheedling tongue, whose bows are never strung, then kingly glory goes embracing manlier foes. Indeed, there is much sense in the story, which is summed up in the familiar verse. The counsellor, whose name was strong, attained his dearest heart's desire. He won the favour of his king. He burned the naked monk with fire. How was that? asked Victor, and Cheek told the story of the monk who left his body behind. End of section 25Section 26 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The monk who left his body behind. In the Koshala country is a city called Unassailable. In it ruled a king named Fine Chariot, over whose footstool rippled rays of light from the diadems of uncounted vassal princes. One day, a forest ranger came with this report. Master, all the forest kings have become turbulent, and in their minds is the forest chief named Vindhyaka. It is the king's affair to teach him modest manners. On hearing this report, the king summoned Counselor Strong and dispatched him with orders to chastise the forest chieftains. Now in the absence of the counsellor, a naked monk arrived in the city at the end of the hot season. He was master of the astronomical specialties, such as problems and etymologies, rising of the zodiacal signs, augury, ecliptic intersection, and the decanate, also stellar mansions divided into nine parts, twelve parts, thirty parts, the shadow of the Norman, eclipses, and numerous other mysteries. With these, the fellow in a few days won the entire population, as if he had bought and paid for them. Finally, as the matter went from mouth to mouth, the king heard a report of its character, and had the curiosity to summon the monk to his palace. There he offered him a seat and asked, Is it true, professor, as they say, that you read the thoughts of others? That will be demonstrated in the sequel, replied the monk and by discourses adapted to the occasion, he brought the poor king to the extreme pitch of curiosity. One day, he failed to appear at the regular hour, but the following day, on entering the palace, he announced, O king, I bring you the best of good tidings. At dawn today, I flung this body aside within my cell, assumed a body fit for the world of the gods, and inspired with the knowledge that all the immortals thought of me with longing, I went to heaven and have just returned. While there, I was requested by the gods to inquire in their name after the king's welfare. When he heard this, the king said, his extreme curiosity begetting a feeling of amazement. What, professor? You go to heaven? O oh, mighty king, replied the fellow. I go to heaven every day. This the king believed. Poor dullard, so that he grew negligent of all royal business and all duties towards the ladies, concentrating his attention on the monk. While matters were in this state, Strong entered the king's presence, after settling all disturbances in the forest domain. He found the master wholly indifferent to every one of his counsellors, withdrawn in private conference with that naked monk, discussing what seemed to be some miraculous occurrence, his lotus face a blossom. And on learning the facts, Strong bowed low and said, Victory, O king! May the gods give you wit, thereupon the king inquired, concerning the counsellor's health, and said, Sir, do you know this professor? To which the counsellor replied, How could there be ignorance of one who is lord and creator of a whole school of professors? Moreover, I have heard that this professor goes to heaven. Is it a fact? Everything that you have heard, answered the king, is beyond the shadow of doubt. Thereupon the monk said, if this counsellor feels any curiosity, he may see for himself. With this, he entered his cell, barred the door from within, and waited there. After the lapse of a mere moment, the counsellor spoke. O oh, king, he said, how soon will he return? And the king replied, why this impatience? You must know that he leaves his lifeless body within this cell and returns with another, a heavenly body. If this is indeed the case, said Strong, then bring a great quantity of firewood, so that I may set fire to this cell. For what purpose? asked the king. And the counsellor continued, So that, when this lifeless body has been burned, the gentleman may stand before the king in that other body, which visits heaven. In this connection, I will tell you the story of the girl who married a snake. End of section 26「Section 27 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Girl Who Married a Snake In Palace City lived a Brahmin called Godly, whose childless wife wept bitterly when she saw the neighbor's youngsters. But one day, the Brahmin said, Forget your sorrow, mother dear. 
C. When I was offering the sacrifice for birth of children, an invisible being said to me in the clearest words, Brahman, you shall have a son, surpassing all mankind in beauty, character and charm. When she heard this, the wife felt her heart swell with supreme delight. I only hope his promises come true, she said. Presently, she conceived and in course of time gave birth to a snake. When she saw him, she paid no attention to her companions, who all advised her to throw him away. Instead, she took him and bathed him, laid him with motherly tenderness in a large clean box, and pampered him with milk, fresh butter, and other good things, so that before many days had passed, he grew to maturity. But one day, the Brahmin's wife was watching the marriage festival of a neighbor's son, and the tears streamed down her face as she said to her husband, I know that you despise me because you do nothing about a marriage festival for my boy. My good wife, answered he, am I to go to the depths of the underworld and beseech Vasuki, the serpent king? Who else, you foolish woman, would give his own daughter to this snake? But when he had spoken, he was disturbed at seeing the utter woe in his wife's countenance. He therefore packed provisions for a long journey and undertook foreign travel from love of his wife. In the course of some months, he arrived at a spot called Katkuta City in a distant land. There in the house of a kinsman, whom he could visit with pleasure since each respected the other's character, he was hospitably received, was given a bath, food and the like, and there he spent the night. Now at dawn, when he paid his respects to his Brahmin host and made ready to depart, the other asked him, what was your purpose in coming hither, and where will your errand lead you? To this he replied, I have come in search of a fit wife for my son. In that case, said his host, I have a very beautiful daughter, and my own person is yours to command. Pray take her for your son. So the Brahmin took the girl with her attendants and returned to his own place. But when the people of the country beheld her incomparable opulence of beauty, her supreme loveliness and superhuman graces, their eyes popped out with pleasure, and they said to her attendants, How can right-thinking persons bestow such a pearl of a girl upon a snake? On hearing this, all her elderly relatives, without exception, were troubled at heart, and they said, Let her be taken from this imprudent creature. But the girl said, No more of this mockery. Remember the text, Do once, once only, these three things. Once spoken stands the word of kings. The speech of saints has no miscarriage. A maid is given once in marriage. And again, all fated happenings derived from any former state must changeless stand. The very gods endured poor Blossom's fate. Whereupon they all asked in chorus, Who was this Blossom person? And the girl told the story of Poor Blossom. End of section 27section 28 of the panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain poor blossom god indra once had a parrot named blossom he enjoyed supreme beauty loveliness and various graces while his intelligence was not blunted by his extensive scientific attainments one day he was resting on the palm of great indra's hand his body thrilling with delight at that contact and was reciting a variety of authoritative formulas when he caught sight of yama lord of death who had come to pay his respects at the time appointed seeing the god the parrot edged away and all the thronging immortals asked him why did you move away sir upon beholding that personage but said the parrot he brings harm to all living creatures why not move away from him upon hearing this they all desired to calm his fears so said to yama as a favour to us, you must please not kill this parrot. And Yama replied, I do not know about that. It is time who determines these matters. They therefore took Blossom with them, paid a visit to Time, and made the same request, to which Time replied, It is Death who is posted in these affairs. Pray speak to him. But when they did so, the parrot died at the mere sight of Death, and they were all distressed at seeing the occurrence, so that they said to Yama, what does this mean? And Yama said, It was simply fated. 
that he should die at the mere sight of death. With this reply, they went back to heaven. And that is why I say, all fated happenings, and the rest of it. Furthermore, I do not wish my father reproached for double dealing on the part of his daughter. When she had said this, she married the snake with the permission of her companions, and at once began devoted attendance upon him by offering milk to drink and performing other services. One night the serpent issued from the generous chest which had been set for him in her chamber and entered her bed. Who is this? she cried. He has the form of a man. And thinking him a strange man, she started up, trembling in every limb, unlocked the door, and was about to dart away when she heard him say, Stay, my dear wife, I am your husband. Then, in order to convince her, he re-entered the body which he had left behind in the chest, issued from it again, and came to her. When she beheld him flashing with lofty diadem, with earrings, bracelets, armbands, and rings, she fell at his feet, and then they sank into a glad embrace. Now his father, the Brahmin, rose betimes and discovered how matters stood. He therefore seized the serpent's skin that lay in the chest and consumed it with fire, for he thought, I do not want him to enter that again. And in the morning, he and his wife, with the greatest possible joy, introduced to everybody as their own an extraordinarily handsome son, quite wrapped up in his love affair. After Strong had related this parallel case to the king, he set fire to the cell that contained the naked monk. And that is why I say, the counsellor whose name was Strong, and the rest of it. Poor fool! Such men are true counsellors, not creatures like you, who make a living by a mere pretense of administrative competence, though quite ignorant of the ways of statecraft. Your evil conduct demonstrates an inherited lack of executive capacity. Surely your father before you was the same kind of person. For the character of sons, the father's heir reflects, who from a screw pine tree an emblic fruit expects, while in men of learning and native dignity, an inner weakness is not detected, even with the lapse of time. It remains hidden, unless of their own accord they cast dignity aside and display what is vulnerable in their minds. For did not the silly peacock wheel in giddy dance at thunder's peal, what peering effort could reveal his nakedness? Since then you are a villain, good advice is thrown away upon you. As the saying goes, no knife prevails against a stone, nor bends the unbending tree, no good advice from needle face, helped in docility. How was that? asked Victor, and Cheek told the story of The Unteachable Monkey. End of section 28Section 29 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Unteachable Monkey In a part of a forest was a troop of monkeys who found a firefly one winter evening when they were dreadfully depressed. On examining the insect, they believed it to be fire, so lifted it with care covered it with dry grass and leaves, thrust forward their arms, sides, stomachs and chests, scratched themselves, and enjoyed imagining that they were warm. One of the arboreal creatures in particular, being especially chilly, blew repeatedly and with concentrated attention on the firefly. Thereupon a bird named Needleface, driven by hostile fate to her own destruction, flew down from her tree and said to the monkey, My dear sir, do not put yourself to unnecessary trouble. This is not fire, this is a firefly. He, however, did not heed her warning, but blew again, nor did he stop when she tried more than once to check him. To cut a long story short, when she vexed him by coming close and shouting at his ear, he seized her and dashed her on a rock, crushing face, eyes, head and neck, so that she died. And that is why I say, no knife prevails against a stone, and the rest of it. For after all, educating minds unfit cannot rescue sluggish wit, just as house lamps wasted are set within a covered jar. Plainly, you are what is known as worse born. The technical explanation runs, sons of four divergent kinds are discerned by well-trained minds. 
born and like born, better born. Lastly, worst born has their scorn. Born the mother's image gives, like born, like the father lives. Better born, more nobly acts, worse born, morally subtracts. Ah, there is wisdom in the saying. By whom far-piercing wisdom or great wealth or power is won to lift the family, in him a mother has a son. Again, a merely striking beauty is not so hard to find. A rarer gem is wisdom, far-reaching power of mind. Yes, there is sense in the story. Right mind was one, and wrong mind two. I know the tale by heart. The sun in smoke made father choke by being super smart. How was that? asked Victor, and Cheek told the story of right mind and wrong mind. End of section 29「Section 30 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Right Mind and Wrong Mind In a certain city lived two friends, sons of merchants, and their names were Right Mind and Wrong Mind. These two travelled to another country far away in order to earn money. There, the one named Right Mind, as a consequence of favouring fortune, found a pot containing a thousand dinars, which had been hidden long before by a holy man. He debated the matter with wrong mind, and they decided to go home, since their object was attained. So they returned together. When they drew near their native city, right mind said, My good friend, a half of this falls to your share. Pray take it, so that now that we are at home, we may cut a brilliant figure before our friends, and those less friendly. But wrong mind, with a sneaking thought of his own advantage, said to the other, My good friend, so long as we do hold this treasure in common, so long will our virtuous friendship suffer no interruption. Let us each take a hundred dinars and go to our homes after burying the remainder. The decrease or increase of this treasure will serve as a test of our virtue. Now right mind, in the nobility of his nature, did not comprehend the hidden duplicity of his friend and agreed to the proposal. Each then took a certain sum of money. They carefully hid the residue in the ground and made their entrance into the city. Before long, Wrong Mind exhausted his preliminary portion because he practiced the vice of unwise expenditure and because his predetermined fate offered vulnerable points. He therefore made a second division with Right Mind, each taking a second hundred. Within a year, this too had slipped in the same way through Wrong Mind's fingers. As a result, his thoughts took this form. Suppose I divide another two hundred with him, then what is the good of the remainder? A paltry four hundred, even if I steal it. I think I prefer to steal around six hundred. After this meditation, he went alone, removed the treasure and levelled the ground. A mere month later, he took the initiative, going to right mind and saying, My good friend, let us divide the rest of the money equally. So he and right mind visited the spot and began to dig. When the excavation failed to reveal any treasure, that impudent wrong mind first of all smote his own head with the empty pot, then shouted, What became of that good lucre? Surely, right mind, you must have stolen it. Give me my half. If you don't, I will bring you into court. Be silent, villain, said the other. My name is right mind. Such thefts are not in my line. You know the verse. A man right-minded sees but trash. Mere clods of earth in others cash. A mother in his neighbor's wife. In all that lives his own dear life. So together they carried their dispute to court and related the theft of the money. And when the magistrates learned the facts, they decreed an ordeal for each. But wrong mind said, Come, this judgment is not proper, for the legal dictum runs, Best evidence is written word. Next, witnesses who saw and heard. Then only let ordeals prevail when witnesses completely fail. In the present case, I have a witness, the goddess of the wood. She will reveal to you which one of us is guilty and which not guilty. And they replied, You are quite right, sir, for there is a further saying, To meanest witnesses, ordeals should never be preferred. Of course, much less if you possess a forest goddess's word. Now we also feel a great interest in the case. You two must accompany us tomorrow morning 
to that part of the forest. With this, they accepted bail from each and sent them home. Then Wrong Mind went home and asked his father's help. Father, dear, said he, the dinars are in my hand. They only require one little word from you. This very night, I'm going to hide you out of sight in a hole in the mimosa tree that grows near the spot where I dug out the treasure before. In the morning, you must be my witness in the presence of the magistrates. Oh, my son, said the father, we are both lost. This is no kind of a scheme. There is wisdom in the old story. The good and bad of given schemes, wise thought must first reveal. The stupid heron saw his chicks provide a mongoose meal. How was that? asked Wrong Mind. And his father told the story of a remedy worse than the disease. End of section 30《セクション三十一》of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A remedy worse than the disease. A flock of herons once had their nests on a fig tree in a part of a forest. In a hole in the tree lived a black snake who made a practice of eating the heron chicks before their wings sprouted. At last, one heron, in utter woe at seeing the young ones eaten by a snake, went to the shore of the pond, shed a flood of tears, and stood with downcast face. And a crab, who noticed him in this attitude, said, Uncle, why are you so tearful today? My good friend, said the heron, what am I to do? Fate is against me. My babies and the youngsters belonging to my relatives have been eaten by a snake that lives in a hole in the fig tree. Grieved at their grief, I weep. Tell me, is there any possible device for killing him? On hearing this, the crab reflected. After all, he is a natural-born enemy of my race. I will give him such advice, a kind of true lie, that other herons may also perish. For the proverb says, Let your speech, like butter, be. Steal your heart remorselessly. Stir an enemy to action that destroys him with his faction. And he said aloud, Uncle, conditions being as they are, Scatter bits of fish all the way from the mongoose burrow to the snake's hole. The mongoose will follow that trail and will destroy the villainous snake. When this had been done, the mongoose followed the bits of fish, killed the villainous snake, and also ate at his leisure all the herons who made their home in the tree. And that is why I say, the good and bad of given schemes, and the rest of it. But Wrong Mind disdained the paternal warning, and during the night, he hid his father out of sight in the hole of the tree. When morning came, the scamp took a bath, put on clean garments, and followed right mind and the magistrates to the mimosa tree, where he cried in piercing tones, Earth, heaven, and death, the feeling mind, sun, moon, and water, fire, and wind, both twilights, justice, day and night, discern man's conduct, wrong or right. O blessed goddess of the wood, which of us do as the thief speak? Then Wrong Mind's father spoke from his hole in the mimosa. Gentlemen, Right Mind took that money. And when all the king's men heard this statement, their eyes blossomed with astonishment, and they searched their minds to discover the appropriate legal penalty for stealing money in order to visit it on Right Mind. Meanwhile, Right Mind heaped inflammable matter about the hole in the mimosa and set fire to it. As the mimosa burned, Wrong Mind's father issued from the hole with a pitiful wail, his body scorched and his eyes popping out. Why, sir, what does this mean? It is all Wrong Mind's doing, he replied. Whereupon the king's men hanged a Wrong Mind to a branch of the mimosa, while they commended Right Mind and caused him satisfaction by conferring upon him the king's favour and other things. And that is why I say, Right Mind was one, and Wrong Mind two and the rest of it. After telling the story, Cheek continued, Poor fool, by your oversubtle wisdom, you have burned your own family. Yes, there is wisdom in the saying. Rivers find their ending in the salty sea. Household peace as soon as women disagree. Secrets end that do not every traitor shun. Families are ended in a wicked son. Besides, who can trust a creature whether human or not, that has two tongues and a single mouth. As the proverb says, Mouths of snake and scamp, 
bear a savage stamp. Rough and ruthless still, only good for ill. Where the tongue is double, you may look for trouble. Consequently, your conduct makes me fearful for my own person, for I would not trust a rascal. His ways I understand. The petted, pampered serpent will bite the feeding hand. Again, a fire will burn, though kindled in fragrant sandalwood. A rascal is a rascal, although his birth is good. After all, this is the very nature of rascals. As the proverb says, each self-advertising traitor, skillful as calumniator, fate condemns to ruin all, who within his clutches fall. Oh, any tongue in human mouth that lends itself to slanders can't, yet does not split a hundred times, is surely made of adamant. Or may no evil e'er befall the lion man who loves his kind, who practices a silent vow when others' faults are in his mind. Ah, one must use great circumspection in making acquaintances. As the proverb says, with the shrewd and upright man, seek a friendship rare. Exercise with shrewd and false, superheedful care. Pity for the upright fool, find within your heart. If a man be fool and false, shun him from the start. Your efforts have tended to the destruction, not only of your own family, but toward the last of the masters too. Since you reduce your own master to this state, other persons mean no more to you than withered grass. As the saying goes, where mice eat balance beams of iron, a thousand pals in weight, a hawk might steal an elephant, a boy is trifling freight. How was that? asked Victor, and Cheek told the story of the mice that ate iron. End of section 31Section 32 of the Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mice That Ate Iron In a certain town lived a merchant named Naduk, who lost his money and determined to travel abroad. For the meanest of mankind is he, who having lost his money, can inhabit lands or towns where once he spent it like a gentleman. And again, the neighbor gossips blame his poverty as shame who long was wont to play, among them proud and gay. In his house was an iron balance beam, inherited from his ancestors, and it weighed a thousand pulse. This he put in pawn with merchant Lakshman, before he departed for foreign countries. Now after he had long travelled wherever business led him through foreign lands, he returned to his native city and said to merchant Lakshman, Friend Lakshman, return my deposit, the balance beam. And Lakshman said, Friend Naduk, your balance beam has been eaten by mice. To this, Naduk replied, Lakshman, you are in no way to blame if it has been eaten by mice. Such is life. Nothing in the universe has any permanence. However, I am going to the river for a bath. Please send your boy, money god, with me to carry my bathing things. Since Lakshman was conscience-stricken at his own theft, he said to his son, money god, My dear boy, let me introduce Uncle Naduk, who is going to the river to bathe. You must go with him and carry his bathing things. Ah, there is too much truth in the saying. There is no purely loving deed without a pinch of fear or greed or service of a selfish need. And again, wherever there is fond attention that does not seek a service pension, was there no timid apprehension? So Lakshman's son delightedly accompanied Naduk to the river. After Naduk had taken his bath, he thrust Lakshman's son Money God into a mountain cave, blocked the entrance with a great rock, returned to Lakshman's house, and when Lakshman said, Friend Naduk, tell me what has become of my son Money God who went with you. Naduk answered, My good Lakshman, a hawk carried him off from the river bank. Oh, Naduk, cried Lakshman, you liar! How could a hawk possibly carry off a big boy like Money God? But Lakshman, retorted Naduk, the mice could eat a balance beam made of iron. Give me my balance beam if you want your son. Finally, they carried their dispute to the palace gate, where Lakshman cried in a piercing tone, 
Help, help, a ghastly deed. This Naduk person has carried off my son. His name is Money God. Thereupon the magistrates said to Naduk, Sir, restore the boy to Lakshman. But Naduk pleaded, What am I to do? Before my eyes, a hawk carried him from the river bank. Come, Naduk, said they. You are not telling the truth. How can a hawk carry off a fifteen-year-old boy? Then Naduk laughed outright and said, Gentlemen, listen to my words. Where mice eat balance beams of iron, a thousand pals in weight, a hawk might steal an elephant. A boy is trifling freight. How was that? they said. And Naduk told them the story of the balance beam. At this they laughed and caused the restoration of balance beam and boy to the respective owners. And that is why I say, where mice eat balance beams of iron and the rest of it. And she continued, Dunderhead, you have done this because you could not cheerfully see Rusty's favour bestowed on Lively. Yes, yes, there is wisdom in the saying. Cowards reproach the hero here on earth. Base-born rascals blame the men of birth. Misers, him who gives whate'er he can. Misfit lovers blame the ladies' man. Rogues the righteous, cripples blame the straight. Those unlucky blame the fortunate. Last, the scholar, tis the wretched rule, listens to reproaches from the fool. Again, learned men from fools have hate, rich from those less fortunate. Men of virtue from the vicious, wives from creatures meretricious. Yet, after all, wise men even carry through what their nature bids them do. Nature ever will direct. What can punishment effect? Instruction has value only for him who grasps what has been said once. But you are like a stone, brainless, immovable. Why waste effort to instruct you? More than that, O oh fool, it is a mistake even to live beside you. A disaster might some day befall me from some association with you. As the proverb says, to live beside a dunderhead in house or village, town or nation, is pure evil and simple, though one may escape all litigation. Better plunge in sea or fire, hell or deepest pit, than associate with one quite devoid of wit, with the bad or good consort. Vice or virtue clings, just as when the breezes in distant wanderings carry odours foul or sweet on their restless wings. Indeed, there is wisdom in the old story. Two birds were we, I and the other. One father had, we had one mother. But I was taught by hermits, while beef-eaters gave him training vile. Beef-eaters' speech, O king, he heard. I listened to the hermit's word. Our education, good and bad, the obvious consequences had. How was that? asked Victor. And Cheek told the story of the results of education. End of section 32。Section 33 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The results of education. On a part of a mountain, a hen parrot brought two chicks into the world. These chicks were caught by a hunter when the mother had left the nest to search for food. One of them, since fate decreed it, contrived to escape, while the other was kept in a cage and taught to speak. Meanwhile, the first chick encountered a wandering holy man, who caught him, took him to his own hermitage, and gave him kindly care. While time was passing in this manner, a certain king, whose horse ran away and separated from his guard, came to that part of the forest where the hunters lived. The moment he perceived the king's approach, the parrot straightway began to chuckle from his cage. Come, come, my masters, here comes somebody riding a horse. Bind him, bind him, kill him, kill him. And when the king heard the parrot's words, he quickly spurred his horse in another direction. Now when the king came to another wood far away, he saw a hermitage of holy men, and in it a parrot who addressed him from a cage. Enter, O king, and find repose. Taste our cool water and our sweet fruit. Come, hermits. Pay him honour, give him water to wash his feet in the cold shade of this tree. When he heard this, the king's eyes blossomed wide, and he wonderingly pondered 
what it might mean. And he said to the parrot, In another part of the forest, I met another parrot who looked like you, but who had a cruel disposition. Bind him, bind him, he cried. Kill him, kill him. And the parrot replied to the king by giving a precise relation of the course of his life. And that is why I say, our education, good and bad, the obvious consequences had. Thus mere association with you is an evil, as the proverb says, to foes of sense, not foolish friends, tis wiser far to cling. The robber for his victims died, the monkey killed the king. How was that? asked Victor. And Cheek told two stories, called The Sensible Enemy. End of section 33「Section 34 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sensible Enemy There was once a prince who made friends with a merchant's son and the son of a man of learning. Every day the three found entertainment in various diversions, flirtations and pastimes in public squares, parks and gardens. Every day the prince showed his aversion to the science of archery, to equitation and elephant riding, to driving and hunting. At last, when his father one day gave him a wigging, telling him that he showed no aptitude for kingly pursuits, he disclosed to his two friends the injury inflicted on his self-esteem. And they rejoined, Our fathers too are continually talking nonsense when we show our aversion to their business. This tribulation, however, we have not noticed for many days because of the pleasure we took in your friendship. But now that we see you also grieved with the same grief, we are grieved exceedingly. Thereupon the prince said, It would be unmanly to remain here after being insulted. Let us depart together, all grieved with the same grief, and go somewhere else. For the truly self-respecting man discovers what he is and can, deserves and dares and understands, by travelling in foreign lands. Such being determined, they considered where it was advisable to go, and the merchant's son said, You know that no desire is anywhere attained without money. Let us therefore go to Climbing Mountain, where we may find precious gems, and enjoy every heart's desire. The truth of this presentation they all recognised, so started for Climbing Mountain. There, as fate decreed, each of them found a priceless, magnificent gem, whereupon they debated as follows. How are we to guard these gems when we leave this spot by a forest trail thick with peril? Then the son of the man of learning said, You know, I am the son of a counsellor, and I have consequently thought out an appropriate plan, namely, that we swallow our gems and carry them in our stomachs. Thus, we shall not be an object of interest to merchants, highwaymen, and other such people. Having adopted this plan, each inserted his gem in a mouthful of food at dinner time and swallowed it. But while they were doing so, a fellow who was resting unperceived on the mountain slope observed them and reflected. Look here, I too have tramped climbing mountain for many days, searching for gems. But I had no luck. I found nothing. So I will travel with them. And wherever they grow weary and go to sleep, I will cut their stomachs open and take all three gems. With this in mind, he came down the slope and overtook them saying, Good masters, I cannot pierce the frightful forest alone and reach my home. Let me join your caravan and travel with you. To this they assented, for they desired the increase of friendliness, and the four continued their journey. Now in that forest near the trail was a bhil village, nestling in a rugged bit of jungle. As the travellers passed through its outskirts, an old bird in a cage began to sing. This bird, belonging to a numerous aviary, kept his pets in the hut of the village chief. This chief understood the meaning that all kinds of birds express in their song. He therefore comprehended the old bird's intentions and cried with great delight to his men, Listen to what this bird tells us. He says that there are precious gems in the possession of yonder travellers on the trail and that we ought to stop them, catch them and bring them here. When the robbers had done so, the chief stripped the travellers with his own hand but found nothing. So he set them free to resume their journey, clad in loincloths only. But the bird sang the same story, so that the village chief had them brought back and freed them only after a most particular and minute inspection. Once more they started, 
But when the bird impatiently screamed the same song, the chief recalled them once more and questioned them, saying, I have tested this bird time and again, and he never tells a lie. Now he says there are gems in your possession. Where are they? And they replied, If there are gems in our possession, how did your most careful search fail to reveal them? But the chief retorted, If this bird says the thing over and over, the gems are certainly there, in your stomachs. It is now evening. At dawn, I am determined to cut your stomach open for gems. After the scolding, he had them thrust into a dungeon. Then the captive thief reflected, In the morning, when their stomachs are cut open, and the chief finds such splendid gems, the greedy villain will be quite certain to slash my belly too. So my death is a certainty, whatever happens. What am I to do? Well, the proverb says, When that last hour arrives, that none, however shrewd, may miss, a noble spirit serves his kind, and death itself is bliss. It is best then to offer my own stomach first to the knife, saving the very men I had planned to kill. For when my stomach is cut open first of all, and that villain finds nothing, grub as he may, then he will cease to suspect the existence of gems, and heartless though he be, will yet have mercy enough to renounce the cutting of the stomachs of those others. Thus, by giving them life and wealth, I shall gain the glory of a generous deed in this world, and a rebirth in purity hereafter. This is, so to speak, a wise man's death, though I did not seek the opportunity. And so the night passed. At dawn, the village chief prepared to cut open their stomachs, when the thief clasped his hands and humbly entreated him. I cannot, he said. Behold the cutting of the stomachs of these my brothers. Pray, be gracious, and cut my stomach first. To this, the chief mercifully agreed, but he found no sign of a gem in the stomach, cut as he would. Thereupon, he penitently cried, Woe, woe is me! swelling with greed at the mere interpretation of a bird's song. I have done a ghastly deed. I infer that no more gems will be found in the other stomachs than in this. The three men were therefore set free uninjured, and hastening through the forest, they reached a civilized spot. And that is why I say, the robber for his victims died. Better the sensible enemy than the foolish friend. End of section 34《ซ็กชันทีฟายของปัญจตันตร์บายวิชุชรมาทรานสลีดด์บายอาร์เธอร์วิลเลียมไรเดอร์ดิสลิบรีวอกซ์รีคอร์ดิ้งอยู่ในสื่อสารของนายทุนผู้เสียชีวิตในที่นี้พวกเขาขายทั้งสามเหรียญทองที่มีชื่อนายจ้างเป็นเอกลักษณ์ของตนเองและเงินจำนวนมากที่ได้รับจากนายทุนนั้นถูกนำไปให้ผู้หญิงที่มีความรู้สึกที่ดีที่สุดของนายทุนนั้นถูกนำไปให้ผู้หญิงที่มีความรู้สึกที่ดีที่สุดของนายทุนนั้นถูกนำไปให้ผู้หญิงที่มีความรู้สึกที่ดีที่สุดข and made the merchant's son his secretary of the treasury. He then, by offering double pay, assembled an army of picked elephants, horse, and infantry, began hostilities with the prime minister, intelligent in the six expedients, killed the king in battle, seized his kingdom, and himself became king. Next, he delegated all burdensome administrative functions to his two friends and consulted his ease in a life of graceful luxury. After some time, as he dallied now and then in the ladies' apartments, he made a pet and constant companion of a monkey from the stable nearby. For it is a well-known fact that kings take naturally to parrots, partridges, pigeons, rams, monkeys, and such creatures. In course of time, the monkey, regaled with a variety of dainties from the royal hand, grew to be a big fellow and became an object of respect to the entire court. The king, indeed, felt such confidence in the monkey and such affection that he made him his personal sword-bearer. Now the king had near his palace a pleasure grove made charming by clumps of trees of various species. When springtime arrived, he perceived how delightful was this grove, since it advertised the glory of love in the humming of swarms of bees and was fragrant with the perfumes of crowding blossoms. He therefore entered it with his queen in a passion of love, and all his human retinue were left behind at the entrance. After a period of delighted wandering and gazing, the king grew weary and said to the monkey, 
I shall rest and sleep a moment in this arbour. You must keep careful watch to prevent anyone from disturbing me. With this, he went to sleep. Presently, a bee, drawn by the fragrance of flowers of musk and other perfumes, hovered over him and alighted on his head. On seeing this, the monkey angrily thought, What? Under my very eyes, this wretched creature looks upon the king and undertook to drive him away. But when the bee, for all his efforts, continued to approach the king, the monkey went blind with rage, drew his sword, and fetched a blow at the bee, a blow that split the king's head. And the queen, who was sleeping beside him, started up in terror, screaming when she beheld the incomprehensible fact. You fool! You monkey! The king trusted you! How could you do it? Then the monkey told what had happened, after which everybody, by common consent, scolded him and shunned him. So there is a reason in saying that one should not make friends with a fool, inasmuch as the monkey killed the king. Indeed, that is why I say, to foes of sense, not foolish friends, tis wiser far to cling. The robber for his victims died. The monkey killed the king. And Cheek continued, where your sort have the final word, by whom friends' enmities are stirred, whose wisdom lies in tricky traps, all efforts end in sad mishaps. And again, the saint, however deep his need, still shuns the guilt of evil deed, still does the deeds that bring no shame to honourable name and fame. Again, the wise in need still does the deed that keeps his honour bright, the shell a peacock ate and dropped, remains a pearly white. And the proverb says, Wrong is wrong, the wise man never, wrong is right will treat. None would drink, however thirsty, water in the street. To sum it all up, do the right, the right, the right, till the breath of death. Shun the wrong, although the right lead to death of breath. Hereupon, being a tortuous minded creature, to whom a sermon advocating such moral standards was sheer poison, Victor slunk away. At this moment, rusty and lively, their minds, blinded by rage, renewed the battle. But when Rusty had killed Lively, his wrath subsided into pity at the memory of past affection. He wiped his weeping eyes with a blood-smeared paw and penitently said, Ah, me, it was very wrong. Lively was almost my second life. In killing him, I have only hurt myself. For the proverb says, When bits are lost of royal land, or servants true who understand, the servant's loss is deadly pain. Lost lands are quickly won again. But Victor, the impudent, perceiving that Rusty was mastered by irresolution, slowly crept near and said, Master, what conduct is this to show yourself irresolute after slaying a rival? For the saying runs, None leaves a father, brother, son, or a bosom friend alive, who treasonably threatens him, if he desires to thrive. Likewise, a king compassionate, a careless magistrate, a willful wife, a friend, whose thoughts to treason tend, a guzzling Brahmin, or sulky servitor, with all who do not know their business, let them go. Go however far to find honest joy. Learn from any who is wise, though a boy. Give your life the altruist's bliss to win. Cut your very arm away, if it sin. And the morality of the kings has nothing in common with that of ordinary men. As the proverb says, To ruling monarchs, let no trace of common nature cling. For what is vice in other men is virtue in a king. And once more, king's policy is fickle like a woman of the town. For now it hoards its money up, now flings it careless down. Tis rough and flattering by turns, tis kind and cruel too, exacting much and giving much, at once tis false and true. Hereupon, Cheek, since Victor did not return, drew near, sat down beside the lion and said to Victor, Sir, you know nothing of the business of administration. Since the stirring of strife means the destruction of those who had enjoyed mutual friendship. It is not the practice of genuine counsellors. When objects of ambition are attainable, through conciliation, bribery, or intrigue, 
to advise the master to fight his own servant, so bringing him deadly danger. As the proverb says, the god of wealth, the god of war, the god of water, and the god of fire have planned to win, then lost the fights they planned, for victory is not a thing that men or gods command. And besides, no wisdom lies in fighting, since it is the fools who fight. The wise discover in wise books what course is wise and right, and wise books in the course that is not violent delight. Therefore, a counsellor should under no circumstances advise his master to fight, and there is another wise saying, Where the palace harbours servants, kindly modest pure, death to enemies and death to avarice's law, foes may struggle, but the royal honour is secure. Therefore, speak the truth, though harsh it be, Lani is true enmity. And again, where royal servants, asked or not, indulge in pleasant lies, that lead the royal mind astray, the royal glory dies. Furthermore, counsellors should be consulted severally by the master who should thereupon make his own decision concerning the advice given by each as tending to the king's loss or profit. For it happens at times that even an established fact seems otherwise to a wandering judgment. As the proverb says, The firefly seems a fire. The sky looks flat. Yet sky and fly are neither this nor that. And again, The true seem often false. The false seem true. Appearances deceive, so think it through. Consequently, a master should not implicitly rely on the advice of a servant who lacks the administrative sense inasmuch as rascally servants, for their personal profit, present matters to the master in a false light and with bewildering eloquence. Hence, a master should undertake a matter only after full reflection. As the proverb says, let fit and friendly counsel first, and more than once be heard. Then ponder on the plan proposed from first to final word. Then act and harvest fame and wealth, avoiding the absurd. Finally, let no master suffer his mind to be twitched aside by others' counsel. Let him always be mindful of the differences in men. Let him fully consider the ultimate issue, whether favourable or the reverse of various counsels, answers, and times of action. Let him be the master, a wise master, ever cognizant of the multiform complexities of duty. Here ends Book 1, called The Loss of Friends. The first verse runs, The forest lion and the bull were linked in friendship growing full. A jackal then estranged the friends for greedy and malicious ends. End of section 35section 36 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma translated by Arthur William Ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain book 2 the winning of friends here then begins book 2 called the winning of friends the first verse runs the mouse and turtle deer and crow had first-rate sense and learning. So, though money failed and means were few, they quickly put their purpose through. How was that? asked the princes, and Vishnu Sharma told the following story. In the southern country is a city called Maiden's Delight. Not far away was a very lofty banyan tree, with mighty trunk and branches, which gave refuge to all creatures. As the verse puts it, Blessed be the tree whose every part brings joy to many a creature's heart. Its green roof shelters birds in rows, while deer beneath its shadow doze. Its flowers are sipped by tranquil bees, and insects throng its cavities, while monkeys in familiar mirth embrace its trunk. That tree has worth, but others merely cumber earth. In the tree lived a crow named Swift. One morning, he started toward the city in search of food, but he saw a hunter who lived in the neighborhood and who was already near the tree, approaching to trap birds. He was hideous in person, flat of hand and foot, bare to the calf of the leg, dreadfully ugly of complexion, 
had bloodshot eyes, was accompanied by dogs, wore his hair in a knot, carried snare and club in his hand. Why spin it out? He seemed the second god of destruction, noose in hand, the incarnation of evil, the heart of unrighteousness, the teacher of every sin, the bosom friend of death. When Swift saw him, he was disturbed in spirit and reflected. What does he mean to do, the sinner? To hurt me? Or has he some other purpose? And he clung to the hunter's heels, being filled with curiosity. Now the hunter picked a spot, spread a snare, scattered grain, and hid not far away. But the birds who lived there were held in check by Swift's counsel, regarded the rice grains as deadly poison, and did not peep. At this juncture, a dove king named Gaynek, with hundreds of dove retainers, was wandering in search of food, and spied the rice grains from afar. In spite of dissuasion from Swift, he greedily sought to eat them, and alighted in the great snare. The moment he did so, he and his retainers were caught in the meshes. Nor should he be blamed. It happened through hostile fate. As the saying goes, how did Ravan fail to feel? That is wrong, a wife to steal. How did Rama fail to see? Golden dear, could never be. How Yudhishthir failed to know. Gambling brings a train of woe. Clutching evil dims the sense, darkening intelligence. And again, when once the mind is gripped by fate, the judgment, even of the great, in mortal meshes fettered wends to unintended crooked ends. So the hunter gleefully lifted his club and ran forward. Then Gaynek and his retainers, seeing him advancing, were distressed by their disastrous position in the snare. But the king, with much presence of mind, said to the doves, Have no fear, my friends, for provided judgment does not fail, whatever the distress, men reach the farther shore of war and rest in happiness. We must all agree in purpose, must fly up in unison and carry the snare away. This is not possible without united action, for death befalls those of disunited purpose. As the saying goes, Parunda birds will teach you why. The disunited surely die. For single-bellied, double-necked, they took a diet incorrect. How was that? asked the doves. And Gay Neck told the story of the Parunda birds. End of section 36Section 37 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bharunda Birds By a certain lake in the world lived birds called Bharunda Birds. They had one belly and two necks apiece. While one of these birds was sauntering about, his first neck found some nectar. Then the second said, Give me half! And when the first refused, the second angrily picked up poison somewhere and ate it. As they had one belly, they died. And that is why I say, Parunda birds will teach you why, and the rest of it. Thus union is strength. When the doves heard this, being eager to live, they united their efforts to carry the snare away, flew just an arrow shot into the air, formed a canopy in the sky, and proceeded without fear. When the hunter saw the snare carried away by birds, he looked up in amazement, thinking, This is unprecedented, and he recited a stanza. So long as they agree, they may carry the fatal snare away, but they will quickly disagree, and then those birds belong to me. With this in mind, he started to pursue, and when Gaynek perceived the savage pursuer and recognized his purpose, with judgment unconfused, he started to fly over regions rough with hills and trees, and Swift in turn, astonished both by Gaynek's prudent conduct and the hunter's cruel purpose, repeatedly shifted his glance, looking now up, now down, forgot his concern for food, and followed the flock of doves with keenest interest. For he was thinking, what will this noble soul do next, and what this villain? At last, the hunter, observing that the flock of doves 
was protected by the roughness of the paths, turned back in disappointment, saying, What shall not be will never be. What shall be follows painlessly. The thing your fingers grasp will flit if fate has predetermined it. And again, if fate be hostile, even gains acquired no man can hold. They go and take his other wealth like hordes of magic gold. For to say nothing of getting birds to eat, I have actually lost the snare, which was my means of supporting the family. Now when Gainek saw that the hunter had turned back hopeless, he said to the doves, See, we may travel quietly. The villainous hunter has turned back. This being so, our best plan is to fly to the city Maiden's Delight. For in its northeastern quarter dwells a mouse named Gold, a dear friend of mine. He will cut our bonds in a hurry. He is quite competent to set us free from our trouble. So they all did as he said, for they were eager to find the mouse named Gold. And when they reached the hole, which had converted into a fortress, they alighted. Now previously, the mouse in social ethics skilled saw danger coming. Then he built and was residing in a hundred gated den. This being so, Gold was alarmed at the whirr of birds' wings, darted along one path in his fortress den until just beyond reach of a cat's paw, and remained on the weave, wondering what it meant. But Gay Neck took his stand at a gate of the den and said, My dear Gold, pray hasten to me. See what a plight I am in. Thereupon Gold, still within his fortress, said, My good sir, who are you? What is your errand? And of what nature is your misfortune? Please inform me. And Gainek answered, Why, my name is Gainek. I am king of the doves, and a friend of yours. Hasten to me. At this the mouse felt a quiver in his body, and a thrill in his soul. He hastened forth, saying, If daily to his home the friends who love him come, and coming bring delight to eyes that kindle bright, a man has found the whole of life within his soul. Then observing that Gainek and his retainers were caught in a snare, he sadly said, My good friend, what is this and whence? Tell me. My good friend, answered Gainek, why do you ask me? For you know it well, as the proverb says, Whence, what, by whom, how long, when, where, and how deserved is good or ill? Thence that by him, so long, then there, and so it comes. Fate has its will. And again, the peacock seems the world to view from thousand eyes that mock the hue of some bright water lily. When fear of death beclouds his mind, his conduct is of one born blind. He sinks disheartened, silly. A hundred leagues and twenty-five, the vulture spies his meat, but fate decreeing fails to see the snare before his feet. And again, Snake, bird, and elephant are caged. The moon and sun go through eclipse. The wise are poor. All this I see, and think how dreadfully fate grips. And once again, the birds that in the sky securely soar endure calamities, while fish are plucked by men from ocean's floor in far and sounded seas. Why speak of virtue here or moral harm? What stance could help or mar? Tis time that stretches forth a fatal arm and seizes from afar. When Gainek had spoken, Gold began to cut his bonds. But Gainek checked him, saying, My good friend, this is wrong. Please do not cut my bonds first, but my followers. Now Gold grew angry at this and said, Come now, you are mistaken, for servants follow the master. No, no, my good friend said Gainek. All these poor creatures left others to take service with me. Shall I fail to show them this petty honour? You know the proverb. The king who offers honour to his followers beyond their due has servants glad who never quail, not even should his money fail. And again, through trust, the root of happy power, a creature wins to kingship's flower while lions born to kingship must, as tyrants govern, lacking trust. Besides, 
after cutting my bonds you might perhaps get a toothache or that villainous hunter might return in that case i should surely plunge to hell as the proverb says a king who is content to know that loyal servants suffer woe will later go to hell but first will see his earthly projects burst yes said cold i am well aware of this royal duty it was to test you that i said what i did now i will cut the bonds of all and you will have in them a numerous retinue for the proverb says the king who mercifully grants due share in all good circumstance to serving folk may fitly rise the triple world to supervise after making these observations gold cut the bonds of all then said to gainek now my friend you are free to go home so gainek went home with his retinue yes there is wisdom in the saying because a man can gain his ends though difficult with aid of friends get friends and feel those friends to be integral with prosperity now swift who had followed the whole matter of gainek's capture and release was filled with astonishment and he thought what intelligence has this gold what capacity what an ingenious fortress it would therefore be wise for me also to make friends with gold even though i am of a suspicious temperament confiding in nobody even if i am too clever to be overreached by anybody even so i should win a friend for the proverb says even the self sufficient should get friends and seek a greater good the ocean fears no diminution yet waits arcturus contribution after these reflections he flew down from his tree approached the gate of the den and called out for he had previously heard the name of gold gold my dear sir pray come out and gold hearing this reflected is this perhaps some other dove who still somewhat entangled is addressing me and he said who are you sir i am a crow was the answer my name is swift on hearing this gold hugged a far corner and said my very dear sir please leave this neighborhood but replied the crow i have come to see you on weighty business please grant me an interview i see no advantage in making your acquaintance said cold but said the crow i feel great confidence in you the result of seeing how gainek was relieved of bonds through your exertions i too may possibly be caught some day and find deliverance through you please enter into friendship with me sir answered cold you eat and i am food how can i feel friendship for you you have heard the saying the dull think inequalities in strength no fatal blocks to friendship true but they are dull and public laughing stocks please be gone look said the crow here i perch at the gate of your den if you do not make friends with me i shall starve to death but said cold how can i make friends with you with an enemy for the proverb says make no truce however snug with foam and dire water even boiling hot will quench a fire why said the crow you do not even know me by sight why should there be strife why say a thing so little to the purpose sir said cold strife is of two kinds natural and incidental now you are in natural strife with me and the saying goes by incidental means one ends an incidental strife and quickly nature's kind endures until the loss of life sir said the crow i should like to learn the characteristic quality of each kind well said the mouse incidental strife springs from a specific cause and can therefore be removed by rendering an appropriate service but strife rooted in nature never disappears thus there is enduring strife between mongoose and snake herbivorous creatures and those armed with claws water and fire gods and devils dogs and cats rival wives lions and elephants hunter and deer crow and owl scholar and numskull wife and harlot saint and sinner in these cases 
nobody belonging to anybody has been killed by anybody, yet they fight to the death. But this is senseless, said the crow. Listen to me. For cause a man becomes a friend, for cause grows hostile. So the prudent make a friend of him and never make a foe. But, said Gold, what commerce can there be between you and me? Listen to the colonel of social ethics. Whoever trusts a faithless friend and twice in him believes, lays hold on death as certainly as when a mule conceives. And again, a lion took the life of Panini, grammar's most famous name. A tusker madly crushed sage Jaimini of metaphysic fame. And Pingle, metric's boast, was slaughtered by a seaside crocodile. What sense for scholarly attainments high have beasts besotted, vile? True enough, said the crow, but listen to this. The beasts and birds as friends are one for cause, plain folks for service done, and silly souls for greed or fright, but good men are your friends at sight. And again, like pots of clay the wicked friend is quick to smash and hard to mend. Like pots of gold, the righteous flash, as quickly to mend, as hard to smash. And yet again, each segment of a sugar cane, beyond the tip is sweeter. The friendship of the good is so, the other kind grows bitter. Now, I assure you that I am upright. Besides, I will reassure you by taking oaths. But gold replied, I have no confidence in your oaths. There is a saying, Though a foe be bound by oaths, trust him none the more. Indra struck the demon down, spite of oaths galore. And again, even gods must try to lull, foes with measures mild. Indra soothing Diti first, smote her unborn child. Through a narrow crevice slip, enemies who gloat, bringing slow destruction like water in a boat. If relying on their means, men confide in foes, or in wives whose love is lost, life abruptly goes. To this, Swift found no rejoinder, and he thought, What an eminent intelligence he has in the field of social ethics! Yet for that very reason I crave his friendship. And he said, True friendship, sir, is an affair of seven words, the wise declare. I forced you then to be a friend, so hear my pleading to the end. Now grant me your friendship. If you refuse, I shall starve where I stand. And Gold reflected. He is not unintelligent. His speech proves it. None lacking shrewdness flatter well. None but a lover plays the swell. No saints are found in judgment seats. No clear, straightforward speaker cheats. So I must certainly grant him my friendship. Having made up his mind to this, he said to the crow, My dear sir, you have won my confidence, but it was necessary first to test your intelligence. Now I lay my head in your lap. With this he started to come forth, but when scarcely halfway out, he stopped again. And Swift said, Do you cherish even yet some reason for mistrusting me? I see you do not leave your fortress. I have no fear of you, said Gold, for I have examined your mind. But if I gave my confidence, I might perhaps meet death through other friends of yours. Then the crow spoke. Friends purchased at the price of death. To other friends and true, one should avoid, like worthless corn, where finest rice plants grew. Hearing this, Gold hastened forth, and there was a civil greeting on both sides. After a moment, Swift said to Gold, I will not keep you longer outdoors. I am in search of food. With this, he left his friend and flew into thick jungle, where he found a wild buffalo that a tiger had killed. Of this he ate his fill, then returned to Gold, carrying a lump of meat, red as a thark blossom, and he cried, Come out, my dear Gold, come out. Enjoy this meat that I have brought. Now Gold, with sedulous forethought, had constructed a great heap of corn and rice for his friend's use. And he said, My dear friend, pray enjoy this rice, which I have provided to the best of my ability. So each was highly pleased with the other, 
and they ate in order to manifest kindly feeling. This indeed is the seed of friendship. As the verse puts it, six things are done by friends, to take and give again, to listen and to talk, to dine, to entertain. No friendship ever comes without some kindly deed. The very gods respond to gifts they have decreed. As soon as presents cease, so soon does friendship die. The calf deserts the cow, whose udder has gone dry. So to make a long story short, the mouse and crow became such friends as never fail, enduring, hard to split, as flesh and fingernail. Indeed, the mouse was so captivated by the crow's attentions that he grew confident to the point of feeling quite at home between his wings. Now one day, the crow appeared with tears filling his eyes and sobs choked him as he said, My very dear gold, I have grown dissatisfied with this country. I intend to travel. My dear friend, said gold, what cause have you for discontent? Listen, my friend, said the crow. There shall be a dreadful drought in this country, so that all the city people, driven by famine, not only cease to give the birds a few more crumbs, but actually set bird traps in every house. To be sure, I have not been caught for further life has appointed me. Yet this is why I shed tears, for I think of foreign travel. This is why I plan to visit another land. Then tell me where you plan to go, said Gold. And Swift replied, in the far south is a great lake in the heart of the jungle. There lives a turtle named Slow, a bosom friend of mine, dearer even than you are. He will give me bits of fish, a digestible diet. In his society, I shall be happy, enjoying the delight of conversation spiced with wit. Besides, I cannot behold such slaughter of birds. For the proverb says, Blessed are they who do not see death upon the family. Friend in trouble, stolen wife, ruin of the nation's life. Considering the circumstances, said Gold, I will accompany you. I too have a great sorrow. Of what nature? asked Swift. Oh, said Gold, it's a long story. When we get there, I will tell you in detail. But, said the crow, I travel in the air, you on the ground. How will you accompany me? And Gold answered, if you feel concern for the preservation of my life, mount me on your back and carry me very gently. At this the crow was delighted and said, If that is possible, then I am blessed indeed. There is none more blessed than I. Let it be done, for I know the eight flights, full flight and the rest. Thus I shall carry you in comfort. My friend, said Gold, I should like to know the flights by name. And the crow recited, Full flight, part flight, and the rise. Great flight, and the curve likewise. Horizontal, downward flight. Number eight is called the light. After listening to this, Gold mounted the crow, who set off at full flight, and very gently he brought his friend to the lake. Thereupon, Slow saw a mouse riding a crow, and wondering who he might be, plopped into the water, for he was a judge of occasions and swift after depositing gold in a hole in a tree on the bank, perched on the tip of a twig and called in a piercing tone, Friend, slow, come here. I am your crow friend. After long absence I have come, my heart filled with longing. Come embrace me. For the saying runs, Bring sandalwood or camphor. No, nor even flakes of cooling snow. All are not worth the sixteenth part of rest upon a friendly heart. When he heard this, Slow made a narrow inspection. Then, with a quiver of delight, and with eyes swimming in joyful tears, he hurriedly scrambled from the water, saying, I did not know you. I am much to blame. Forgive me. And when Swift flew down from the tree, he embraced him. So the two, after exchanging embraces, thrilled with delight, and sitting beneath the tree told each other their adventures during the long separation. Gold also, with a bow to Slow, sat down there, and Slow spying him said to Swift, Tell me, who is this mouse, and why did you mount him, your natural food on your back, and bring him hither? And Swift replied, Ah, here is a mouse named Gold, a friend of mine, almost my second life. To make a short story of it, his virtues 
like the streams of rain, or stars that dot the sky, or like the grains of dust on earth, all numbering defy. Yes, mathematics fail to count his lofty virtues through, yet he, in deep dejection sunk, has come to visit you. And what, said Slow, is the cause of his gloom? That, said Crow, I asked him yonder, but he put me off, saying it is a long story. I will tell you when we get there. Now, my very dear Gold, pray tell us both the cause of your gloom. And Gold told the story of Gold's Gloom. End of section 37「Section 38 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gold's Gloom In a southern country is a city called Maiden's Delight, and in the neighbourhood a shrine to Shiva. In a cell nearby lived a hermit called Crop Year. During his begging hour he would fill his arms bowl with dainties from the city, eatables, jellified, melting in the mouth, toothsome, flavoured with sugar, treacle and pomegranate. Then returning to his cell, he satisfied himself according to the ordinance, hid what food was left in the arms bowl and hung it on a peg, keeping it for the servant's breakfast. On this food I subsisted with my companions, and so the time passed. Since I nibbled his food, however carefully he hid it, the hermit was disgusted, and in fear of me he moved it from place to place, always hanging it higher. Even so, I got at it easily enough and ate it. Now one day, a guest arrived, a holy man named Widebottom, and Cropier welcomed him, paid him due respect, and relieved his fatigue. At night, they lay on the same couch and started to relate pious tales. But Crop Ear's thoughts were so preoccupied with mice that he kept striking the arms pole with a frazzled bamboo and returned an absent-minded answer to Whitebottom as he told a pious tale. Then the guest grew extremely angry and said, Come, Crop Ear, I perceive that your friendship is dead, for you do not talk with me wholeheartedly. So night though it may be, I shall leave your cell and go elsewhere, for there is a saying, Come, enter, news from town, a chair, you look run down. Welcome, why have you slighted our home so long? Delighted. Such kindly words as these may set the mind at ease, and friends be glad to go where they are greeted so. And again, wherever hosts look vaguely round, or fix their glances on the ground, the guests who visit such a place are hornless, yet of bovine race. You should not visit any home, from which no gentle greetings come, which fails in eager promptitude, with gossip touching bad and good. But this you do not understand, having forgotten friendship through pride, in the ownership of one mere cell, so that you seem to dwell here. But in reality, you have earned a place in hell. For the proverb says, A certain cause for hell to steer, become a chaplain for a year or try more expeditious ways, become an abbot for three days. Poor fool, you take pride in what should cause contrition. When he heard this, Cropier was terrified and said, Do not speak thus, holy sir. There is no friend nearer my heart than you. Pray hear the reason of my inattention. There is a villainous mouse that jumps and climbs to my arms pole, however high I hang it and he eats my leavings. Thus the servants get no recompense, and refuse to tidy up. So to frighten the mouse, I strike the arms pole repeatedly with my bamboo. This is the whole story, but I should add that the villain has such cleverness in jumping as to put cats, monkeys, and other creatures to the blush. Then Whitebottom said, But have you found the mouse whole anywhere? Holy sir, said Cropier, I have not. Surely, said the other, his hole is over his hoard. Beyond question, the fragrance from his hoard makes him spry. For the smell of wealth is quite enough to wake a creature's sterner stuff, and wealth's enjoyment even more, with virtuous giving from his store. And again, 
To certain Mother Chandelier, if bargaining in sesame, her hulled grains for the unhulled kind has some good reason in her mind. How was that? asked Cropier, and Widebottom told the story of Mother Chandelier's bargain. End of section 38「Section 39 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mother Chandelier's Bargain At one time, I asked a certain Brahmin in a certain town for shelter during the rainy season, and this he gave me. So there I lived, occupied with pious duties. One day, I woke betimes, and listening to a conversation between my host and his wife, I heard the Brahmin say, My dear, tomorrow will be the winter solstice, an extremely profitable season, so I will go to another village in search of donations. And you, in honour of the sun, should give some Brahmin food to the extent of your ability. But his wife snapped at him harshly, saying, Who would give food to a poor Brahmin like you? Are you not ashamed to talk like that? And besides, since first I put my hand in yours, I haven't had a thing. I've never tasted stylish food. Don't mention gem or ring. At this the Brahmin was terrified, and he stammered, My dear, my dear, you should not say such things. You have heard the saying, You have a mouthful only. Give a half to feed the needy. Will any ever own the wealth for which his soul is greedy? And again, the poor man can but give a mite, yet his reward is such. The scriptures tell us, as is his, from riches giving much. The cloud gives only water, yet the whole world treats him as a pet. But none can bear the sun who stands with rays that look like outstretched hands. Bearing this in mind, even the poor should give to the right person at the right time, though the gift seem beneath contempt. For great faith, a gift appropriate, fit time, a fit recipient. An understanding heart and gifts are blessed beyond all measurement. And some quote this, Indulge in no excessive greed, a little helps in time of need. But one by greed excessive led, perceived a top knot on his head. How was that? asked the wife, and the Brahmin told the story of self-defeating forethought. End of section 39 Section 40 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Self-Defeating Forethought There was once a hillman in a certain place who set out to increase his sins by hunting. As he walked along, he met a boar that resembled the top of Sooty Mountain. Straightway, he drew an arrow as far as his ear and recited this verse. The fitted shaft and bowstring's tension, he sees and shows no apprehension. The psychological conclusion is, death has prompted this intrusion. Then with a sharp arrow, he shot the bow, who in turn angrily tore the hillman's stomach with a pointed fang that shone like a crescent moon, so that the man fell dead. The boar also, after killing the hunter, died in torment with the arrow wound. At this point, a starving jackal reached the spot in his aimless wanderings. When he spied a boar and a hunter, both dead, he gleefully thought, Fate is kind to me, providing this unlooked-for store of food. There is wisdom in the verse. The fruit of actions, good or bad, in each preceding state, without a further effort, comes upon us, brought by fate. And again, each deed from every time and place and age as consequence, brings good or evil in exact and fitting recompense. Now I will eat in such a way as to have sustenance for many days. I will begin with the sinew wrapped round the boat. I will hold it in my paws and eat very slowly. For the saying goes, consumption of a treasure earned should very slowly follow, as wise men sip elixir down not bolted at a swallow. After these reflections, he took into his mouth the sinew with its end hanging from the bow, 
and when the gut snapped, the boat tip pierced the roof of his mouth and came out like a top knot, and the jackal perished from the pain of it. And that is why I say, indulge in no excessive greed and the rest of it. Then the Brahmin continued, My dear, did you never hear this? These five are fixed for every man, before he leaves the womb, his length of days, his fate, his wealth, his learning and his tomb. After this preachment, the wife said, Well, I believe I have a bit of sesame grain in the house. I will grind it into flour and feed a Brahmin. And her husband, having received her promise, went off to another village. Then the wife softened the sesame grains in hot water, held them, placed them in the hot sun, and returned to her chores in the house. In this state of affairs, a dog made water in the dish of grain, and she thought when she saw it, Dear me, see how shrewd fate is when it has turned against you. Even these poor sesame grains it has made unfit to eat. Well, I will take them to some neighbor's house and make an exchange, unhulled or hulled, for anybody will bargain on those terms. So she put her grain in a basket and went from house to house saying, Who cares to exchange sesame unhulled or sesame hulled? Now she happened to enter with her grain a house which I had entered to beg arms, and she made her offer there. The housewife was delighted and took the hulled grain in exchange for unhulled. Later, her husband came home and asked, My dear, what does this mean? And she told him, I made a bargain, hulled sesame for unhulled. Over this he pondered, then said, To whom did this grain belong? And his son Kamandaki told him, To mother Shandali. Then he said, my dear wife, she is mighty shrewd at a bargain. You had better throw this sesame away. To certain mother Shandali, if bargaining in sesame, her hulled grains for the unhulled kind has some good reason in her mind. So, said Whitebottom, he surely derives this vigour in jumping from the smell of his hoard. And he continued, Do you know his manner of attack? Yes, holy sir, I do, answered Cropier. He comes not alone, but with a school of mice. Well, now, said Whitebottom, is there any digging tool about? Indeed, there is, said Cropier. Here is a handy pickaxe, solid iron. In that case, said the guest, you and I must wake early so as to follow their tracks together, while the footprints still dirty the floor. Now when I heard the villain's speech fall like a thunderbolt, I thought, Ah! This spells ruin for me, for his words imply something more. Just as he has marked my hoard, so he will surely discover my fortress also. Of this, his implied meaning convinces me, for the proverb says, Shrewd characters at sight can estimate aright. Their man, as some are deft, to gauge an ounce by heft. And again, the budding fancy first betrays the character that strives for birth as recompense of good or ill in former lives. No marking tale has grown. Yet when you see the beggar pick his mincing steps about the pond, you cry, a peacock chick. So I was terrified, deserted the beaten track to my fortress, and with my followers started on another track. Then a prodigious cat met us, and seeing the whole pack before him pounced into our midst, and the mice who survived the slaughter scolded me for picking a bad trail and sought shelter in the old fortress, drenching the floor with blood. Yet, there is wisdom in the old story. A deer there was that burst his bonds. He flung the trap aside. He violently broke apart the hobbing snare that died. From woods uncouth with tufted flames, around him bristling fled. The hunter's arrows left behind to seeming safety sped. Into a well at last he tumbles, on hostile fate all effort stumbles. Then I departed alone. The others, poor adults, plunged into the old fortress. Thereupon the holy man, receiving that the floor was smeared with drops of blood, followed the trail to the fortress and began to ply the pickaxe. As he dug, he came upon the hoard over which I had lived so long, and the smell of which used to guide me back to the fortress. Then Whitebottom was filled with glee and said, 
Now, Cropier, sleep in peace. It was the smell of this that enabled the mouse to wake you. So they took the hoard and turned to the cell. Now when I returned to the spot, I could not bear to look at the sad, disturbing sight, and I reflected, Ah, what shall I do? Where shall I go? How may I win peace of mind? In such reflections, the day dragged drearily away. Still, when the sun had lain his thousand beams to rest, I went with my companions to the same cell, though I was troubled and lacking in vigour. And when Cropier heard the patter of our pack, time and again he started to strike the arms bowl with his frazzled bamboo. Then his guest said, My friend, why not go peacefully to sleep at last? Holy sir, he replied, I am sure that villainous mouse has come with his followers. I do this from fear of him. But White Bottom laughed and said, Have no fear, my friend. His jumping energy is gone with his property. This rule applies to all creatures, without exception. As the saying goes, The man has constant vigour, dares on others' backs to mount, speaks in a self-sufficient tone. He has a bank account. This angered me so that I made a desperate jump for the arms bowl, but missed and fell to the floor. And my enemy saw me and said to Cropier, Look, my friend, it is quite wonderful. You could put it into poetry. The wealthy men are men of force. They are scholars all, of course. The mouse who lost his wealthy store is now a mouse and nothing more. And there is a point in this. A fangless snake, an elephant without an Iker's store. A man who lacks a cash account, our names and nothing more. When I heard this, I reflected. Alas, it is true, though it is my enemy who says it. For today I have not the power to jump a mere finger's breadth. A curse upon a fellow's life without money, as the saying goes. After money has departed, if the wit is frail, then like rills in summer weather, undertakings fail. Forest, sesame, crow, barley, men who have no cash, owning names but lacking substance, are accounted trash. Beggars have no doubt their virtues, yet they do not flash, as world has need of sunlight. Virtues ask for cash. Beggars born less keenly suffer than the men who crash from a life of comfort to a deficit of cash. Like the flabby breasts of widows, hopes and wishes rash. Helpless fall upon the bosom when there is no cash. The sun that stuns, the eyes that shun. In vain he strains to see. The light so bright is wrapped in night by veils of poverty. With this broken-spirited lamentation, I saw my own hoard of wealth converted into a pillow for my enemy, and at dawn I crept into my fortress, a failure. Then my attendants retired and gossiped together. Look here, said they, the fellow has no power to fill our bellies. Those who ride his back get nothing but buffets, from cats, for example. Why pay him reverence? For the proverb says, a king from whom no bounties come, but only buffets fall, had better be avoided, and by soldiers first of all. Such remarks I heard on the trail, and since, when I returned to the fortress, not one of my followers accompanied me, for I was penniless, I began to ponder deeply. A curse, a curse, on a life of poverty. There is sound sense in the verse. Even relatives are sure, scornfully to treat the poor. Pride is docked, and virtues moon. Loses luster, waning soon. Friends that were, disgusted fly. Sorrows breed and multiply. Comes the imputation, then, of the sins of other men. When man is crushed by poverty and stricken down by fate, his best of friends become his foes and tried affection, hate. And again, empty is the childless home, hearts that lack a friendship sure, wide horizons to the pool. All is empty to the poor. And once again, his passions are entire. His name, keen wit, and speech are just the same. The man's the same. No, see him change. Cash fails. The life is out. Ah, strange. Yet, what have folk like me to do with money? Folk whose final fate is such as this. 
Positively, my best course, now that property is gone, is to withdraw to the forest. As the proverb says, Pride builds a proper house. Never be humble. Spurn cars of heaven, where pride takes a tumble. Failure may dog the step. Pride stands erect. Stoops not to widest wealth. Tainted. Abject. And I continued my reflections. Yes, the curse of beggary is dreadful as death. For gutted by the forest fire, stands in sterile soil a tree, gnarled and riddled by the worms. Better that than beggar be. And as for beggary, it is the shrine of wretchedness, the dwelling place of tears, the thief of mind, the soil of doubts, the treasury of fears, concreted meanness, home of woe, and haughty honours nil, a form of death to self-esteem, no different from hell. And again, a beggar is a man of shame, who bids farewell to honour's name. From this, humiliations grow, then melancholy's gloomy woe. But gloom with sadness dims the sense, and sad men lack intelligence. Now death his folly is certain fruit, thus money's lack is evil's root. And once again, thrust your hands between the jaws of an angry snake, slumber in the house of death, poisoned liquor take, dash yourself to pieces down Himalaya's side, do not feast on riches wrung from a villain's pride. To sum it up, feed your body to the flames, friend, if you are needy. Do not cringe to beg a dole from the selfish greedy. Better roam in forest wilds with the beasts of prey than by whimpering for gifts, baseness to betray. This being the case, what possible course shall I adopt to keep alive? How about robbery? That too is damnable for it means appropriating what belongs to others. As the verse puts it, Better let your tongue be tied than to know that you have lied. Better to be impotent than adulterously bent. Better die than take delight in the petty pricks of spite. Better beg as monk than feel that you live by what you steal. Well then, shall I live on charity? That too is damnable, my friends, damnable. That too is a second gate of death. As the saying goes, parasite or exiled scamp, invalid or homeless tramp, life is death for these, the best would be death, for death is rest. Then I must at any cost recover the very treasure that White Bottom has stolen, for I saw my money bag converted into a pillow for those two villains. I must regain my property, and if I die in the attempt, it will be better than this. For if cowards who see themselves despoiled too tamely feel the sting, their fathers in the world beyond will spurn their offering. And after reaching this conclusion, I went there at night, and gnawed a hole in the bag after he had gone to sleep. Thereupon that dreadful holy man awoke, and struck me on the head with a frazzled bamboo. Yet somehow I escaped death. Predestination, you see. As the old rhyme puts it, what's duly his, a man receives. This law not even God can break. My heart is not surprised, nor grieves. For what is mine, no stranger's stake. How was that? asked the crow and the turtle. And Gold told the story of Mr. Dooley. End of section 40section 41 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Dooley In a certain city lived a merchant named Ocean. His son picked up a book at a sale for a hundred rupees. In this book was the line, What's duly his, a man receives. Now Ocean saw it and asked his son, My boy, what did you give for this book? A hundred rupees, said the son. Simpleton said Ocean. If you pay a hundred rupees for a book with one line of poetry written in it, how do you calculate to make money? From this day, you are not at home in my house. After this wigging, he showed him the door. This melancholy rebuff drove the young man to another country far away, where he came to a city and stopped there. After some days, a native asked him, Whence are you, sir? 
what might your name be? And he replied, what's duly his, a man receives. To a second inquirer, he gave the same reply. Then on, all who questioned him, he bestowed his stereotyped answer. This is how he came by his nickname of Mr. Dooley. Now a princess named Moonlight was in the first flush of youth and beauty, stood one day with a girlfriend, looking out over the city. At that spot a prince, extraordinarily handsome and charming, chanced to come. It was fate's doing, within her range of vision. The moment she saw him, she was smitten by the arrows of love, and said to her friend, Dear girl, you must take an effort to bring us together this very day. So the friend went straight to him and said, Moonlight sent me to you. She sends you this message. The sight of you has reduced me to the last extremity of love. If you do not hasten to me, I shall die, nothing less. On hearing this, he said, If I cannot avoid the trip, please tell me how to get into the house. And the friend said, When night comes, you must climb up a stout strap that will be hanging from an upper story of the palace. And he replied, If you have it settled, I will do my part. With this understanding, the girl returned to moonlight. But when night came, the prince thought it over. A Brahmin slayer, so they say, is he who tries to house with teacher's child or wife of friend or royal servant's spouse. And again, a deed that brings dishonor, whereby a man must fall, that causes disadvantage. Don't do it, that is all. So after full reflections, he did not go to her. But Mr. Dooley was roaming through the night and spied a strap hanging down the wall of a fine stucco house. Out of curiosity, mingled with bravado, he took hold and climbed. Now the princess, being perfectly confident that he was the right man, treated him with high consideration, gave him a bath, a meal, a drink, fine garments and the like. Then she went to bed with him and her limbs thrilled with joy at touching him. But she said, I fell in love with you at first sight, and have given you my person. I shall never have another husband, even mentally. Why don't you realize this and talk to me? And he replied, What's duly his, a man receives. When she heard this, her heart stopped beating, and she sent him down the strap in a hurry. So he made for a tumble-down temple and went to sleep. Presently, a policeman who had an appointment with a woman of very easy virtue arrived there and found him asleep. As the policeman wished to hush the matter up, he said, Who are you? And the other answered, What's duly his, a man receives. When he heard this, the policeman said, This temple is deserted. Go and sleep in my bed. And he agreed, but made a blunder, lying down in the wrong bed. In that bed lay the policeman's daughter, a big girl named Naughty, beautiful and young. She had made a date with a man she loved, and when she saw Mr. Dooley, she thought, Here is my sweetheart. So, her blunder, due to the pitchy darkness of the night, she rose, gave herself in marriage by the ceremony used in heaven, then lay with him in bed, her lotus eyes and lily face a blossom. But she said, Even yet you do not talk nicely to me. Why not? And he replied, What's duly his, a man receives. On hearing this, she thought, This is what one gets for being careless. So she gave him a sorrowful scolding and sent him packing. As he walked along a business street, there approached a bridegroom named Fine Fame. He came from another district and marched with a great wanging of tom-toms. So Mr. Dooley joined the procession. Since the happy moment was near at hand, the bride, a merchant's daughter, was standing at the door of her father's house near the highway. She stood on a raised step under an awning provided for the occasion and displayed her wedding finery. At this moment, an elephant reached the spot, running amok. He had killed his driver, had got beyond control, and the crowd was in a hubbub, everyone scared out of his wits. When the bridegroom's parade got a glimpse of him, they ran, the bridegroom too, and started for the horizon. In this crisis, Mr. Dooley received the girl, all alone, her eyes dancing with terror and with the words, Don't worry, I will save you, manfully reassured her, put his right arm around her 
and with enormous sang-froid gave the elephant a cruel scolding. And the elephant, it was fate's doing actually, went away. Presently fine fame appeared with friends and relatives, too late for the wedding, for another man was holding his bride's hand. At the sight of his rival, he said, Come, father-in-law, this is hardly respectable. You promised your daughter to me, then gave her to another man. Sir, said the father-in-law, I was frightened by the elephant, and I ran too. I came back with you, gentlemen, and do not know what has been going on. Then he turned and questioned his daughter. My darling girl, what you have been doing is scarcely the thing. Tell me what this business means. And she replied, this man saved me from deadly peril. So long as I live, no man but him shall hold my hand. When the story got abroad, dawn had come, and as a great crowd gathered in the early morning, the princess heard the story of events and came to the spot. The policeman's daughter, also hearing what passed from lip to lip, visited the place, and the king, in turn, learning of the gathering of a great crowd, arrived in person and said to Mr. Dooley, Speak without apprehension. What sort of business is this? And Mr. Dooley said, What's duly his, a man receives. Then the princess remembered, and she said, This law not even God can break. Then the policeman's daughter said, My heart is not surprised, nor grieves. And hearing all this, the merchant's daughter said, For what is mine, no strangers take. Then the king promised immunity to one and all, arrived at the truth by piecing their narratives together, and ended by respectfully giving Mr. Dooley his own daughter, together with a thousand villages. Then he bethought himself that he had no son. So he anointed Mr. Dooley crown prince, and the crown prince, together with his family, lived happily, for means of enjoyment were provided in great variety. And that is why I say, what's duly his, a man receives, and the rest of it. And Gold continued, After these reflections, I recovered from my money madness, for there is much wisdom in this. Not rank, but character is birth. It is not eyes, but wits, that see. True learning tis, to cease from wrong. Contentment is prosperity. And again, Yes, all prosperities are his, whose heart is filled with mirth. The feet in leather sandals shod, Travel a leather earth. A hundred leagues is not to him, Whose vehicle is greed, To clasp the wealth that fingers touch, Contentment has no need, Since Vishnu universal lord, Through thee a dwarf was made, A manhood solvent, greed divine, To thee be homage paid. No feat is hard for thee, O greed, Dishonours wedded dame, Who for the men of kindest heart, Preparest draughts of shame. What man should never bear, I bore. I spoke, and speaking, lied. I waited at the stranger's door. O oh, greed, be satisfied. And again, I've drunk foul water, slept forlorn, on gathered bits of broken thorn. I've lost my love. I've begged for arms, enduring heart and belly qualms. I've crossed the sea. I've walked afar. I've treasured half a shattered jar. Of further labours, is there need? Quick, damn you, give your orders, greed. No poor man's evidence is heard, Though logic link it word to word, While wealthy babble passes muster, Though crammed with harshness, vice and bluster. The wealthy, though of meanest birth, Are much respected on the earth. The poor whose lineage is prized, like clearest moonlight are despised. The wealthy are, however old, rejuvenated by their gold. If money has departed, then, the youngest lads are aged men. Since brother, son, and wife, and friend, desert when cash is at an end, returning when the cash rolls in, tis cash that is our next of kin. At that moment, when with such thoughts in my mind I went to my quarters, our friend Swift came to me and suggested a journey hither. So here I am. I have come with him to visit you. Thus I have related to you the cause of my gloom. Well, there is this to be said. The world, gods, elephants and men, dear devils, snakes. 
before the noonday hour is spent, its dinner takes. When hour and appetite arrive, there should suffice for worldwide conqueror or slave a bowl of rice. For this, what man of sense would do base deeds perverse, whose consequences drag him down from bad to worse? When he listened to this, Slow began to offer consolation. My dear fellow, said he, you must not lose heart at leaving your country. Intelligent as you are, why feel disturbed without occasion? Consider the saying, the merely learned is a fool. The wise man uses action's tool. For no remembered drug can cure. The sick by name alone to show. To brave and wise, what land is strange or native? Whatsoever change befall, he makes the land his own. By strength of valiant arm alone, the lion's whim is jungle law. By strength of tooth and tail and claw, he slaughters elephants for food and slakes his servants' thirst with blood. Therefore, my dear fellow, we must always be energetic. Where will money feel at home or pleasures? You know the saying, as frogs will find a drinking hole, or birds a brimming lake, so friends and money seek a man whose vigour does not break. From another point of view, the goddess fortune seeks his home, the brave and friendly man, the grateful righteous soul, each moment what he can, who regulates a sturdy life upon an active plan. Or put it this way, the brave, wise, hopeful and persistent, from tricks, freaks, meanness, equidistant. If such there be, and fortune flee, the joke on fortune falls insistent. While on the other hand, if man be fatalist and slacker, irresolute and so far lacquer, him fortune, as a bouncing miss, her aged lover hates to kiss. Abysmal learning does not aid to virtue those who are afraid, as men with lamps no sooner find Lost objects if those men are blind. The prince becomes a beggar, By weak and slayers slain. The beggar ceases begging, When fate revolves again. Nor must you, in view of the aphorism, Since teeth and nails and men and hair Is out of place, are ugly there. Draw the coward's conclusion, Let no man leave his native place. For to the competent there is no distinction Between native and foreign land. You must have heard the saying, Brave, learned, fair, where'er they roam, Without delay, are quite at home. The shrewdly valiant on the earth Will always master money's worth. Not those of godlike scholarship, Tis certain, if they lose their grip. Today, no doubt, your purse is light. For all that, you are not in the position Of a commonplace fellow. For you have sense and vigour. And the proverb says, let sturdy resolution guide, and poor men touch the peak of pride. Let money fold in its embrace. The mean, they sink to lowly place. The lion's majesty derives from nature, rich because he strives, to crown his feats with nobler feats. What golden-collared dog competes? And again, some men compacted of self-vigour, with valour, enterprise and vigour, indifferently view the muddle, of ocean and the pretty puddle, as at some wretched ant hill, frown at Himalaya's highest crown. To these, not those who wait and see, comes fortune, tripping eagerly. And once more, Mount Meru is not very high, hill is not very low, the sea not shoreless, if a man abounding vigour show. For after all, why wealthy puff with pride? Why poor in gloom subside, since like a stricken ball, men's fortunes rise and fall? In any case, remember that youth and wealth are unstable as water bubbles. As the saying goes, with shadows of the passing cloud, new grain and knavish friends, with women's love and youth and wealth, enjoyment quickly ends. This being so, if an intelligent man catches slippery money, let him make it fruitful by giving it away or enjoying it. And the proverb tells us, The coin that cost a hundred toils, 
that men are wont to cherish beyond their life will, if it be, not given to others, perish. And again, bestow or use your wealth for pleasure. If not, you hoard another's treasure. As in your home, your lovely girl awaits a stranger, his dear pearl. And once again, the miser for another hoards his bags of needless money. The bees laboriously pack, but others taste the honey. In any event, fate has the last word, as the proverb puts it, in web and bristling battle or at home, in flaming fire, wild cave or monstrous sea, among Thanatophidian fangs elate, the to be is not the not to be. Now, you are healthy and enjoy peace of mind. This is the supreme possession. As the saying goes, the lord of seven continents, beset by crawling greed, is but a beggar. He who lives content is rich indeed. Besides, on this earth, no treasure equals charity. Content is perfect wealth. No gem compares with character, no wish fulfilled with health. Nor must you think, how can I survive, having lost my possession? For money passes away, man's character abides. There is a proverb to fit the case. The noble man indeed may fall to earth, like an elastic ball. The coward who drops is down to stay, is flattened like a ball of clay. But why bore you? Here is the nub of duty. Certain men are born to enjoy the pleasures that money brings. Certain others are born money's guardians. There is a verse about it. Your wealth will flee, if fate decree. Though it was fairly earned, so silly soft, when perched aloft, in that great forest learned. How was that? asked Gold, and slow told the story of Soft the Weaver. End of section 41。Section 42 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Soft the Weaver. In a certain town lived a weaver, his name was Soft, and he spent his time making garments dyed in various patterns, fit for such people as princes. But for all his labours, he could not collect a bit of money beyond food and clothes. Yet he saw other weavers who made coarse fabrics rolling in wealth, and he said to his wife, Look at these fellows, my dear. They make coarse stuff, but they earn heaps of money. This city does not offer me a decent living. I am going to move. Oh, my dear, said his wife, it is a mistake to say that money comes to those who travel. There is a proverb. What shall not be will never be. What shall be follows painlessly. The thing your fingers grasp will flit if fate has predetermined it. And again, a calf can find its mother cow among a thousand kind, so good or evil done returns, and whispers, I am thine. And once again, as shade and sunlight interbreed, so twined our doer and his deed. So stay here and mind your business. You are mistaken, my dear, said he. No deed comes to fruition without effort. There is a proverb, you cannot clap a single hand, nor effortless do what you planned. And again, although at mealtime fate provide a richly loaded plate, no food will reach the mouth unless the hand cooperate. And once again, through work, not wishes, every plan, its full fruition reaps. No deer walk down the lion's throat, so long as lion sleeps. And one last quotation. Suppose he gave the best he had, yet no fruition came. "'Twas fate that blocked his efforts, not the man who was to blame. "'I must go to another country.' "'So he went to Growing City, stayed three years, "'and started home with savings of three hundred gold pieces. "'In mid-journey, he found himself in a great forest "'when the blessed sun went to rest. "'So forethoughtful for his safety, "'he climbed upon a stout branch of a banyan tree and dozed. "'In the middle of the night, 
as he slept, he saw two human figures whose eyes were bloodshot with fury and heard them abusing each other. The first of them was saying, Come now, Dua, you know you have in every possible way prevented this fellow soft from getting any capital beyond food and clothes, so you have no right ever to let him have any. Why did you give him three hundred gold pieces? Now, deed, said the other, I am constrained to give him the enterprising, a reward in proportion to their enterprise. The final consequence is your affair. Take it from him yourself. On hearing this, Soft awoke and looked for his bag of gold. When he found it empty, he thought, Oh dear, it was so much trouble to earn the money. And it went in a flash. I have had my work for nothing. I haven't a thing. How can I look my wife in the face or my friends? So he made up his mind to return to Growing City. There he earned five hundred gold pieces in just one single year and started home again by a different road. When the sun went down, he came upon the very same banyan tree and he thought, Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, what is fate up to? Damn the brute! Here is that same fiendish old banyan tree once more. But he dozed off on a branch and saw the same two figures. One of them was saying, Dua, why did you give this fellow soft five hundred gold pieces? Don't you know that he doesn't get a thing beyond food and clothes? Friend, deed, said the other. I am constrained to give to the enterprising. The final consequence is your affair. So why blame me? When poor Soft heard this, he looked for his bag and found it empty. This plunged him into the depths of gloom, and he thought, Oh dear, what good is life to me if I lose my money? I will just hang myself from this banyan tree and say goodbye to life. Having made up his mind, he wove a rope of spear grass, adjusted it as a nose to his neck, climbed out a branch, fastened it, and was about to let himself drop when one of the figures appeared in the sky and said, Do not be so rash, friend Soft. I am the person who takes your money, who does not allow you one cowry beyond food and clothes. Now go home, but that you may not have seen me without result, ask me your heart's desire. In that case, said Soft, give me plenty of money. My good fellow, said the other, what will you do with money, which you cannot enjoy or give away? For you are to have no use of it beyond food and clothes. But Soft replied, even if I get no use of it, still, I want it. You know the proverb, the man of capital, though ugly and base-born, is honoured by the world for charity forlorn. And again, lose they are yet tight, fall or stick, my dear. I have watched them now till the fifteenth year. How was that? asked the figure, and soft told the story of Hangball and Greedy. End of section 42section 43 of panchatantra by vishnu sharma translated by arthur william ryder this librivox recording is in the public domain hangball and greedy in a certain town lived a bull named hangball from excess of male vigor he abandoned the herd tore the river banks with his horns browsed at will on emerald tipped grasses and went wild in the forest in that forest lived a jackal named greedy one day he sprawled at ease with his wife on a sandy river bank. At that moment, the bull Hangball came down to the same stretch of sand for a drink, and the she-jackal said to her husband when she saw the hanging testicles, Look, my dear, see how two lumps of flesh hang from that bull. They will fall in a moment, or a few hours at most, so you must follow him, please. My dear, said the jackal, nobody knows. Perhaps they will fall some day, perhaps not. Why send me on a fool's errand? I would rather stay here with you and eat the mice that come to water. They follow this trail, and if I should follow him, somebody else would come here and occupy the spot. Better not do it. You know the proverb. If any leave a certain thing, for things uncertain wandering, the sure that was is sure no more. What is not sure was lost before. Come, said she, you are a coward, satisfied with any little thing. You're quite wrong. We always ought to be energetic, 
a man especially. There is a saying, depend on energetic mind and banish indolence's blight. Let enterprise and prudence kiss. All luck is yours, it cannot miss. And again, let none content with faith's negation sink with lazy self-prostration. No oil of sesame unless the seeds of sesame you press. And as for your saying, perhaps they will fall, perhaps not. That too is wrong. Remember the proverb? Mere bulk is not. The resolute have honour, sure. God brings the plover water. Who dare call him poor? Besides, I'm dreadfully tired of mouse flesh, and these two lumps of meat are plainly on the point of falling. You must not refuse me. So when he had listened to this, he left the spot where mice were to be caught and followed Hangball. Well, there is wisdom in the saying. Only while he does not hear, woman's whisper in his ear, goading him against his will, is a man his master still. And again, in action, should not, is as should. In motion, cannot, is as can. In eating, ought not, is as ought. When woman's whispers drive a man. So he spent much time wandering with his wife after the bull. But they did not fall. At last in the fifteenth year, in utter gloom he said to his wife, Loose they are, yet tight. Fall or stick, my dear. I have watched them now till the fifteenth year. Let us draw the conclusion that they will not fall in the future either and return to the old mouse trail. And that is why I say, loose they are yet tight and the rest of it. Now anybody as rich as that becomes an object of desire. So give me plenty of money. If things stand so, said the figure, go once more to growing city. There dwell two sons of merchants. Their names are Penny Hyde and Penny Fling. When you have observed their conduct, you may ask for yourself the nature of one or the other. With this he vanished and soft returned to growing city, his mind in a maze. At evening twilight, he wearily inquired for Penny Hyde's residence, learned with some trouble where it was, and called there. In spite of scoldings from the wife, the children and others, he made his way into the courtyard and sat down. Then at dinner time, he received food, but no kind word, and went to sleep there. During the night, he saw the same two human figures holding counsel. One of them was saying, Come now, doer, why are you making extra expense for this fellow Penny Hyde in providing soft for the meal? And the second replied, Friend, deed, it is no fault of mine. I am constrained to attend to acquisition and expenditure, but their final consequence is your affair. Now when the poor fellow awoke, he had to fast, because Penny Hyde was in the second day of a cholera attack. So Soft left that house and went to Penny Flings, who showed him much honour, greeting him cordially and providing food, garments and the like. In his house, Soft rested in a comfortable bed, and in the night, he saw the same two figures taking counsel together. One of them was saying, Come now, doer, this fellow Penny Fling is at no little expense today, entertaining Soft. So how will he pay that debt? He has drawn everything from the bank. Friend deed, said the second. I had to do it. The final consequence is your affair. Now at dawn, a policeman came with money, a favour from the king, and gave it all to Penny Fling. When he saw this, Soft thought, this Penny Fling person, even without any capital, is a better kind of thing than that scaly old Penny Hyde. The proverb is right. The scripture's fruit is bias homes. Right conduct, that of learned tomes. Wives fructify in joy and sun, and money's fruit is gifts and fun. So may the blessed Lord of all make me a person whose money goes in gifts and fun. I see no good in penny hiding. So the Lord of all took him at his word, making him that kind of person. And that is why I say, your wealth will flee, if fate decree, and the rest of it. Therefore, my friend Gold, recognize the facts and feel no uneasiness in the department of finance. You know the proverb, A lofty soul in days of power is tender as a lotus flower, but meeting misadventure's shock grows hard as Himalayan rock.
and again. The goal desiderating powers its train, is reached by listless sleepers with no pain, though panting life goes struggling ceaselessly, the to be is, is not the not to be. And once again, why think and think without relief? Why wait the mind with aimless grief? All finds fulfilment soon or late, if written on the brow of fate. Or put it this way, from distant island central sea or far horizon's brink, fate brings and links its willful whims before a man can wink. Or this way, fate links the unlinked, unlinks links. It links the things that no man thinks. All life unwilling faces its unbidden doom. Some ill, no doubt, but blessings too. Why sink in gloom? And yet again, courageous, cultivated minds, their fate would supervise, but linked causation masters them and makes it otherwise. And he who made the parrots green, but made the king's swans white, and peacocks particolored, he will order us aright. There is great wisdom in the old story. Within a basket tucked away, in slow starvation's grim decay, a broken-hearted serpent lay. But see the cheerful mouse that gnaws a hole and tumbles in his jaws at night, new hope's unbidden cause. Now see the serpent, sleek with meat, who hastens through the hole to beat from quarters cramped a glad retreat. So fuss and worry will not do, for fate is somehow muddling through, to good or bad for me and you. Adopt this point of view and give some attention to ultimate salvation. There is a verse about that too. Let some small rite, vow, fasting, self-control, be daily practiced with a quiet soul. For fate chips daily from our days to be, though panting life goes struggling ceaselessly. This being so, contentment is always wise. Contentment's nectar draft supplies, the quiet joy that satisfies. How can the money maddened know that joy in bustlings to and fro? And once again, no penance like forbearance, no pleasure like content, no friend like gifts, no virtue like hearts on mercy bent. But why bore you with a sermon? In this place you are at home. Pray divest yourself of disturbing worries and spend your time in friendship with me. Now when Swift had listened to these observations of Slow, set off as they were with the inner truth of numerous authoritative works, his face blossomed, his heart was satisfied, and he said, Slow, my dear fellow, you are good. Your virtue is something to rely on. For in the act of offering this comfort to gold, you have brought perfect satisfaction to my heart. As the proverb puts it, they taste the best of bliss, are good and find life's truest ends, who glad and gladdening rejoice, in love with loving friends. And again, the richest man is penniless, a living knot, a vain distress. If greed, true wealth destroying bends, his soul to lack the charm of friends. Now by means of this first-class advice, you have rescued a poor friend, sunk in the sea of wretchedness. After all, it is quite in the nature of things. The good forever save the good, when dull misfortunes clog. For only elephants can drag their comrades from the bog. And again, no man deserves the praise of men, nor meets the vows of virtue when the poor or suppliant from him go, averted sunk in hopeless foe. Yet there is wisdom in this. What manhood is there, making not the sad secure? What wealth is that? Availing not to aid the poor? What sort of act? Performed without good consequence? What kind of life? The glory feels to be offence. While they were conversing thus, a deer named Spot arrived, panting with thirst and quivering for fear of hunter's arrows. On seeing him approach, Swift flew into a tree, gold crept into a grass clump, and slow sought an asylum in the water. But Spot stood near the bank, trembling for his safety. Then Swift flew into the air, 
inspected the terrain for the distance of a league, then settled on his tree again and called to Slow. Slow, my dear, come out, come out. No evil threatens you here. I have inspected the forest minutely. There is only this deer who has come to the lake for water. Thereupon all three gathered as before. Then out of friendly feeling toward a guest, Slow said to the deer, My good fellow, drink and bathe. Our water is of excellent quality and cool. And Spot thought, after mediating on this invitation, Not the slightest danger threatens me from these, and this because a turtle has no capacity for mischief when out of water, while mouse and crow feed only on what is dead. So I will make one of their company. And he joined them. Then Slow bade him welcome and did the honours, saying, I trust your circumstances are happy. Pray tell us how you happened into this neck of the woods. And Spot replied, I am weary of a life without love. I have been hard-pressed on every side by mounted grooms and dogs and hunters. But fear lent speed. I left them all behind and came here to drink. Now I am desirous of your friendship. Upon hearing this, Slow said, We are little of body. It is unnatural for you to make friends with us. One should make friends with those capable of returning favours. But Spot rejoined, Better with the learned dwell, even though it be in hell, than with vulgar spirits roam, palaces that gods call home. And since you know that one little of body may be of no little consequence, why these self-deprecatory remarks? Yet after all, such speech is becoming to the excellent. I therefore insist that you make friends with me today. There is a good old saying, Make friends, make friends, however strong or weak they be. Recall the captive elephants that mice set free? How was that? asked Slow. And Spot told the story of the mice that set elephants free. End of section 43「Section 44 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mice That Set Elephants Free There was once a region where people, houses and temples had fallen into decay. So the mice, who were old settlers there, occupied the chinks in the floors of stately dwellings with sons, grandsons, both in the male and female line, and further descendants as they were born until their holes formed a dense tangle. They found uncommon happiness in a variety of festivals, dramatic performances with plots of their own invention, wedding feasts, eating parties, drinking bouts, and similar diversions. And so the time passed. But into this scene burst an elephant king, whose retinue numbered thousands. He, with his herd, had started for the lake upon information that there was water there. As he marched through the mouse community, he crushed faces, eyes, heads and necks of such mice as he encountered. Then the survivors held a convention. We are being killed, they said, by these lumbering elephants, curse them. If they come this way again, there will not be mice enough for seed. Besides, an elephant will kill you if he touch, a serpent if he sniff. King's laughter has a deadly sting. A rascal kills by honouring. Therefore let us devise a remedy effective in this crisis. When they had done so, a certain number went to the lake, bowed before the elephant king and said respectfully, O oh, king, not far from here is our community, inherited from a long line of ancestors. There we have prospered through a long succession of sons and grandsons. Now you gentlemen, while coming here to water, have destroyed us by the thousand. Furthermore, if you travel that way again, there will not be enough of us for seed. If then you feel compassion toward us, pray travel another path. Consider the fact that even creatures of our size will some day prove of some service. And the elephant king turned over in his mind what he had heard, decided that the statement of the mice was entirely logical, and granted their request. Now in the course of time, a certain king commanded his elephant trappers, to trap elephants, and they constructed a so-called water trap, caught the king with his herd. Three days later, 
dragged him out with a great tackle made of ropes and things, and tied him to stout trees in that very bit of forest. When the trappers had gone, the elephant king reflected thus, In what manner or through whose assistance shall I be delivered? Then it occurred to him, We have no means of deliverance except those mice. So the king sent the mice an exact description of his disastrous position in the trap through one of his personal retinue, an elephant cow who had not ventured into the trap and who had previous information of the mouse community. When the mice learned the matter, they gathered by the thousand, eager to return the favour shown them, and visited the elephant herd. And seeing king and herd fettered, they gnawed the guy ropes where they stood, then swarmed up the branches, and by cutting the ropes aloft, set their friends free. And that is why I say, make friends, make friends, however strong, and the rest of it. When Slow had listened to this, he said, Be it even so, my dear fellow, have no fear. In this place, you are at home. Pray dismiss anxieties, and behave as in your own dwelling. So they all took food and recreation at such hours as suited each, met at the noon hour in the shade of crowding trees beside the broad lake, and spent their time in reciprocated friendship, discussing a variety of masterly works on religion, economics and similar subjects. And this seems quite natural. For men of sense, good poetry and science will suffice. The time of dunderheads is spent in squabbling sleep and vice. And again, a thrill will fill the wisest heart when Flo Beaumont composed with art, though females be removed apart. Now one day, Spot failed to appear at the regular hour, and the others missing him, alarmed also by an evil omen that appeared at that moment, drew the conclusion that he was in trouble and could not keep up their spirits. Then Slow and Gold said to Swift, Dear fellow, we too are prevented by locomotive limitations from hunting for our dear friend. We beg you, therefore, to hunt about and learn whether the poor fellow is eaten by a lion or singed by forest fire or fallen into the power of hunters and such creatures. There is a saying, one quickly fears for loved ones who in pleasure gardens play. What then if they in forests grim and peril bristling stay? By all means, go. Search out precise news concerning spot and return quickly. On hearing this, Swift flew a little distance to the edge of a swamp, and finding Spot caught in a stout trap braced with pegs of acacia wood, he sorrowfully said, My dear friend, how did you fall into this distress? My friend, said Spot, there is no time for delay. Listen to me. When life is near an end, the presence of a friend brings happiness, allying the living with the dying. Oh, pardon any expressions of friendly impatience I may have used in our discussions. Likewise, say to gold and slow in my name. If any ugly word was willy-nilly heard, I pray you both forgive. Let only friendship live. On hearing this, Swift replied, Feel no fear, my dear fellow, while you have friends like us. I will return with all speed, bringing gold to cut your bonds. Thereupon, with his heart in a flutter, he found slow and gold, explained the nature of Spot's captivity, then returned to Spot, carrying gold in his beak. Gold, for his part, on seeing the plight of his friend, sorrowfully said, My dear fellow, you always had a wary mind and a shrewd eye. How then did you fall into this dreadful captivity? And Spot rejoined, Why ask, my friend? Fate, you know, does what it will. As the saying goes, What mortal flies, however wise, when billows rise to fatal size, on seas of woe, in dead of night or broad daylight, grim fate may smite. Ah, who can fight an unseen foe? You, my saintly friend, are familiar with the caprices of constraining destiny. Therefore be quick, cut my bonds, before the pitiless hunter comes. Have no fear, said Cold, while I am at your side. In my heart, however, is great sorrow, which I beg you to remove by telling your story. You are guided by an eye of wisdom. How did you fall into this captivity? Well, said Spot, if you insist on knowing, listen, 
and learn how I have been made captive a second time, having once before suffered the wars of captivity. Tell me, said Cold, how once before you suffered the wars of captivity. I am eager to learn the full detail. And Spot told the story of Spot's Captivity. End of section 44「Section 45 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma, translated by Arthur William Ryder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spots Captivity Long ago, when I was six months old, I used to gamble in front of all the rest, as a younger does. Out of sheer spirits, I would run far ahead, then wait for the herd. Now we deer have two gates, called the jump up and the straightaway. Of these, I knew the straightaway, but not the jump up. While amusing myself one day, I lost touch with the herd. At this I was dreadfully worried, gazed about the horizon to learn where they might be, and discovered them ahead. Now they had avoided a snare by means of the jump up. They stood in a body ahead of me, and waited, all looking at me. But I, ignorant of the jump up, was caught in the hunter's snare. While I was trying to drag it toward the herd, the hunter bound all my limbs and I fell to the ground head foremost, and the herd of deer vanished, seeing no hope of saving me. When the hunter came up, he did not put me to death, for pity softened his heart at the thought. He is a fawn, fit only for a pet. Instead, he carefully took me home and gave me as a plaything to a prince who showed his delight at seeing me by giving the hunter a generous reward. The prince treated me kindly, providing ointments, massage, baths, food, perfumes, and salves, while my meals were appropriate and palatable. But as I was passed from hand to hand by the curious women and princes at court, I was seriously inconvenienced by petting and scratching, which did not spare neck, eye, front hoof, hind hoof or ear. Finally, one day in the rainy season, as the prince reclined on a couch, I observed the lightning, listened to the thunder, and my heart, wistful for my fondly remembered herd, I recited, When shall I follow on the herd of coursing deer again? When brace myself against the wind that whistles by, ah, when? Who was that? cried the prince and looked about him terrified. When he saw me, he thought, No man said it, but a tear. It is a prodigy. I am undone. And like one possessed by a devil, he tottered from the house, his garments in disarray, thinking himself ridden by a demon. He tempted the sorcerers and magicians with a great reward, saying, If any man free me from this torment, I will pay him no small honour. Meanwhile, over-hasty individuals were striking me with sticks, bricks and cudgels, but further life being predetermined, I was rescued by a certain holy man who said, Why kill the poor beast? Furthermore, he penetrated the cause of my malady and respectfully said to the prince, Dear sir, in the rainy season, he wistfully remembered his native herd and therefore recited, when shall I follow on the herd of coursing deer again? When brace myself against the wind that whistles by, ah, when? On hearing this, the prince was cured of his feverish malady, returned to his normal state and said to his men, Douse the poor deer's head in plenty of water and set him free in the forest he came from. And they did so. Thus, though having suffered a previous captivity, I am caught again through constraining destiny. At this moment, Slow joined them, for his heart was so full of love for his friend that he had to follow, leaving grass, shrubs and spear grass crushed behind him. At sight of him, they were more distressed than ever, and Gold became their spokesman. My dear fellow, said he, you have done wrong in leaving your fortress to come here, since you are not able to save yourself from the hunter while on us he cannot lay hands, for when the bonds are cut and the hunter stands near, Spot will bound away and disappear, Swift will fly into a tree, while I, 
being a little fellow, will find chink to slide into. But what will you do when within his reach? To this slow listened, but he said, Oh, do not blame me, you of all people. For the loss of love and loss of wealth, who could endure? But for restoratives of health, in friendship sure. And again, the days when meetings do not fail, with wise and good, are lovely clearings on the trail, through life's wild wood. The heart finds rest in telling things, when troubles toss, to honest wife or friend who clings, or kindly boss. Ah, my dear fellow, the wistful glances wander, the wits bewildered ponder, in good men separated, whose love is unabated. And more than that, better lose your life than friends. Life returns when this life ends, not the sympathy that blends. At this moment the hunter arrived, bow and arrow in hand. Under his very eyes, gold cut the bonds and slipped into the before-mentioned chink. Swift flew into the air and was gone. Spot darted away. Now when the hunter saw that the deer's bonds had been cut, he was filled with amazement and said, Under no circumstances do deer cut their own bonds. It was through fate that a deer has done it. Then he spied a turtle on most improbable terrain, and with mixed feelings he said, Even if a deer with fate's help cut his bonds and escaped, still, I've got this turtle. As the saying goes, nothing comes of all that walks, all that flies to heaven, all that courses o'er the earth, if it be not given. After this meditation, the hunter cut spear grass with his knife, wove a stout rope, tied the turtle's feet tightly together, fastened the rope to his bow tip, and started home. But when Gold saw his friend borne away, he sorrowfully said, Ah me, ah me! No sooner sorrow's ocean shore I reach in safety than once more. A bitter sorrow is my lot. Misfortunes crowd the weakest spot. Fresh blows are dreadful on a wound. Food fails, the hunger pangs abound. Woes come, old enmities grow hot. Misfortunes crowd the weakest spot. One walks at ease on level ground till one begins to stumble. Let stumbling start in every step is apt to bring a tumble. And besides, tis hard to find in life a friend, a beau, a wife, strong, supple to endure, in stock and sinew pure, in time of danger sure. False friends are common, yes, but where true nature links a friendly pair, the blessing is as rich as rare. To bitter ends you trust true friends, not wife nor mother, not son nor brother. No long experience alloys true friendship's sweet and supple joys. No evil men can steal the treasure. Tis death, death only sets a measure. Ah, what is this fate that smites me ceaselessly? First came the loss of property, then humiliations from my own people, the result of poverty, because of gloom thereat, exile, and now fate prepares for me the loss of a friend. As the proverb says, In truth, I do not grieve the riches flee. Some lucky chance will bring them back to me. Tis this that hurts me. Lacking riches stay, the best of friends relax and fall away. And again, fate's artful linkage since my birth, of evil deeds and deeds of worth, pursues me on this present earth, till states of mind that play and sway, and change and range from day to day, seem lives that strive and pass away. Ah, there is only too much wisdom in this. The body born is near its doom, and riches are the source of gloom. All meetings end in partings, yes. The world is all one brittleness. Ah me, ah me, the loss of my friend is death to me. What care I even for my own people? As the saying goes, a foe of woe and pain and fear, a cup of trust and feelings, dear. A pearl, who made it? Who could blend six letters in that name of friend? O oh, friendly meetings! O oh, joy to which the righteous cling! Machine that answers love's soul string! 
pure happiness in every breath, cut short by one stern exile, death. And once again, pleasant riches, friendship's course, in familiar ruts, enmities of men of sense, death abruptly cuts. And one last word, if birth and death did not exist, nor age, nor fear of love once missed, if all were not so quick to perish, whose life were not a thing to cherish? While Gold recited these grief-stricken sentences, soft and swift joined him and united their lamentations with his. And Gold said to them, So long as our dear slow is within sight, so long we have a chance to save him. Leave us, Spot. You must slip past the hunter unobserved, drop to earth somewhere near water, and pretend to be dead. Swift, you must spread your claws in the cagework of Spot's horns and pretend to peck out his eyes. Then that dreadful beast of a hunter, in the greedy belief that he has found a dead deer, will certainly wish to seize him, will throw the turtle on the ground and hurry up. When his back is turned, I for my part will in a mere twinkling set slow free to seek refuge in the water nearby, his natural fortress. I myself will slide into a grass clump. You furthermore must plan a second escape when the beast of a hunter is upon you. So they put this plan into practice. Now when the hunter saw a deer as good as dead beside the water and noticed that a crow was pecking at him, he joyfully threw the turtle on the ground and ran for a club. As soon as Spot could tell from the tramp of feet that the hunter was close upon him, with a supreme burst of speed he swept into a dense forest. Swift flew into a tree. The turtle, his fettering cord cut by cold, scrambled to shelter in the water. Gold slipped into a grass clump. To the hunter it seemed a conjurer's trick. What does it mean? he cried in his disappointment. Then he returned to the spot where he had left the turtle and saw the cord cut in a hundred pieces no longer than a finger's breadth. Then he perceived that the turtle had vanished like a magician and anticipated danger for his own person. With troubled heart, he made all speed out of the wood for home casting anxious glances at the horizon. Meanwhile, the four friends, free of all injury, came together, expressed their mutual affection, took a new lease on life, and lived happily. And so, if beasts enjoy so great a prize of friendship, why should wonder rise in men who are so wise? Here ends Book 2, called The Winning of Friends. The first verse runs, the deer and turtle, mouse and crow, had first-rate sense and learning so. Though money failed and means were few, they quickly put their purpose through. End of section 45section 46 of Panchatantra by Vishnu Sharma Translated by Arthur William Ryder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3 Crows and Owls Here then begins Book 3, called Crows and Owls, which treats of peace, war, and so forth. The first verse runs, Reconciled although he be, never trust an enemy. For the cave of owls was burned, when the crows with fire returned. How was that? asked the princes, and Vishnu Sharma told the following story. In the southern country is a city called Earth Base. Near it stands a great banyan tree with countless branches, and in the tree dwelt a crow king named Cloudy, with a countless retinue of crows. There he made his habitation and spent his time. Now the rival king, a great owl named Four Crusher, had his fortress and his habitation in a mountain cave, and he had an unnumbered retinue of owls. The owl king cherished a grudge, so that whenever he met a crow in his airings, he killed him and passed on. In this way, his constant aggression gradually spread rings of dead crows about the banyan tree. Nor is this surprising, for the proverb says, If you permit disease or foe to march unheeded, you may know that death awaits you, sure if slow. Now one day, Cloudy summoned all his counsellors and said, Gentlemen, as you are aware, our enemy is arrogant, energetic, and a judge of occasions. 
He always comes at nightfall to work havoc in our ranks. How then can we counterattack? For we do not see at night, and in the daytime we cannot discover his fortress. Otherwise we might go there and strike a blow. What course then shall we adopt? There are six possibilities. Peace, war, change of base, entrenchment, alliances and duplicity. And they replied, Your Majesty does well to put this question. For the saying goes, Good counsellors should tell their king, unasked a profitable thing. If asked, they should advise, while flatterers who shun the true, which in the end is wholesome too, are foremen in disguise. Therefore it is now proper to confer in secret session. Then Cloudy started to consult severally his five ancestral counsellors, whose names were Live Again, Live Well, Live Along, Live On and Live Long. And first of all he questioned Live Again. My worthy sir, what is your opinion under the circumstances? And Live Again replied, O king, one should not make war with a powerful enemy. And this one is powerful and knows when to strike. Therefore, make peace with him. For the saying goes, bow your head before the great, lifting it when times beseem, and prosperity will flow ever onward like a stream. And again, make your peace with powerful foes, who are rich and good and wise, who are seasoned conquerors, in whose home no discords rise. Make your peace with wicked men, if your life endangered be. Life itself, first made secure, gives the realm security. And again, make your peace with him, whose wont tis to conquer in a fight. Other foes will bend their necks to you, fearful of his might. Even with equals, make your peace. Victory is often given whimsically. Take no risks, says the current saw in heaven. Even with equals, victory whimsically may alight. Try three other methods first, only in extremists fight. And yet again, see, the bully to whose soul power is all and peace is not, clashing with an equal foe, crumbles like an earthen pot. Land and friends and gold at most have been won when battles cease. If but one of these should fail, it is best to live in peace. When a lion digs for moles, hiding in their pebbly house, he is apt to break his nails, and at best he gets a mouse. Therefore, where no prize is won, and a healthy fight is sure, never stir a quarrel, but whatsoe'er the cost endure. By a stronger foe assailed, bend as bends the river reed. Do not strike as serpents do, if you wish your luck to speed. Imitators of the reed slowly wing to glory's peak, but the luckless serpent men only earn the death they seek. Shrink like turtles in their shells, taking blows of need there be. Raise your head from time to time, like the black snake warily. To sum it up, never struggle with the strong. If you wish to know my mind, who has ever seen a cloud baffle the opposing wind? Having heard this view, the king said to live well. My worthy sir, I desire to hear your opinion also. And Livewell said, O king, I disagree. Inasmuch as the enemy is cruel, greedy and unprincipled, you should most certainly not make peace with him. For the proverb says, With foes unprincipled and false, it is vain to seek accommodation. Agreements bind them not, and soon they show a wicked transformation. Therefore, you should in my judgment fight with him. You know the saying, it is easy to uproot a foe, contemning fighters never steady, cruel and greedy, slothful false, foolish and fearful and unready. But more than this, we have been humiliated by him. Therefore, if you propose peace, he will be angry and will employ violence again. There is a saying, the truculence of fevered foes by gentle measures is abetted. What wise physician tries a douche he knows that fever should be sweated. Conciliation simply makes a foreman's indignation splutter, like drops of water sprinkled on a briskly boiling pan of butter. Besides, the previous speaker's point about the strength of the enemy is not decisive. 
The smaller often slays the great by showing energy and vigor. The lion kills the elephant and rules with unrestricted rigor. And more than that, foes indestructible by might are slain through some deceptive gesture. As Bhima strangled Kichaka, approaching him in woman's vesture. And yet again, when kings are merciless as death, all foes are quick to knuckle under, quick too to kill the kings who fall into compassion's fatal blunder. And he whose sun of glory sets before the glory of another is born in vain. He wastes for naught the youthful vigor of his mother. For regal splendor unbesmeared, with foreman's blood is rich cosmetic, though dear, is insufficient for ambitions truly energetic. And in a kingdom unbedewed, with foreman's blood in slaughter gory, and hostile women's falling tears, the king enjoys no living glory. Having heard this view, the king put the question to live along. My worthy sir, pray express your opinion also. And live along said, O king, the enemy is vicious and powerful and unscrupulous. Therefore you should make neither peace nor war with him. Only a change of base can be recommended. For the saying goes, With vicious foemen, proud of power, from hindering scruples free, adopt a change of base, not peace, nor war for victory. Now change of base is known to be no single thing but twin retreat to save imperiled life, invasion planned to win. A warlike and ambitious king may choose twixt April and November. Other months are barred to invade the hostile land. For storming parties, so the books prescribe all times are fair. If hostile forces show distress and lay some weakness bare, a king should put his realm in charge of heroes strong and fit, then pounce upon the hostile land when spies have peopled it. The case in hand requires, O king, the base change called retreat. Not peace, nor war, the foe is vile and very hard to beat. Furthermore, a recess of movement is made, says the science of ethics, with due regard to cause and effect. The point is thus expressed in poetry. When rams draw back, their butting fiercer stings, the crouching king of beasts more deadly springs. So wise dissemblers, holding vengeance sure, in dumb communion with their hearts endure. And once again, a king abandoning his realm to foes of fighting worth preserves his life as fight firm did and later rules the earth. And so to sum it up, the weak who struggling with the strong are not too proud to fight, bring great rejoicing to their foes and on their kinsmen blight. Therefore, since you are engaged with a powerful foe, there is occasion for a change of base. It is no time for peace or war. When he had listened to this point, the king said to live on, My worthy sir, pray express your opinion also. And live on said, O king, I disapprove of peace, war and change of base, all three of them, and particularly change of base. For a crocodile at home can beat an elephant, but if he goes abroad, a dog can make him pant. And again, when stronger foes attack, close in your fortress stay, but sally to relieve your friends and save the day. If panic struck you flee, when foes are at the door, and leave the land to them, you ne'er will see it more. One man entrenched can hold a hundred foes at bay, strong foes at hand, therefore in your entrenchment stay. Therefore provide your fort with shaft and gun, adorn it well with mort and wall, and store abundant corn. Stand ever firm within, resolve to do or die, so living earn renown, or dead the starry sky. And there is further consideration. The union of the weak, a powerful bully stumps. The hostile blizzard spares, the shrubs that grow in clumps and single trees, though huge and posted for defence, may be uprooted by the stout wind's violence, while groves of trees where each receives and gives defence unitedly defy the wind's fierce violence. Just so, one man alone, 
however brave he be, is scorned by foes who soon proceed to injury. Having listened to this view, likewise, the king said to live long, My worthy sir, pray express your opinion also. And live long said, O king, from among the six possibilities, I recommend alliance. Pray adopt that. For the saying goes, Though deft and brilliant, what good end can you attain without a friend? The fire that seems immortal will die when the fanning wind is still. Therefore you should stay at home and seek some competent ally to make a counterweight against the enemy. But if you leave your home and travel, no one will give you so much as a friendly word. For the proverb says, The wind is friend to forest fire and causes it to flame the higher. The same wind blows a candle out. Who cares what poor folk are about? Nor is it even essential that the ally be powerful. The alliance even of feeble folk makes for defence. You know the saying. However weak a bamboo stem, from others takes and gives to them strength to resist uprooting, so weak kings unite against a foe. And how much more so, if you have alliance with the truly great, for the poet says, Who is there whom a friendly state with great folk does not elevate? The raindrop hiding in a curl of lotus petal shines like a pearl. Thus, O king, there is no counterweight to your enemy save an alliance. Therefore let an alliance be concluded. Such is my opinion. After these opinions had been given, Cloudy bowed low before an ancient, far-sighted counsellor of his race. This was a crow who had persevered to the last page of every textbook of social ethics, and his name was Livestrong. Father, said the king, I had a secret purpose in questioning the others in your very presence, namely that you might listen to everything and instruct me as to what is fitting. Pray, instruct me in the appropriate course of action. And Livestrong said, My son, all that these have proposed is drawn from the textbooks of social ethics, and all is highly proper, each course in its own good time. But the present hour demands duplicity. You have heard the saying, You must regard with like distrust both peace and warlike measures, must seek through duplicity your goal with powerful foes of evil soul. In this way, those who themselves trust nobody and have a single eye to self-interest can win the trust of an enemy and easily destroy him. For the saying goes, Shrewd enemies will cause a foe, whom they would ruin first to grow. The flow of mucus by molasses is first increased, but later passes. And again, to foe to false friend to female, particularly her of sale, the man so simple as to give straightforward conduct does not live. Proceed in pure straightforwardness, with Brahmins, with the gods no less, with teachers, with yourself, but treat all other creatures to deceit. A hermit mastering his soul may see life simple, see it whole. Not those who thirst for carnal things, nor most particularly kings. And so, strong through duplicity, you will preserve your habitation still, for death will prove a friend in need to crush a foe possessed by greed. Furthermore, if a vulnerable point appears in him, you will destroy him by being aware of it. But Cloudy said, Father, I do not know his residence, so how shall I become aware of a vulnerable point? And Livestrong replied, My son, through spies, I will reveal not only his dwelling, but also his vulnerable point. For crows see a thing by sense of smell, while scripture serves the Brahmin well, the king perceives by means of spies, and other creatures use their eyes. And in this connection, there is another saying, the king, well served by spies, who knows the functionaries of his foes, who knows his retinue no less, is never plunged in deep distress. Then Cloudy said, Father, what are these functionaries? What is their number? And of what character are secret service men? Pray tell me all. 
and Livestrong replied. On these points, the sage Narada gave the following information when questioned by King Fight Firm. In the hostile camp are 18 functionaries. In one's own, 15. Their conduct is discovered by assigning to each three secret service men, by whose efforts both friends and enemies are kept in good control. The facts are put in a bit of a dog row. The four has 18 functionaries, and you have five and ten. Give each as unknown secretaries three secret service men. The term functionary implies a delegated task. If this be shamefully performed, it ruins the king. If admirably, it brings him high success. Now for details. The functionaries in the hostile camp are the counsellor, the chaplain, the commander-in-chief, the crown prince, the concierge, the superintendent of the genetium, the advisor, the tax collector, the introducer, the master of ceremonies, the director of the stables, the treasurer, the minister for elephants, the assessor, the war minister, the minister for fortifications, the favourite, the forester, and so forth. By sowing intrigue among these, the enemy is subdued. In one's own camp, the functionaries are the queen, the queen mother, the chamberlain, the florist, the lord of the bedchamber, the chief of the secret service, the stargazer, the court physician, the purveyor of water, the purveyor of spices, the professor, the lifeguard, the quartermaster, the bearer of the royal umbrella, and the geisha. It is by way of these that ruin befalls one's own party. As the saying goes, Professor, Star Scout and Physician, find flaws within your home position. The madman and snake charmer know points vulnerable in the foe. Father, said Cloudy, what is the origin of the deadly feud between crows and owls? And Livestrong answered, Listen, I will tell you how the birds picked a king. End of section 46